Good morning, everyone. Um, it is wonderful to be with you. I'm sorry that it has to be in a remote fashion rather, rather than in person, but um, those are the days we're currently living in. But my topic, which I hope is somewhat unique to what we're going to discuss, is how opioid use impacts esophageal symptoms and motility. What we do know is that opioids are being overly prescribed and overly used. In the upper gut, these medications do cause symptoms. We are familiar with some of those. I will not be discussing some of the lower GI symptoms that we are comfortable with. However, I will discuss how they impact specifically the esophagus and esophageal motility because these are patients that we will often see and to know what the impact is and what to do for this group of patients is very important. I have no disclosures relevant to this presentation. So as I mentioned, opioid prescription has increased over the years. We know that in the year 2000, there were about 164 million, while just in 2010, it had increased to 234 million. And as you can imagine, Today, those numbers are going to be much higher. And as you have seen in the media, it is the worst drug epidemic in the US history. We're seeing this at various levels. We know that 130 Americans a day die every day from an opioid overdose. This can be either prescription or illicit use of the opioids. We also know that 4% of US population have, use opioids for non-cancer related chronic pain. There's no judgment on whether or not patients should take opioids. The issue is we do know that it is overly prescribed and overly used that leads to a national crisis. So my focus is going to be on the esophagus. However, we do know that opioids impact the GI tract as a whole. We know that opioids impact the colon. It slows down colonic motility. It leads to constipation. This is something we're familiar with. We also know that opioids impact the stomach. We know that it slows down gastric motility. Many of our patients have nausea, vomiting because of this. So in the stomach, it actually impacts the pylorus as well. In addition to slowing down the stomach, it actually impacts the pylorus by increasing the pressure. So it makes it worse. You can't empty and the pylorus is actually hypertonic. In the small intestine, it slows down the propagation, but it also increases the contraction, i.e. reduces the peristalsis. So again, overall, the impact of opioids in the GI tract is large. However, in the esophagus, there's some unique findings. And the aim of this discussion is to really talk about that. I'm not gonna talk about gastroesophageal reflux disease per se. However, some of the patients that might present to you may have reflux. If the opioids impact the small bowel and or the colon or the stomach, then what you might see is someone that has refractory symptoms. They may have heartburn. They may have regurgitation from gastroparesis due to opioids. It may be that the constipation is leading to more upper GI symptoms, and we're seeing more and more of that. But in the esophagus, I'd like to focus on what opioids do regarding esophageal motility, because this leads to certain symptoms such as dysphagia, and then we end up doing endoscopy or esophageal motility testing. And there are some specific motility pattern related to opioids and the esophagus. So I'm going to walk you through this slide I will not be talking about the endogenous opioid peptides that impact the opioid receptors. We are talking about the exogenous opioids, which are structurally distinct. Now, these opioids impact the mu receptors predominantly in the GI tract. Now, these receptors are predominantly in the myenteric plexus, and they are G-protein coupled membrane receptors. What the impact of this interaction is, is reduction in the cyclic AMP and the impact on calcium channel and increased potassium permeability. What this does, which is the impact I'm going to discuss, is inhibition of neuronal activity 
and neurotransmitter release. This leads to some esophageal dysmotility. It leads to some symptoms, and I will discuss that. Now, I already mentioned that this function leads to abnormalities in the esophagus. Like I mentioned, there's gastroparesis and hypertonic pylorus in the stomach and reduced peristalsis, as well as hypertonic contractions in the duodenum. So let's focus on the esophagus. And what I urge the group, if you're really interested in this area, to look up this uh, article in the American Journal of Gastroenterology that was published in 2019 by Dr. Patel, who's really done a great job of highlighting the impact of opioids on each of these areas, esophagus, stomach, and duodenum. And I'll be referencing some of the work of Dr. Patel in this as well. So this slide, again, taken from that article, shows how opioids impact esophageal motility. In a patient that might present with dysphagia, and many of these patients do, what we see is perhaps jackhammer esophagus, but we will see this hypertonic contraction as you see here. Patients might have distal esophageal spasm as shown in this clip, or be diagnosed with type three echolasia as shown here, or this condition called EGJ outflow obstruction, uh, where essentially what we have is uh, the GE junction is not relaxing, although there is peristalsis, and this is somewhat nonspecific, but we do see this in patients that have been on chronic opioid use. So how do opioids impact the uh, peristalsis in the esophagus? Before we talk about the opioid impact, we need to know what normal peristalsis is. We do know that esophagus contracts and relaxes. It is the combination of the contraction and relaxation and the relaxation occurring at the end of the bolus with the contraction occurring more proximally is what really causes the peristalsis in the esophagus. This is driven by presynaptic and postsynaptic terminals and how these neurotransmitters, acetylcholine resulting in contraction while nitrous oxide and VIP resulting in relaxation. That's a normal function. However, in someone that may have been on chronic opioid use, what you see is continued contraction, but nitrous oxide VIP fibers in the myenteric plexus are impacted. And as I mentioned, through this, you have continued contractions and the latency gradient between the esophageal segments are reduced, which means there is lack of peristalsis and there's increased contraction, which is why what you might see is a picture that is a hypercontractile state, as I've shown in the previous slide. Looking at this study that was published in the American Journal of Gastroenterology in 2015, they studied patient on opioids and off opioids. And clearly what they found was that EGJ outflow obstruction was significantly more in those that were studied on opioids versus not. Same with echolasia type three. And this is a pattern you're going to see in different studies that I'm going to present to you. Now, what we do know is from this study, again, looking at it pictorially, in someone that's on chronic opioid use, we see this EGJ outflow obstruction pattern. There is hypercontractile state. Someone could have typical type two echolasia. As you see here, there's lack of relaxation of the EGJ. As well, you have simultaneous contraction. You may have type three where the um, LES is not relaxing and you have very high amplitude contractions or jackhammer esophagus, again, shown here. These are patterns that have been published in the literature on patients that have been on chronic opioid use. This is a study that I'm gonna present a few slides on. Dr. Babai published last year, um, 2019, 
on a large group of patients, as you can see here, more than 2,000 patients that he looked at, and he divided that population to those that were opioid naive versus those that were on chronic use of opioids. And what he found was that dysphagia was the predominant symptom presenting that differentiated the two. Patients on opioids are more likely to present with symptom of dysphagia than those that not. And this results in performing endoscopy if patients present to gastroenterologists, as well as potentially esophageal motility testing. So when a patient comes with dysphagia, and if endoscopy is normal, which in most of these cases it will be, then they undergo esophageal manometry. High-resolution manometry, as shown in this slide, uh, shows that patients on chronic opioid use are more likely to be diagnosed with echolasia type 3, as I've shown, EGJ outflow obstruction, or esophageal spasm. This is a study by Dr. Patel, who was the author of that review that I was mentioning earlier, where he looked at his uh, patients that he's seen uh, at Vanderbilt, in fact, and his sample size was much larger, more than 5,000 patients. He similarly divided the 5,000 patients to uh, opioid naive versus chronic opioid exposure, as you can see. And what he did find was that, again, Patients on chronic opioids are more likely to have jackhammer esophagus or distal esophageal spasm. However, he did not confirm that type 3 or type 2 were more common in, on, uh, in patients on chronic opioids than in opioid naive. However, the main point being that they do present with dysphagia and hypercontractile state is very common in this group. And what he did find was that patients that are on chronic opioid are more likely to have distal contractile integral, or DCI. This is a measure of the strength or the vigor of contraction. You notice it is significantly more. The mean esophageal amplitude was also more. The basal LES pressure was higher. And the integrated relaxation pressure was higher. So what that means is that those on chronic opioids are more likely to have a stronger vigor on contraction, and the LES is less likely to relax completely, which then leads to the symptom of dysphagia that we've been talking about. In that same study, Dr. Babai looked at different diagnoses, echolasia type 3, EGJ outflow obstruction, spasm, or others, and he showed that the morphine equivalent dose, if you look at that, the higher the morphine equivalent dose, the more likely to be in the hypercontractile state, either type 3, EGJ outflow, or spasm. So again, the longer and the higher the dose of opioids, the more likely we might see this. This is a new recognition of this condition in that previously patients would present to us in the manometry lab, we would do the manometry, but there would be less focus on whether patients are on chronic opioid use, but now we're highly focused on that because we are recognizing that this is an exogenous factor leading to similar diagnosis, for example, as idiopathic echolasia. That's important because perhaps our treatment would be different in the two conditions. So, are there specific opioids that may be more causal than others? And the answer to that is, at least based on the studies that uh, have been published, is that patients on oxycodone and hydrocodone tend to have more issues with the motility findings that I've been highlighting rather than those on the partial agonists, such as tramadol or codeine. So patients on tramadol and codeine um, don't have the same association or the same impact as those on oxycodone or hydrocodone. So that's important to know. This is important because if patients are on those medications, perhaps one treatment option would be to go to partial agonist to reduce that association and perhaps help the patient's symptom and the motility findings. So We've been discussing the clinical presentations. How do these patients present? Obviously, they're on opioids chronically for various conditions. 
and patients will often present with dysphagia to solids and or solids and liquids. They might have regurgitation. Remember the regurgitation can be esophageal in etiology because of esophageal motility disorder, or it could be gastric because of gastroparesis. And obviously they could have chest pain because of increased vigor of contraction. However, clinical symptoms alone don't differentiate where the problem might be because a patient with dysphagia could have reflux-related strictures. So we're still obliged by performing endoscopy, making sure there are no other etiologies for the dysphagia and or regurgitation. So symptoms alone don't tell you just because someone is on opioids. So this is a patient, um, endoscopic picture of a patient that we performed. You see some retained saliva, pucker GE junction. This is classic for echolasia. However, this patient had dysphagia to solids and liquids, had this endoscopic finding, but this is not idiopathic echolasia as we know it. This is opioid induced. This patient was on chronic opioid. And when we uh, actually transitioned the patient to partial agonist, the symptoms did improve as did the uh, motility findings. That's hard to do in many of these patients. However, this uh, endoscopy picture, the aim of it is to show you that endoscopically and symptom-wise, it could be very similar to idiopathic echolasia. As I've already shown you, some of the manometric findings associated with the opioid-induced esophageal dysmotility. This is a study, uh, a different study by Dr. Babai in that what he found was, what if we wanted to know, is this really echolasia, idiopathic, or is it opioid induced? So this is idiopathic echolasia type three and opioid induced. Are there uh, provocative maneuvers we can do in order to differentiate? And what he did was he used uh, amyl nitrate inhalation and what he showed was that in idiopathic echolasia with amyl nitrate, there's relaxation, as you can see, the LES relaxes, but then there's a rebound contraction in idiopathic echolasia that you don't see with opioid-induced echolasia. Again, that's if you wanted to differentiate. Same thing with CCK. CCK typically uh, results in relaxation in uh, normal subjects of the smooth muscle. However, in patients with echolasia, it actually has the reverse effect because what it does is it increases contraction. And as you can see with CCK injection, you have heightened contractions, which is typical in idiopathic. But what he found was that an opioid induced that rebound or contraction is really not as strong. So if one wanted to know whether this was really truly impact of um, idiopathic versus opioid, one could use some of these provo provocative maneuvers to differentiate. So what do we do? Uh, you do a thorough medical reconciliation, obviously, and can you do the manometry off opioids. Now that's easier said than done, obviously. Many of our patients on chronic opioids, it's going to be exceedingly difficult to by yourself as a gastroenterologist or primary physician to really um, take them off opioids. So this has to be in concert with your colleagues uh, in pain if they are seeing someone in a pain clinic in order to coordinate whether you can go to partial agonist and whether that will help the patient. But now you're left with a patient that has dysphagia and you're suspecting it's opioid. Chronically, the best would be to try to get them off and or into partial agonist. Acutely, you're left with what we typically do, however, which is likely um, endoscopy. And I'll highlight some of the treatment options that way. And this essentially highlights what happens if you are able to take them to either partial agonist or get them off the opioids. You see on the left, the hypercontractile state. On the right, this is the same patient that essentially uh, was off the opioids. So management, what do we do? Well, there's lack of data on using opioid antagonists. We know that there have been trials on opioid antagonists in the colon regarding constipation that may be opioid related. However, we don't really have data on 
its impact in the esophageal patients that have this motility. So obviously we talked about withdrawal of opioids if safe and if doable uh, in concert with uh, a multidisciplinary approach. If not an option, talk, uh, switching to partial agonists, as we said, tramadol perhaps, and empiric esophageal dilation, because that's more of an acute setting in that you're left with a patient that continues to have dysphagia. If it's a spasm, if it's EGJ outflow obstruction, you should do an esophageal dilation empirically. The question could be, what do I do? Which specific dilator do I use? And we can discuss that in the Q&A um, part of the presentation. There's also a role of botulinum toxin. As you know, botulinum toxin we have used in patients with echolasia, specifically idiopathic. Um, it is also being used in patients with hypercontractile states, the idiopathic spasms and others. And this could be helpful if dilation alone was not sufficient. So what I tend to do is first dilate the patient. And if that's not enough, I bring the patient back and um, do some botulinum toxin injection. Depending on the manometric finding, if the manometric finding shows more of a spasm, then I inject the Botox along the esophagus. And if it's more EGJ outflow obstruction, then I inject into the lower esophageal sphincter as this pictorial shows. So what is the method? I use 100 units of Botox. I usually inject 25 units into each quadrant of the uh, LES if I'm injecting it for type 3 and or EGJ outflow obstruction. However, as I mentioned, I would potentially use about uh, 10 units along the esophagus, 4 units, 40 units uh, into LES, and then the rest along the esophagus if spasm. And the way botulinum toxin works is by it blocks the acetylcholine release. And remember the hypercontractile state as the first few slides I showed you is because of the contraction that's due to acetylcholine and botulinum toxin essentially blocks that. So what are some risks? Sometimes patients have transient chest pain post uh, injection. Some patients get uh, reflux symptoms. I don't, ha I haven't had that many uh, there's been one death from mediastinitis, but again, uh, very rare. So what do you do for refractory symptoms? So you tried that, you did the empiric dilation, you did the Botox, patient continues to have it. You were unable to take the patient off of um, their opioids or convert them to partial agonists. So you're then left with essentially um, you could do the time barium to see if there's retention of barium, just like you do with idiopathic echolasia. You could consider pneumatic dilation or myotomy, but I would be highly cautious in this group, especially if pain is what's driving uh, what you're doing. If patient's pain is exceeding more the dysphagia, you want to know that pain is less likely to go away. Dysphagia would be more likely to be treated with the measures that I've outlined um, in this presentation. So this is my last slide, again, highlighting the fact that we are in a crisis situation in that we do have many of our patients that are on opioids. And there has been such increased attention to uh, esophageal motility, as well as some of our refractory patients with reflux. I didn't discuss that, but we have many patients that while on PPIs, the reflux symptoms not well controlled, and that could be due to the impact of opioids as well, whether it be the impact on the stomach or duodenum or colon, or the factors that I mentioned in this presentation on esophageal motility, such as jackhammer esophagus, distal esophageal spasm, type three echolasia, or EGJ outflow obstruction. And I'm more than happy to answer questions in the Q&A part of the presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Vazid. That was a great presentation. Um, now, I'd like to invite our second speaker for the morning, Dr. Ronnie Fuss, who is a professor of medicine at Case Western Reserve University School of Medicine at Cleveland, Ohio. Dr. Fuss will be talking to us about GERD and sleep, an eye-opening experience. Welcome, Dr. Fuss. My name is Ronnie Foss. I'm a professor of medicine at Case Western Reserve University. And my topic is GERD and sleep and eye-opening experience. This is 
these are my disclosures. First of all, let's talk a little bit about sleep. So sleep is now considered one of the three pillars of health. We're very well aware that exercise is an important uh, pillars of health. Uh, in addition, nutrition has been considered to be an important pillars of health. And then recent information and data and evidence suggested it's also sleep. So for having a healthy life, one has to focus on all three components uh, and not only on two of them or one of them. Now it's very interesting that when you look at this study from 1960 to 2002, so over 40 years period of time, we lost on an average two hours from our sleep. In fact, when we look today, we'll find out that most of the adult population sleep on an average no more than five to six hours per night, suggesting that a significant part of our population falls under the category of being sleep deprived. Now, many of you probably know that regular naps prevent old age especially if you take them while driving. Now, what are the health consequences of sleep deprivation? So sleep deprivation doesn't come cheap. There are many studies showing that patients that are sleep deprived are more likely to develop accidents, either motor vehicle accidents, accidents at work, or even accidents at home. But there's also information that sleep deprivation is directly associated with obesity, dementia, memory impairment, heart disease, and even reduced immune response. So sleep deprivation is a very important abnormality that has to be addressed. And obviously we have to find out what the underlying mechanisms that can lead to sleep deprivation in our patient population. Now let's look at the effect of sleep on esophageal function. And it's very important because you can see how sleep can affect esophageal response to gastroesophageal reflux. Now during sleep, there is significant decrease in swallowing. In fact, almost to none. There is also significant decrease in salivary secretion. Now, these are two important defense mechanisms against gastroesophageal reflux. Swallowing results in primary peristalsis that delivers saliva to the lower part of the esophagus. And saliva can neutralize the presence of acidic reflux. In addition, during sleep, especially deep sleep, there is a decrease in upper esophageal sphincter basal pressure, potentially allowing for reflux traversing the upper esophageal sphincter, ending up in the larynx, pharynx, and pulmonary system. Sleep is also a, a state of uh, altered consciousness. And as a result, there is decreased perception of intraesophageal stimuli. That means we sense less inside our esophagus and consequently we're less likely to perceive events in the esophagus and respond to them. During sleep, there is also decrease in primary peristalsis. As, and as I mentioned, primary peristalsis is very important in delivering saliva to the lower part of the esophagus. And as a result, that can increase acid exposure time. There's also evidence that during sleep, there is a component of decrease in gastric emptying. And if you sleep on the right side, you are more likely to experience reflux disease because of the anatomic relationship between the esophagus and the stomach as compared if you sleep in any other position. So you can see how sleep physi physiology can be affected. Now, 
nighttime reflux increases risk for GERD complications. In fact, reflux during nighttime has been shown to be the most malignant, literally malignant type of reflux. So patients that have nighttime reflux are more likely to develop erosive esophagitis. They're more likely to develop complicated gastroesophageal reflux disease, having ulcerations, strictures, Barrett's esophagus, or even adenocarcinoma of the esophagus as compared to those that don't have nighttime reflux. In addition, patients that have nighttime reflux are more likely to develop extraesophageal manifestations of GERD. They're more likely to develop asthma, inspiration pneumonia, chronic cough, hoarseness, and many others. But also, they're more likely to develop sleep abnormalities that lead to sleep deprivation. And as I've already mentioned, the initial of my presentation, sleep deprivation has many other health-related consequences. So how common is heartburn that awaken patients from sleep? Well, it's very common, as you can see from three different studies, showing that between 47 to 54% of the GERD patients reported having heartburn that awaken them from sleep during the night. That's almost half of the GERD patients, suggesting that this is a very common phenomenon. In addition, patients that experienced nighttime heartburn also reported a variety of sleep effects. 63% of them said that nighttime heartburn affected their ability to sleep well. 42% said that they were unable to sleep through a full night. 39% of them said that they had to take naps during the day. And 34% of them stated that they had to sleep in a seated position. So a significant effect on patients' quality of life. Interestingly, 27% of the patients reported that their own heartburn-induced sleep disturbances kept their spouses from having good night's sleep. So sleep disturbances may affect also your bed partner. There are also studies like this very important survey that was conducted by the American Gastrological Association. They looked at more than 1,000 uh, GERD patients and they wanted to see how many of them still have breakthrough symptoms despite taking PPI once a day. And they found out it was more than a third of these patients. And when they asked them, when do you have those breakthrough symptoms, 65% of them said at night and 28% of them said during sleep. So nighttime, sleep time were associated with a higher rate of breakthrough symptoms in patients that are already taking anti-reflux medications. And this is a study that we've done and we wanted to look at the association between nighttime gastroesophageal reflux disease and a variety of sleep abnormalities. And we found out that patients that report nighttime gastroesophageal reflux disease were more likely to also report nighttime awakening, next day poor functioning, difficulty falling asleep, poor sleep quality, and overall decreased quality of life. Again, clearly suggesting the impact of nighttime GERD on patient's sleep experience and consequently on patient's perception of their quality of life. This is another study that we've done, a huge, a very large survey that included more than 40,000 subjects. When we looked at those that did have gastroesophageal reflux disease and we compared them to those who did not, then those that did have gastroesophageal reflux disease had twofold increased risk of experiencing sleep difficulties. 75% of them re uh, had increased risk of experiencing uh, problems uh, with sleep induction, meaning falling asleep, and 89% experiencing problems with maintaining sleep. Now, when we look specifically at the GERD group, 
we found out that those that have nighttime gastroesophageal reflux disease had 53% increased risk of reporting having sleep difficulties, 43% of having problems with sleep induction, and 56% in maintaining good sleep as compared to those that had only daytime symptoms. This is another study that we've done, again, a large study that included 25,000 patients. And we looked at factors that affected reports of heartburn that awakened patients from sleep during the night. And we found out that the most important ones were snoring and feeling sleepy, having insomnia, and the use of benzodiazepines. Benzodiazepines are commonly used as sleepy pills. And it appears that if you use benzodiazepines, then you're more likely to experience also uh, heartburn that awaken you from sleep during the night. Others, and very important, are for example, the consumption of carbonated soft drinks, and then hypertension and asthma, both disorders that require medications that can affect sleep, uh, esophageal function. Now, we've initiated a series of studies in trying to further understand the relationship between gastroesophageal reflux and patient sleep experience. And for that purpose, we use what we call actigraphy. An actigraph is a watch-like device, like you see on the slide, which is worn on the non-dominant non wrist and records motions with oscillometers that are present inside that watch-like device. And that device has been validated and it's been shown to be equivalent to a sleep test in determining if patients are awake or asleep. Now, in addition, at the same time that we performed actigraph testing, we also did pH testing on our patient. And then we superimposed the information that we got from these two tests uh, on the same uh, strip matched by time in order to further understand the relationship between gastroesophageal reflux and patient sleep experience. And let me show you what we found out. Now, if you look at this, on the left side, it says whenever the patient had meal, which is the yellow color, then whenever the patient was in supine, meaning that the patient was in bed, there was the green color. Whenever the patient was asleep, the blue color, and whenever the patient was awake, the white color. And if you look at the sleep period, you can see that at the beginning there is a green color. And if you look at the bottom at the pH strip, you can see that there are a lot of reflux events, which are um, confirmed by the fact that the pH drops below four, which is the definition of reflux event. So during the green period, which is when the patient was lying in bed, but was awake, there were a lot of reflux events. Then the blue period starts, which means the patient was asleep. And you can see that during the blue period, there are two additional periods where the color is white, suggesting that these periods, the patient was awake. And you can clearly see that they were associated with reflux events. So these are two awake periods that were associated with reflux events during sleep time. So let's go back and summarize again. So here we go, we see the green period with the reflux events. That's when the patient was laying in bed uh, awake before they fall asleep. This period was clearly associated with a lot of reflux events. Then these are the two periods where the patients woke up from sleep during the night and they were also associated with reflux events. Suggesting that during patient sleep period, the patient had to wake up twice uh, with reflux events, resulting in what we call sleep fragmentation. So patient did not have a nice uh, clear sleep period 
but actually a fragmented uh, sleep period, which most likely affected patient sleep experience. We looked also at the relationship between conscious awakenings and acid reflux events and symptoms. Conscious awakenings are awakenings of a certain duration, at least two minutes. And we call them conscious awakenings because the patients can recall them. Because if the awakenings are too short, uh, they tend to be amnestic and patients don't recall them. And these are also the awakenings that patients may experience symptoms because you have to be awake in order to perceive symptoms. So we looked at our patient population and we found out that these patients experienced a total of 104 conscious awakenings. And of those, about 52% were conscious awakenings that were associated with acid reflux events, a pretty significant number. And then when we looked specifically at the conscious awakenings that were associated with reflux events, we found out that only 31.5% of them were associated with symptoms. If we look at the whole 104 conscious awakenings, only 16.3% of them were associated with symptoms, suggesting that many of the conscious awakenings that were associated with reflux events that the patient experienced were not associated with symptom, clearly suggesting that just waking up from sleep during the night could be a manifestation of gastroesophageal reflux disease without the need that the patient will, will, uh, will also experience symptoms. This is another study that looked again at reflux and they had 104 subjects with documented sleep abnormalities and no heartburn. In this study, they used sleep tests plus pH tests and they found out that 26% of the patients woke up during sleep with reflux events, and these patients did not have symptoms. Further suggesting the importance of sleep awakenings per se without symptoms as a manifestation of gastroesophageal reflux during sleep time. This is a very interesting case. These patients said that she was on fire most of the night. Now, if we look at the test again, uh, as I mentioned, this test is the combination of pH test with an actigraph. You can see at the top, it says heartburn, there is the red line. This is the period of patient's sleep time that the patient reported having heartburn, pretty significant period of time. Now, if you look, Green is when the patient was in supine, sleep, when the patient was asleep, when the patient was awake. And you can see that the patient uh, had a very short period of being in bed uh, and awake before they fell asleep. And even that period of time was associated with a lot of reflux. This is uh, mentioned by the green arrow. The patient experienced six periods of conscious awakenings that were associated with a lot of reflux. And then eventually after the last uh, conscious awakening period marked by the letter F, then the patient was able to sleep throughout the rest of the night. But you can clearly see that during the period where the patient said that they were having a lot of heartburn, that was associated with the multiple conscious awakenings that were associated with a lot of reflux events, clearly explaining what happened in this patient during sleep time. Now, another question that we ask is, which is the chicken and which is the egg? Meaning, what do patients experience first? Reflux events and then awakening from sleep or awakening from sleep first and then reflux event. And this study that looked at 104 conscious awakenings found out that in the majority, almost 
symptomatic acid reflux events develop after conscious awakenings and not the other way around. So very rarely symptomatic acid reflux event developed before conscious awakening. Of course, if patients experience a, a reflux event while they were asleep, as compared to while they were awake, the reflux events while they were asleep were of longer duration, significantly more than those while they were awake. For the simple reason then that when you are awake, you can initiate a variety of defense mechanisms like, <clears throat> like uh, initiating primary peristalsis, swallowing saliva and others. And then there is the concept of riser's reflux. This is another study that we performed and we've shown that if you develop reflux before you wake up, then it's a relatively uncommon phenomenon, developing reflux while you're asleep. However, immediately after you wake up in our GERD patients, 33% of them demonstrated reflux events. And then 20 minutes after waking up, almost half of them demonstrated reflux events. So this study suggests that the transition between sleep and awake in the morning in GERD patient is commonly associated with increased reflux events because studies have shown that sleep per se, especially deep sleep, is preventive of gastroesophageal reflux, uh, reflux because it inhibits transient lower esophageal sphincter relaxation. Now there are also what we call amnestic short arousals that occurred in GERD patients. So if the arousals are of a very short period of times, they tend to be amnestic, meaning patients don't recall them. But still, these arousals, even though they're very short, reflux can occur during that short period of time. And studies have suggested that 90% of acid reflux events were associated with these short awakenings from sleep. And most of these uh, short awakenings of sleep, from sleep did not last more than 30 seconds. And they occurred after an acid reflux event. And there were significantly more spontaneous arousals during pH drops than during comparison periods. So let's look at what we call the sleep and acid reflux model. It suggests that during sleep, there is a change in esophageal physiology, as I mentioned. And that change of esophageal physiology in patients with gastroesophageal reflux disease it further exposed these patients with anatomic changes to develop gastroesophageal reflux disease. That increase in gastroesophageal reflux disease decreased patients' sleep experience and decrease in sleep experience may affect gastroesophageal reflux disease. And let me show you the study that looks specifically at these questions. Can sleep deprivation or sleep deficiency per se can affect gastroesophageal reflux disease? Here is a study that was done in normal controls and patients with gastroesophageal reflux disease. Patients and control were exposed to bad sleep, which are two consecutive sleep periods where they were sleeping not more than three hours, which was confirmed by Actigraph. And then they were compared to two good sleep periods where they were sleeping between seven to eight hours during two consecutive uh, sleep periods, uh, again, confirmed by Actigraph. Then patients were brought into the lab, uh, a probe 
was uh, introduced into their esophagus and acid was perfused. And patient's uh, sensation of this acid was assessed. And it, it was very clear that after bad sleep, after sleep deprivation, the acid perfusion sensitivity score was significantly higher, especially in patients. It was also in control, but not as much uh, as compared to after good sleep, suggesting that sleep deprivation may sensitize patients with gastroesophageal reflux disease, leading to decreased perception thresholds for pain, specifically for reflux. And that's been also demonstrated in other studies, not only uh, viscera studies, but also somatic studies. Now, another study that we published recently where we took just control subjects and we exposed them again to the same protocol of good sleep and bad sleep. Again, after each protocol, they were brought in and a probe was inserted into their esophagus. And, and, uh, but this time, this was a pH probe. And then patients were tested over a period of 24 hours. And, uh, and uh, sorry, these were subjects, not patients. And we found out that about half of the normal subjects develop an abnormal esophageal acid exposure after bad sleep as compared to good sleep. So we could uh, convert normal subject by sleep depriving them to an abnormal esophageal acid exposure. So we can see here two potential mechanisms that can lead sleep deprivation to affect patients with gastroesophageal reflux disease. So if we look at the sleep GERD model, we can see that this is a bi-directional relationship where sleep affects esophageal physiology. Esophageal physiology during sleep affect patients that have anatomic changes that expose them with gastroesophageal reflux disease, that increase in gastroesophageal reflux disease can decrease sleep experience, and that decreased sleep experience by itself can result in increased gastroesophageal reflux disease. There's always the question obviously here, which is the chicken and which is the egg, something that still need to be explored. This is another study, this time uh, randomizing patients to dexlansoprazole, 30 milligram once a day versus placebo given over a period of four weeks. And those that receive dexlansoprazole, the median percent nights with heart heartburn was significantly higher as compared to placebo. The percent of patients reporting relief of nocturnal heartburn during the last seven days of treatment was also significantly higher in the dexlansoprazole uh, group. And the percent of patients reporting relief of GERD-related sleep disturbances during the last seven days of treatment was also significantly higher in those that received dexlansoprazole as compared to placebo. The study also demonstrated that the main effect of dexlansoprazole was in those with moderate to severe or severe to very severe symptoms as compared to the effect of placebo, which was mostly on those with less than mild or mild to moderate. And this clearly showing the effect of dexlansoprazole uh, as compared to placebo on various sleep disturbances. Uh, you can see significant improvement, for example, in nights with GERD-related sleep disturbances, nights with difficulty falling asleep, as well as many other sleep abnormalities. So when we look again at the bidirectional relationship model between sleep and GERD, we can see that one way to break this vicious cycle between GERD and sleep is to treat the gastroesophageal reflux disease in this situation with anti-reflux medication. The next question, of course, is 
can we break this by just treating sleep per se? And this is a study that we performed where patients were randomized to either placebo or a sleeping pill, Rameltion, that was given eight milligram once daily. Rameltion is a melatonin one and melatonin two agonist, and it's considered to be a sleeping pill. So both Rameltion and placebo were given to patients. And at four weeks, patients were assessed. And it appears patients that received Rameltion reported significant reduction in their daytime heartburn and their nighttime heartburn as compared to placebo. And also those that received Rameltion we, uh, demonstrated significant improvement in their insomnia severity index. So when we go back to our sleep GERD relationship model, one can see that you can break this vicious cycle by treating gastroesophageal reflux disease or by treating sleep, at least we have one study using a sleeping pill in the form of Rameltion. So let's conclude here. Nighttime GERD is associated with uh, many sleep disturbances. Nighttime GERD and the associated sleep disturbances markedly improve with anti-reflux treatment. And there is a bi-directional relationship between GERD and sleep. GERD can worsen sleep quality and poor sleep can independently worsen gastroesophageal reflux disease. And at the end here, I will say, never give up on your dreams, keep sleeping. Thank you very much. All right, thank you, Dr. Fass. That was a great talk, Dean. Um, so switching gears now a little bit, we'll, uh, we'll move on uh, from the esophagus going towards the pancreas, a little bit down in the GI tract. Um, so I'm Rush, I'm one of the gastroenterologists at Baylor University Medical Center in here in Dallas, Texas with DHAT. And I'll be talking to you about endoscopic management of chronic pancreatitis. As a full disclosure, um, my presentation um, as a therapeutic endoscopy is heavily loaded with a lot of endoscopic intervention and pictures, and we'll go over them um, you know, one by one. So I have no financial disclosures pertaining to this topic. My objective today is to explain to you the complexity of pain mechanism in chronic pancreatitis describe the role of endoscopic therapy in chronic pancreatitis. Uh, some of the examples including pancreatic duct strictures, stones, peripancreatic fluid collection, benign common biliary strictures, as well as celiac plexus block. And then finally, attempt to define the right timing and right patient to offer endoscopic intervention in chronic pancreatitis. So, you know, I'd like to start off by this picture. So this is what they call the wall of fame uh, when you go to National Pancreatic Foundation meetings. Um, I went there as a first year fellow and then every year uh, thereafter. Every postcard has a handwritten story by a patient with chronic pancreatitis where they write how this disease has affected their lives. And this was really an eye-opening experience uh, and my first draw towards my interest in pancreatology. And this diagnosis has significant impact on our patients' lives and here is why. When a patient gets diagnosis with chronic pancreatitis, the disease-related unemployment is as high as 45%. Up to 40% patients will no longer be able to work in their own profession. About 35% to 30% patients will be diagnosed with diabetes throughout their lifespan because of chronic pancreatitis. 55% will require enzyme replacement therapy, and 40% patients will be on daily narcotics because of this disease. And a patient with chronic pancreatitis will spend on an average about 5% of their time every year in the hospital because complications of chronic pancreatitis. So it has a significant impact on patients' lives. And not only that, we did this study back in 2018 uh, where we analyzed the national uh, database and we found that when patients with chronic pancreatitis gets admitted with in the hospital, after discharge, one in four patients will be readmitted within 30 days. And out of those all admissions, close to 50% are due to complications of chronic pancreatitis. So not only on patients' lives, but this disease has significant impact on the healthcare as well. We all know this, the clinical presentation of chronic pancreatitis, for the longest time, all these patients will complain is abdominal pain. And as the disease gets advanced, and they, about 60 to 70% of the pancreas gets destroyed, 
at this point, they will have exocrine and endocrine insufficiency, which is manifested with uh, diarrhea, steatoria, weight loss, and diabetes. And in the very late stage of the disease, they will develop these morphological changes and will have the peripancreatic complications. A patient with advanced disease will have a combination of all this. The diagnosis of this disease is tricky because for the longest time, all the patient will complain is abdominal pain. And this is when by clinical suspicion, by the natural history of the disease, you can pick up the diagnosis. When they develop the exocrine and endocrine insufficiency, uh, that's when the indirect function testing that you do with the fecal fat or fecal elastase, as well as the direct function measurement by endoscopy, which I'll talk about in a minute, you can pick up the diagnosis. And pretty much at the very late stage of the disease is when imaging would be used like x-rays or CT scan or MRI will pick up the diagnosis of chronic pancreatitis. So with that in mind, I want to explain the complexity of pain in chronic pancreatitis and how you can describe your patient and where they are in the natural history of disease uh, in chronic pancreatitis. So the disease usually starts with a concept called intraductal hypertension, when there is a stricture or a stone in the pancreatic duct. And these patients will have pain anytime the pancreas gets stimulated, mostly by meals. So when the pancreas gets stimulated, they'll have this ischemic type of pain, but they will have completely pain-free spell in between the meals. And this is when the endoscopy and surgery will be highly beneficial. Unfortunately, most patients eventually will move on to the later stage of the disease where they develop this neuropathic pain because this recurrent inflammation in the pancreas, the nerve fiber gets hypertrophied and there is constant nociceptive receptor and modification of the pain uh, carrier pathway from the pancreas. And this patient will develop constant sense of abdominal pain and allodynia. Unfortunately, when they progress to this stage, the endoscopy and surgery only has limited benefits after this. But more importantly, when you see these patients in your clinic, it's important to put them on the spectrum of the disease. So if your patients are on the left side of the spectrum, they have earlier disease, they're gonna describe this pain, which is mostly postprandial and completely pain-free in between the pain spell. This is when if you offer the endoscopy and surgery is highly beneficial. Once they progress towards the right side of the spectrum or later stage of the disease, they will have this constant pain with intermittent worsening, but they will never be pain-free. And at this point, the endoscopy surgery has limited benefit. And what makes them progress from left side of the screen to the right side? There are many factors, but the modifiable factors, smoking and alcohol. So you should always ask your patient to quit those as hard as it might be. And then recurrent acute pancreatitis. So how can you prevent them from having recurrent attacks? So if there's a stricture or a stone, that's something we can intervene on and prevent this progression from happening. So with that in mind, let's dive into role of endoscopy therapy in chronic pancreatitis. First, starting with the diagnosis. So direct pancreatic function testing. This is an easy and simple test where we do a simple endoscopy and give this patient secretin, which will stimulate the pancreatic secretions of bicarbonate. We then aspirate the duodenal secretion every 15 minutes up to 60 minutes mark. And then at 60 minutes, we'll check the bi uh, bicarbonate level in this secretion. And if it's less than 80 milliequivalent, that is highly sensitive and specific for diagnosing exocrine pancreatic insufficiency. The downside of this test is very tedious. It's not widely available. And this is a 60 minutes EGD, which we are not typically accustomed to do. So if you do any modification in the time, it's gonna affect the sensitivity and specificity. Most commonly used nowadays is endoscopic ultrasound. And you can pick up a lot about pancreatic morphology based on this test. So this is how uh, the normal pancreas is supposed to look like. Uh, you can see the nice salt and pepper parenchyma and nice looking duct, as opposed to patients with chronic pancreatitis, where the duct is quite enlarged, there may or may not be stone in there, and the parenchyma is quite atrophic and they have calcified strands. And we can pick up these findings and then punch it into the table called Rosemont criteria and pick up the diagnosis of chronic pancreatitis if they satisfy the criteria. In a meta-analysis performed in 43 studies, the endoscopic ultrasound outperformed MRI and CT with the diagnostic accuracy of 81%. So it's a really good test to diagnose chronic pancreatitis. ERCP used to be used as a diagnostic method, but not anymore because of a few reasons. It's quite invasive. 
It has its own complication, one of which is chronic is a acute pancreatitis after ERCP. And EUS is significantly better, much more safer than ERCP. So nowadays, ERCP is only reserved as therapeutic mode, um, uh, and EUS is primarily used as a method of choice. And the new kid on the block is EUS elastography. So we published this back in June of this year, where we outlined the role of EUS in chronic pancreatitis. And the elastography, the liver world does, has done a lot of work with measuring the stiffness in cirrhosis. Well, it turns out we can do the same with pancreas. We can actually measure the stiffness in the pancreas. Uh, and in a study, they found that when they compared the stiffness of the pancreas in 42 healthy individuals with 52 individuals with diagnosis of chronic pancreatitis, the patients with chronic panc had significantly elevated stiffness in their pancreas. Not only that, the higher the stiffness, the more advanced was their disease. So by this test, we can actually pick up the diagnosis of chronic pancreatitis much more sooner than any other test. So let's dive into pancreatic duct strictures. So from this point on, I'm gonna do a case-based discussion. And uh, these are the actual cases that we have seen in the last few months and have intervened on the pancreas. So this was a patient referred to as a 64-year-old uh, alcoholic pancreatitis, some cardiac and renal comorbidities, who's having postprandial abdominal pain. In the last three months, this gentleman had two admissions with acute pancreatitis. We obtained the imaging, and this is what we saw. So you can see the massively dilated pancreatic duct here, and there's a stricture right here in the head. So what would you do? Would you offer ERCP with stent, surgery, medical management, or just neuromodulation? So let's see what the data says. So strictures are very common, happens in about 18% patient of chronic pancreatitis. And the current IAP guidelines, the International Association of Pancreatology guidelines recommends that ERCP with sequential stenting is the first line approach for isolated strictures in the head or body. The indication is pain relief. If the patient has pain, this should help. And the other is to prevent the progression from having recurrent acute pancreatitis. So does ERCP work? Well, this is a systemic review which was published evaluating the role of ERCP with stenting. The immediate pain relief was observed in up to 95% patient and a sustained pain relief at two years was as high as 68%. Another, if the st uh, strictures are refractory, there is an upcoming data on fully covered metal stent. Now this is not FDA approved yet in the US, but it's being used quite often in the, in the countries outside US. And in the United States, it has been used under research trials. And um, you know, when the strictures are refractory, you can actually put a fully covered metal stand in the pancreatic duct with the overall clinical success of 82% pain relief. What stand to use? So typically, we, uh, it's recommended that you use plastic stands more than seven French. What are the interval of stand exchanges? So we typically exchange the stand every two to three months so that stands don't get clogged. And then how long you should keep trying working on these pancreatic duct strictures. There's not a lot of clear data on this, but typically by one year, if you haven't achieved complete stricture resolution, then those are termed refractory strictures and you should think of surgery in these patients. By some data that we have, approximately 10 to 11 months is what it takes to completely resolve these strictures. The shortcoming of this method, uh, when they did a study where after the removal of pancreatic duct stent, when the stricture is completely gone, at five-year follow-up, up to 40% patient had recurrent strictures. So it's a high recurrence rate, but none of uh, most of this patient was still pain-free. So that was pretty good pain control. Um, but again, the data is limited. And the data on clinical success is mostly from single-center retrospective studies. So it's not a robust data on this method. So what happened with our patient, can, if you remember, they had a dilated duct in a stricture in the head. So we offered the ERCP and you can see there was a stricture in the head with upstream ductal dilatation. We dilated the stricture here and placed a seven French by 12 centimeter stand. This patient actually had a great response in terms of pain control and due for another ERCP in four weeks and uh, you know, so far has been doing pretty good uh, in terms of his pain control. So pancreatic duct stones. Another patient, a 54-year-old male diagnosed with gallstone pancreatitis, uh, referred uh, for recurrent episode of acute pancreatitis. He has ongoing mild, dull abdominal pain. MRI was obtained, and this is what it shows. So this patient was actually sent to us by our pancreatic surgeon. This patient had one outside ERCP, and they couldn't get into pancreatic duct. So our surgeons wanted us to try the ERCP to see if we can clear the duct. 
Uh, you can see the massively dilated pancreatic duct here. There's a stone here in the mid body. There's another stone in the head and possibly stricture down in the head as well. So this is a little bit complex patient. So what, what would you offer? Would you offer ERCP with lithotripsy? As well, and uh, you know, uh, as well is an extracorporeal shockwave lithotripsy, which the urologist uses to break up kidney stones. Well, you can use the same method to break up pancreatic duct stones. Would you offer both as well and ERCP surgery or just medical management? So again, let's look into the data. So again, the prevalence of stone increases to 50% five years after the diagnosis of chronic pancreatitis. The most common risk factors is being a male drinker and heavy smokers. And the, uh, the intervention you have, you can do ERCP as well or combined. ERCP alone only works for small stones less than five millimeter, but as well itself is quite effective. In this study, uh, they measured the short-term pain relief after as well alone was as high as 92%, and a sustained pain relief at 28 month follow up was 71%. But when you combine as well with endotherapy, at four year follow up, the full success rate was 76%. Once you break off the stones with as well, it becomes really uh, easy to, to clear the pancreatic duct stones with ERCP. And the new kid on the block, not so new anymore, is EHL or electrohydroelectric lithotripsy. We use it quite extensively in bile duct to break off the stone, but we can put the same uh, pancreatoscope in the pancreatic duct and use the, uh, directly visualize the pancreatic duct stone and use this EHL probe to break off the stone. Uh, there's not a lot of data because it's still new use, but uh, there was a study published in about 87 patients who failed traditional ERCP, and they did EHL, and they were able to clear the pancreatic duct stones in anywhere from 42 to 100% patients. So there's a wide variation there, but it depends what's your experience with EHL and how, um, you know, how big are the stones. So personally, I, you know, we have used it quite often in the pancreas with some really good results uh, by this method. So algorithm, if the stone is small, you can just do ERCP and remove it. If there is large stone, you can do as well or EHL. And if there are multiple stones or strictures or endoscopic therapy is not effective, you have to send these patients for surgery. The ESCAPE trial, which was published last year, they compared endoscopy first versus surgery and showed that surgery has better long-term outcomes and also less number of intervention. Obviously surgery is one and done as compared to ERCP, which is a sequential uh, therapy. But, you know, the debate between ERCP and surgery, what the IAP guidelines recommend is endoscopy should be first approach in a patient who have pain less than three years, they're not narcotic dependent, and have a single stricture or limited stone burden, versus surgery should be first approach when there are multiple stones and stricture, or if there's any suspicion for pancreatic mass. In conclusion, surgery does have better long-term outcome but endoscopy therapy when feasible is still preferred as a first line approach because it's less invasive, it can be repeated. And if anything, it does predict successful results to the future surgery. So if a patient responds to endoscopy, they're more high likely to respond to surgery. Whichever you offer, the early intervention before patient progresses to the late stage of the disease is always beneficial. So what happened with our case, once we gave him options for you know, endoscopic sequential therapy versus surgery, he already had feel, unfortunately, outside ESCP, and he wanted one and done, so he chose surgery, and, and yeah, I think he's having surgery next month. Peripancreatic fluid collection. So this is where the endoscopy has shown significant and revolutionized the GI world and has almost taken over any other approaches. So this was a 58-year-old male with gallstrom pancreatitis four weeks ago. He's now admitted to hospital with abdominal pain, fever, early satiety. Lipase is normal. A CT is done and shows this. So you can see this large collection abutting the stomach and there's an air inside collection. So this is the walled off necrosis possibly infected. So would you do ERCP, EUS with transmural drainage, surgical drainage or conservative treatment? So let's see what the data shows. So before we go into that, the terminology is very critical here. So if the patient has interstitial pancreatitis, anything less than four weeks is called acute peripancreatic collection more than four weeks is when we call it pseudocyst. If they have necrotizing pancreatitis, less than four weeks is called acute necrotic collection. And after four weeks, we call it walled off necrosis, which is what this patient has. It's very common, happens in about 20 to 40% patient with chronic pancreatitis. 
And the only reason you will drain it is if it satisfies one of the following indication. If it's causing obstruction, either gastric ulcer obstruction or biliary obstruction, it's infected like this patient. If it's causing intractable abdominal pain, and if it's ca causing complications such as bleeding or fistulization, then you have to drain it. And when you do decide to drain it, you have a few options, either endoscopy, percutaneous drain placement, or surgical. So let's see which one is better. So in this meta-analysis, they compared the endoscopy to percutaneous approach and found that endoscopy has significantly higher clinical success and an estimated lower length of stay and need for re-intervention. The percutaneous approach on the other side actually had a higher fistula formation because you're actually creating a fistula from outside. So endoscopy is clearly superior to percutaneous approach. In another meta-analysis, they compared endoscopy with surgery. This one had about six studies and 342 patients found that endoscopy is non-inferior to surgery in a comp clinical success comparison, but endoscopy does offer significantly lower adverse event and overall cost and length of stay. So again, it's pretty similar in terms of clinical success, but has its own benefit over surgery. And when you do decide to do endoscopic drainage, you have further options to do a metal stent, most commonly used limon opposing metal stent, uh, which looks like this dumbbell shaped stent versus the plastic stent. So which one would you use? So in this meta-analysis, when they compared the LAMS or limon opposing metal stent to plastic stent, metal stent had significantly higher clinical success for both walled off necrosis and cirrhosis. And another similar meta-analysis showing the same results when you compared metal and plastic, metal stent helped significantly higher clinical success uh, the only downside, you, they recommend you remove it in within three to four weeks. Otherwise, you deal with some complications of, uh, of stents being there after the collection has resolved. But then there are some other studies. This is coming from Dr. Verlager's group in Florida, where they compared lamps and plastics in their experience. Uh, they are not different in terms of clinical success. So the debate still stands. Whichever method you choose to drain your collection, one thing I'll caution you, you always have to think about is what is the status of pancreatic duct? And here is why. You can evaluate the pancreatic duct by few methods. You can do MRI with secretin protocol, which is what we use in our center quite often. Or you can do MRCP without secretin or an ERCP. But if your duct, if it's intact, like in first picture, after you drain the peripancreatic fluid collection, your success rate is gonna be pretty high. If the duct has disrupted and you see any leak from there, you're better off doing the ERCP and placing the stent in the pancreatic duct to prevent the recurrence from happening. But if you find out that the duct is completely disrupted and patient has what we call disconnected duct syndrome, these are the patient you have to keep higher recurrence rate even after you successfully drain the collection and you have to think about surgery if that happens. So in summary, if the collection is infected, obstructing, hurting, or bleeding, you need to drain it. Endoscopy is superior to percutaneous and comparable to surgical approach. And nowadays, the first uh, method of choice for drainage of this periprancreatic fluid collection with overall success rate 80 to 100% for pseudocysts and 70 to 80% for Waldorf necrosis. And metal stents are shown to be superior to plastic stents in some studies, but the debate still stands. So what happened with our case? So we offered the cyst gastrostomy first. We placed a lumen opposing metal stent. As you can see, this is the uh, lamps being deployed uh, under EUS and fluoroscopy guidance. And you can see the necrosum through the uh, metal stent. This patient required three sessions of necrosectomies, but we were able to clear out his cavity completely. But uh, when we did the ERCP, you can see the duct is pretty nice high highlighted in the head but mid body, there is complete leak from the duct and there is no duct left in the tail. So this patient unfortunately had a completely disconnected duct. And while he's doing quite well after the drainage, this is something that we're gonna be um, you know, looking out for any recurrence. And if that happens, then consider surgery. <clears throat> a little bit about distal <clears throat> um, bile duct strictures. So the prevalence is pretty high up to 40% in chronic pancreatitis. Typically, it presents with elevated liver enzymes, uh, cholestatic pattern, cholangitis, but sometimes, if not corrected for a while, can lead to secondary biliary cirrhosis as well. When you see a stricture, you have to rule out malignancy with either brushings or biopsy, and endoscopy is still a preferred treatment, and when you do an ERCP, what's recommended is you do either multiple plastic stent or a fully covered metal stent, which are preferred over single plastic stent, 
uh, with the overall clinical success ranging from 60 to 70%. Uh, these are refractory strictures to treat sometimes, and by one year, if you don't have clinical success, you, you have to send these patients for surgical referral because after that, the efficacy of endoscopy is questionable. So this is a patient we had with digital bile duct stricture. You can see the stricture down here. We ruled out malignancy by brushing and cytology, and then we placed two 10 French plastic stent, and this patient is eight months uh, after stent removal, still doing pretty well and hasn't had a recurrence. So it works uh, quite effectively. And finally, I'd like to end with celiac plexus block. So let, all the uh, things I mentioned so far is for the early spectrum of the disease. But how about if you see a patient who has progressed, unfortunately, to the later part of the disease, the neuropathic pain, have constant pain. Um, so what can you offer to these patients? Well, you can offer celiac plexus block where you can locate the celiac ganglia with EUS um, and inject uh, local anesthetic um, and a steroid directly into the ganglia. And this works about 60% of the time. The downside is it only lasts for about three to six months. However, if you have seen a patient with chronic pancreatitis and the pain they go through, in my short experience, they will take even a few months of good quality of life if this works. So it's an option that you can offer your patient. So in summary, we, uh, we talked about the role of endoscopy in diagnosis of chronic pancreatitis in pancreatic duct strictures and stone, peripancreatic fluid collection where endoscopy has now taken over as a preferred approach in distal biliary strictures as well as celiac plexus block. I'd like to thank the conference organizers for inviting me to have this talk and thank you all for listening to me and I'll be happy to take any questions in Q&A session. Thank you. All right, um, so we'll move on to the QA session and we'll um, have Dr. Fass uh, join us first. Um, all right. Okay, so first question for Dr. All right, we have. All right, uh, so first question for Dr. Fass is Was there a difference in reflex event with the patient that slept? flat versus those slapped in a sitting up position? Yeah, so there is uh, data showing that uh, elevating the head of the bed or moving to the sitting position improves uh, nighttime reflux. Um, in fact, there are uh, early studies going back maybe about 30 years ago showing that when you uh, put patients in a seated position or elevating the head of the bed, you can even heal low grades of erosic esophagitis. And so in patients with nighttime reflux, one would consider elevating the head of the bed. And obviously the extreme of it is sleeping in a seated position uh, as, as one of the ways to address the problem. Okay. All right. Um, the second question for Dr. Farris is, are you suggesting that we use PPI at bedtime? Not at all. I hope that that was not the message. Uh, PPI should never be given at bedtime. They should always, if you want to give uh, a patient with primarily nighttime symptoms and you want to give them PPI, then position them uh, half an hour before dinner. Uh, I, I have to admit that uh, when studies are done, it appears that taking PPI at bedtime is very popular amongst patients, but this is uh, an inappropriate way of taking a PPI. All right. All right. Well, another question for you, Dr. Fass, is that in the study that you mentioned about reflux causing a nighttime awakening, were all the patients had pH study through an acid reflux, or could there be any functional component in there? So I'm not really sure about the question. Uh, so there was the study of uh, nighttime awakening. If there is a question about that maybe part of their symptoms are related to functional heartburn. Um, remember, these patients did have awakenings. They did have evidence of reflux events. Now, uh, we assume that the two are somewhat associated. It, it, it's, it's not clear really which is the chicken and which is the egg. Does it mean that patient wake up uh, and then have a reflux, or maybe before they have a reflux, there is some type of uh, reflex that lead to waking up and then they reflux. But I think that has nothing to do with functional esophageal disorders. Okay. 
All right, um, well, I'll take this next question. So what is the risk for pancreatitis with EHL? So that, that's a great question. Uh, you know, overall, the patient with chronic pancreatitis um, are actually at a lower risk of having post-ERCP pancreatitis. Typically, we quote anywhere from 5 to 10% in a normal patient. In a patient with chronic pancreatitis, the, role of post, the, the rate of post-ERCP pancreatitis is anywhere from 3 to 5%. Uh, I'm not aware that uh, any data suggesting that EHL increases that risk. So I'll, I'll say it, it's pretty close to three to 5%. And the other question uh, is what is the initial screening test or imaging for someone who walks into GI clinic complaining of postprandial abdominal pain? And should you refer this patient to advanced uh, GI or surgery? Um, well, that's, you know, so Postprandial abdominal pain as you know, wide differential as we, as we know. Um, you know, I think we'll do the dyspepsia workup, like typical workup that we'll do based on that age. Um, I think if clinically, though, you're suspecting chronic pancreatitis as a cause of uh, postprandial pain and you have ruled out all the other etiology, uh, I, I think you, could, you can do uh, you know, pancreatic specific MRI or send them for EUS if you're really clinically suspecting. Obviously, if they have diarrhea, you can, you can look for uh, uh, you know, pancreatic function um, by a stool elastase, but I think EUS uh, will be the preferred choice if you're really thinking to catch this at an at a earlier stage that we can with the, with the limitation we have in the early disease. Um, next question is for Dr. Wazy. Oh, I think he's online. Um, so Dr. Wazy, the question is, can marijuana affect the esophageal motility? <laughs> well, it, it affects your mood, that's for sure. <laughs> um, I'm not aware of marijuana necessarily affects the esophagus in the same way as we've talked about with opioids. Um, it's a good question. I'm, I'm not aware of any data that suggests there is any hyper or hypo contractility with the use of marijuana. Good, good area to study. I'll get the fellows to participate in that study. <laughs> <laughs> Very well. Um, well, the follow-up question is for you as well, Dr. Vazis. So how do you even find out if the, the primary pathology is because of opioid use, just because someone is on opioids? Uh, how do you know that achalasia is because of opioid or they just have primary disease? That's a great question. And that's the one that's really difficult to assess, right? Because at the end of the day, when you're faced with a patient that when you've done manometry, they have the right symptoms, you do manometry and the diagnosis is echolasia, then the question becomes, which is it? The only really good way to assess that would be to get the patient off opioids and good luck doing that. These are patients that have been on chronic therapy. The only other way uh, would be the uh, study that I shared with you with Dr. Babai had done where um, you know, using some of the um, uh, either uh, amyl nitrate, for example, if you look at the amyl nitrate study, it does show that after amyl nitrate, you have hypercontractility, especially in the esophageal body in the distal area and the lower esophageal sphincter, while you don't that you get that with idiopathic, but you don't get that with those that have opioid. Uh, so that, that's the only way to know, but clinically, you're absolutely right. It would be very difficult to assess unless you take the patients off opioids and then restudy them. That's hard to do. Okay. Um, another question for Dr. Vazy. When you mentioned about uh, dilation uh, for suspected achalasia because of uh, opioid use, would you use CRE balloons or, uh, or pneumatic dilation for that? Yeah, I think one of the things I mentioned in the talk is you really want to be very careful with very aggressive therapy in this group. Uh, you may be forced to do it because these patients have uh, essentially looks just like echolasia, idiopathic echolasia. They have high lower esophageal sphincter. It does not relax. Esophageal body is simultaneous. So um, I'm highly cautious. So what I try to do is do CRE. I might even do Botox. I try to avoid very aggressive therapy, but I have had a few cases where no matter what I do, they really can't get off of the opioids for various reasons. Then I go back to what I typically do with idiopathic. But the most important part of this is if you're treating pain, if the patient's complaint is pain, no treatment's going to help you. 
because that's a different mechanism. It is the dysphagia that you should be targeting with any of your therapies. So if the patient's predominant complaint is dysphagia, then yes, you could start with CRE balloons, with Botox, if that's not effective, you could either do pneumatic and or myotomy or even pollen. But remember, dysphagia has to be the predominant symptom, not pain. Okay, got it. Um, well, the next question is, that does cigarette smoking alone can cause pancreatitis? Um, absolutely, yes. Yeah. So uh, there have been a few meta-analyses and, and a lot of great studies showing that smoking plays significant role in, in uh, well, acute recurrent pancreatitis and then chronic pancreatitis as well. In, in fact, I'll say like, you know, alcohol is so much, you know, advertised as a cause of um, chronic pancreatitis, but patient has to drink significant amount of alcohol for a number of years to develop chronic pancreatitis. And usually the smoking and alcohol does tend to go hand in hand. So, you know, a lot of times patients, and there have been studies where the patients were termed idiopathic pancreatitis, but when the, the smoking was assessed, that was actually found to be single isolated factor responsible for majority of the idiopathic pancreatitis. So absolutely, yes. Um, do you think a trial of pancreatic enzyme is sufficient to diagnose EPI? Um, and I, you know, I think uh, to diagnose EPI, we, we have a you know great tool. You you could do uh, pancreatic elastase or fecal fat testing. I think you know I'll, I'll be afraid that if you give pancreatic enzyme and if if it's just giving placebo effect to the patient, you know, especially if they have IBS in the differential and not. So I, I would you know I would say that it's easy enough test that we can measure it and diagnose exocrine pancreatic insufficiency before starting enzymes and. Actually, even if they're on enzymes, it wouldn't change as far as they're not having completely liquid stool, uh, it wouldn't change the sensitivity of your elastase testing. So uh, the only thing which hampers the sensitivity if they're having very watery diarrhea. So otherwise, you can always ch check for them to kind of document that they have EPI before, before starting the enzymes. Uh, the next question is for Dr. Wazy that, um, in a patient, if you offer myotomy for suspected achalasia because of opioid use, should you do the pH te testing before to see if they have any acid reflux disease? Well, no. So what you would do is you would really assess the patient just like you do for echolasia. You know, I look at echolasia and reflux disease as matter and antimatter. It's like day and night. So even though patients with echolasia might have symptoms that resemble reflux, we all know that the mechanism is different. The mechanism for the symptom of regurgitation, even heartburn and echolasias, the lower esophageal sphincter is not open at all. So this is not a gastroesophageal reflux. In a patient that undergoes myotomy or even pollen, there is a higher likelihood that post-therapy they will have reflux. There's no recommendation that you necessarily do pH testing. You can empirically treat, or if the patient comes back with recurrence of symptom, either heartburn or dysphagia from mucosal stricturing due to reflux, you do your endoscopy, you see the inflammation, then you treat the patient with PPI. Many have suggested that you just empirically treat the patient post myotomy or pollen with once daily PPI therapy. So if you want to do the easy thing, you just treat them with once daily therapy of PPI. Okay. All right. I have another, another question for Dr. Us about pregnancy and GERD, uh, uh, how are they related and how is the sleep cycle gets affected uh, by GERD when the patient is pregnant? So pregnancy really adds uh, some other factors into the picture, which is uh, obviously unrelated to the non-pregnant person. Uh, obviously, there are two things that happen. It's the female hormones that affect motility of the esophagus and affect uh, peristalsis and lower esophageal sphincter basal pressure, as well as the increase in intra-abdominal in, intra pressure, which uh, trans is transferred to increase in intragastric pressure as the patient become more and more pregnant over time. And, and obviously then patients experience uh, most, uh, more uh, reflux symptoms. Um, I'm, I have to admit that I'm not aware of many studies that look specific specifically at the pattern of uh, nighttime reflux in pregnant women. In general, we don't have a lot of studies in pregnant women. Uh, but there are many other factors that now play a role in pregnant women, which is not just in the straightforward 
uh, GERD patient that has uh, nighttime uh, symptoms. Uh, so I, I'd like to kind of, this is kind of an overall summary of uh, what's going on. Okay. Um, question for Dr. Vasey. Um, do you recommend Heller myotomy for opioid induced achalasia, uh, I guess, as opposed to POEM? Yeah, really the choice, if you decide that you're going to intervene more and you can't get the patient off therapy and they're highly symptomatic and they have dysphagia as the predominant symptom, then your treatment options are three. And if the patient is a candidate, the treatment options are three. That's what I mentioned. <clears throat> Depends on your institutional strength. So at Vanderbilt, we can do all three. So we can do pneumatic dilation, we can do POEM, we can do Heller myotomy. If you're in a center where your strength is one or the other, then I recommend you do what's the strength of your institution and your endoscopy lab. So um, for me, I give all three options to my patients. I go over the risks and the benefits. Uh, remember that if patients are older and they're not candidate to undergo pneumatic dilation or surgery or POEM, because essentially it's the same criteria, then you're really left with endoscopy and Botox. Um, so I would be careful to make sure that they are candidates. And if they are, and you have the institutional support, then discuss the risks and benefit for all three. All three are options, except if the esophagus is too dilated. If the esophagus gets to be too dilated, pneumatic dilation or POEM may not be the best option. And you reach out for Heller myotomy if the patient has not had a prior therapy. Um, so the next question for you, Dr. Vasey, what do you think about endoflib? Is this safer than pneumatic dilation? Well, endoflip is not a form of therapy. So you got to remember, endoflip is just uh, an, another way of diagnosing echolasia. So um, I, I would say if you don't know how to diagnose echolasia and you need another diagnostic test, then that might help you. However, if patient symptoms are classic, dysphagia, regurgitation, the dysphagias to solids and liquids, you do your endoscopy and it's mild or moderate dilation with retained saliva and pucker G junction, your barium swallow shows uh, the classic findings, your manometry shows the classic findings, do you need an alternative form of diagnosis? So endoflip is not a therapeutic option for echolasia. It's a diagnostic option if there are gray zones and you're unsure of how to diagnose the patient. For me, um, I don't use endoflip to diagnose patients because I have other means that I diagnose it and we have the expertise to do so. Okay. And, and the next question for you, Dr. Vasey, how long does the patient have to be off opioids prior to repeating a manometry? Yeah, that, that, that's actually an area of uh, active research. No one really knows. Ideally, you want to be off of it for in the acute studies. Remember, in the acute studies, they could actually take them off for only a few days and study them. The problem is, what is the impact of someone that has been on the PPIs chronically? So the studies that we're trying to do is we're taking patients off for a month at least and then studying them. That might even not be enough. So the answer is, we don't know, but I would feel uncomfortable for less than a month. The longer, the better. But we, you have to work with whoever's prescribing the opioids and the pain clinic that if the patient's on to really make sure that they're switched from some of those um, opioid agonists to the partial agonist, perhaps, or alternative means of um, treating their pain. Uh, and then you repeat it at least uh, a month, if not longer. Okay. Uh, the next question is how reliable is fecal elastase in diagnosing early pancreatic insufficiency? That, that, that's a great question. I, and I think it, it depends what stage patients are and their disease. So, you know, if they are having clinical suspicion, like they're losing weight or having steatoria at that point, it's very reliable. Um, I, you know, I think that they quote, they quote uh, the diagnostic accuracy, it's, it's wide variation, but anywhere from 50 to 70%. I believe the earlier when they're actually, you know, typical teaching is it, the pancreatic insufficiency doesn't happen until the patient destroys anywhere from 60 to 70% of their pancreas because of the disease. So, so at, you know, earlier stage, not 
sure if there's any data on, on the sensitivity. Um, we see a lot of advertisement nowadays with EPI and patients asking about EPI because of the TV ads, but I'm not aware what is the sensitivity in the earlier disease. Next question for, I think Dr. Faz, any problem in using PPI in pregnancy? Yes. So, um, so, so let me explain it uh, and make it very clear. None of the PPIs is approved for pregnant women. Uh, in fact, uh, the, uh, they're all basically were not studied in pregnant women. And as you all know, we don't do uh, medication uh, studies in pregnant women. Uh, and so, but there, there are cases where the studies reported that uh, uh, pregnant women received uh, PPIs during the pregnancy without any events during the pregnancy and afterwards. But as I said, none of the PPIs is approved for a pregnant woman. Okay, all right. Um, and I think this is the last question for Dr. Vasey. How much uh, does the opioid of, uh, have an acute effect? Uh, it's present when the drug is in system and how much is present on a chronic basis so who are not opioid dependent or having a drug level in the body? So I'm not quite un understanding it. We uh, do know that, yeah. I, I think if I understand, the question, so I think it's how much if, uh, is the effect of opioids uh, for someone who are using it on chronic basis versus somebody who is using on an acute basis as needed? Yeah, so the issue is really the chronicity of use more so than the acute. So let's say you had surgery and um, you have pain and you're given a weak course of pain medication opioid, that is not going to cause the issues that uh, we discussed. The predominant, the overwhelming majority of data in this area, especially when it comes to the hypercontractile state of echolasia, spasm, and others, is really on those that have had chronic therapy. So this is someone that has chronic back pain, chronic X, Y, and Z, and they've been on it for months and years, and then they present with dysphagia. So be cognizant of those that have been on it chronically less the acute presentation. Okay. I believe that was the last question. So thank you so much, Dr. Vizzi and Dr. Faz. That was a great discussion. A wonderful session ahead for the next couple of hours. Uh, an all-star review of uh, inflammatory bowel disease. And uh, our first uh, speaker this afternoon is Dr. Gary Lichtenstein, who's professor at University of Pennsylvania. He's going to tell us about practical applications of treat to target in inflammatory bowel disease. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you virtually. Um, today, I'm going to talk about treat to target, the practical applications in clinical practice. <clears throat> I'm Gary Lichtenstein, professor of medicine. I direct the Inflammatory Bowel Disease Center at the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia. My disclosures are before you. The objectives today are to discuss the premise of the treat to target approach for inflammatory bowel disease. We'll review and help you understand different targets and goals, review the strategies to achieve these goals, and discuss how medication optimization can help hit the targets. To start with, if we look at Crohn's disease, it's a progressive disease in the majority of individuals. Over time, there's inflammation, and this persists if it's not adequately treated and can lead to damage to the bowel wall. Strictures, fistulae, abscess, a need for surgery, and even neoplasia can result from this. This is depicted in this cartoon. And the diagnosis time is in gray with a blue arrow, as you can see here. And what we'd like to do is to detect the disease early in the course and we turn this our window of opportunity in which we can introduce appropriate medical therapy that's appropriately aggressive and mitigate against the development of the complications down the line. These that are highlighted here are obviously bad outcomes from someone who has Crohn's disease. So the bowel function can deteriorate, the quality of life goes down and complications can ensue. So as you've seen uh, that disease activity that persists can lead to difficulty with long-term sequelae and complications of the disease. As a consequence, we attempt to 
diagnose early and interdigitate appropriately medical therapy in an effort to lessen the potential for adverse events. So treating early in the course of disease is very important to help lessen the chance that individuals may have long-term sequelae, tight control and monitoring. And this is akin to other disease states, for example, diabetes mellitus. And we'll talk more about that in the future. In ulcerative colitis, it's virtually the same, but the adverse events that ensue are somewhat difficult. Again, there's a preclinical phase. We have subclinical inflammation. It hits that threshold of which symptoms develop and complications can come about. Stricturing, which when you think you see a stricture in a patient with ulcerative colitis, about a third harbor on malignancy, so be sure that it's not something of neoplastic origin, and be sure you don't have Crohn's disease. <clears throat> Pseudopolyps may come about as well. Functional problems such as dysmotility and anorectal dysfunction, uh, and long-term severe inflammation as a higher risk of colorectal neoplasia or colon cancer. There are three pillars of IBD care that we have. One is early intervention, two is a treat-to-target approach, and lastly, tight control. And it's important to communicate these to the patient and educate them. These are the endpoints we strive to achieve in an effort to prevent disease-related complications. So when you do this, you say, what is our target? What is the goal of therapy that we have? And I'm going to review that. The aim is to avoid the development of serious complications and disability in patients that have chronic conditions. The concept is to treat to a defined treatment target, uh, which is perceived to be optimal to lessen long-term outcomes. In other words, you have goal-oriented approach uh, in the time you treat your patient in an effort to prevent things, and you have a specific strategy and the strategy is your game plan, if you would. Ongoing and regular monitoring of the target and the surrogate marker with optimization of the treatment when the target is not yet achieved. We have additional principles as well that all components, the target, the treatment, and the monitoring are tailored to the individual needs of the patient. And de-escalation of therapy may be considered when treatment goals are achieved. So, this is a very important concept that's not unique to inflammatory bowel disease. So you have a predefined target, a consult that you make with the patient to say, these are the endpoints we're looking for. You monitor and you modify until you get to the achieved target. And you hope to get, which is depicted here, the bullseye approach, if you would. This is an historic picture picture on the front cover of gastroenterology uh, that showed how infliximab worked, the first biologic that gained regulatory approval to show that you can have ulcerations depicted here in A picture, and in B where there's heel area scarring. Well, this is the first patient was treated by this gentleman here, Saunders von der Venter, who was in uh, Academic Medical Center in Amsterdam, and he treated a pediatric patient, was the first to find patient that got therapy with CA2, which is currently now known as infliximab. And the work of Drs. Mary and Dr. Robert Modigliani, who have been very involved in France with the Jeté group, and really the founders of such, were really the individuals who put the endoscopic index of severity, the CDEIS on the map, in an effort to define the severity of Crohn's-related ulcerations. And they validated this directly. So this is something that we owe a lot to these individuals for pioneering this area. And I referred to this before, the treat-to-target approach. We have different disease states where this is employed in standard of practice. Diabetes mellitus, we look for a low glycosylated hemoglobin. Rheumatoid arthritis, we look for low disease activity, and we might calculate the SHARP score. Hypertension, we look for a low 
blood pressure, and hypercholesterolemia as well. We look for low LDL cholesterol in an effort to mitigate against the potential future deleterious effects of uncontrolled disease states. And is it feasible in IBD? Well, we have symptoms and we look at quality of life. We have labs, the biomarkers, CRP and fecal calprotectin, and we have mucosal healing. This has been associated with hospitalizations that are less and surgery when it's healed. It's less overall the effect of the disease long-term. And then biologic, which is a disease remission, which is deep. So the absence of endoscopic ulceration and histologic inflammation. And this is arguably the hardest to achieve, but the most durable and the best effect one can achieve in treating patients. In Crohn's disease, the STRIDE group came forth and said, let's create some endpoints that are logical and put these to the test in future studies. These are twofold. Clinical patient reported outcome of remission and also the endoscopic remission. And these are defined as the absence of abdominal pain and normalization of bowel habits and resolution of ulceration endoscopically. And with that, we have objunctive measures, the biomarkers and the histology. So fecal calprotectin and CRP, we'd like to see normalized. They're not true targets for monitoring, but they're very helpful. And they look to see if an individual has normalization of the CRP and the calprotectin, we want to then quote, trust but verify. So we look endoscopically, or we look with cross-sectional imaging if we don't have the ability to get there with an endoscope, in other words, a small bowel, looking for hyper-enhancement to see that it's resolved and stricture formation is not present. And histologically is not a target currently, but it's an important endpoint if you can achieve it, you have a better outcome in the future. In a similar vein, we look for similar findings in patients with Crohn's disease directly. These, in a similar vein, we look for similar findings in patients with Crohn's directly. And the patient reported outcome, endoscopic remission, and as well the biomarkers and histology. So again, we parallel the ulcerative colitis endpoints in Crohn's disease. So it's more work to do it in this fashion. It's certainly easier to say to the patient, so how do you feel? And if they say they feel great, is that enough? Well, let's talk about some of that data. So if you look in the study um, that was done, the SONIC trial, that looked at individuals that were treated with infliximab, azathioprine, or a combination thereof, in a post hoc analysis, if you look at this, about half the patients in clinical remission based on the Crohn's disease activity index, which is defined as less than 150, um, had active disease based on CRP and or endoscopy. So clearly not a great endpoint to look for directly. And in ulcerative colitis, the same thing may occur. Symptoms may be more reliable in ulcerative colitis, but there's still a gap in endoscopy and patients may have the absence of symptoms, but persistent endoscopic inflammation. So therefore, symptoms are not enough to ask as it relates to defining if a patient is in a state of, quote, endoscopic remission. And this is something that's not new. Robert Modigliani in the Jetage study group now 30 years ago described this, the correlation of symptoms with endoscopy, the R value was 0.13, clearly not a good correlation in patients with Crohn's disease. If we look as well, another study looked at this and patients came for endoscopic evaluation. The majority of IBD patients who came in for colonoscopies had symptomatic remission, had persistent mucosal inflammation. No endoscopic inflammation in about a third, endoscopic and histologic inflammation in nearly a half, and histologic inflammation in nearly a half as well. So again, the endoscopy in the colon is a very important component of what we do to confirm that there is true healing of the mucosa.
Is it important to heal the mucosa? Does it make a difference? Well, this is a study, the ACT-1 and the ACT-2 trials looked at patients with ulcerative colitis. Those that achieved mucosal healing, a subscore of zero or one, or in the orange or the dashed top graphs here, had a colectomy-free survival that was superior to those that had endoscopy subscores of more severity. A Mayo score of two or a Mayo score of three suggesting active inflammation not solving is the reason why patients will do worse. And this is on the graph here, we're looking at colectomy-free survival, and this is weeks. So about a year out, it's clearly a difference. Almost heal was as good as healed though, and it's important to remember. So a Mayo zero and a Mayo one do nearly as well as each other. So very important component. A meta-analysis recently looked at endoscopic healing and looked to see if there's clearly a benefit. 13 studies over 2,000 patients, and this is studies with ulcerative colitis. In the next slide, I'll share with you studies on Crohn's. The odds ratio for clinical remission with mucosal healing 52 weeks out is four and a half. Colectomy-free survival at about a year 4.15, so very, very important predictors. In a similar vein with Crohn's, although not as much as a response overall, clinical remission, the odds ratio was 2.8, and odds ratio of 2.2 for Crohn's-related surgery for at least 50 weeks. So once again, these are important endpoints we try to strive for, given the benefit that comes about from achieving them. And Stride looked at 28 specialists who recommended, based on a systematic literature review, uh, some suggestions. The ulcerative colitis target should be patient reported outcome, that is rectal bleeding and diarrhea, and endoscopic remission, a Mayo score of zero or one. And if histologic remission can be achieved, that's an adjunctive goal that is quite nice to achieve, but not mandatory. And in Crohn's, it's very similar. The patient reported outcome, abdominal pain, diarrhea resolution, and altered bowel habit, and endoscopic remission, resolution of the ulceration at the ileocolonoscopy, and resolution of findings on cross-sectional imaging, such as an MRI or a CT who patients are such that you cannot assess the mucosa at the small bowel site, then this is a good adjunct to look for. Biomarker remission was considered adjunctive and not a primary endpoint, given there can be persistent ulceration despite normalization of biomarkers, whether it be the CRP or the fecal calprotectin. The FDA has changed things as well. High placebo response rates are in a lot of clinical trials. Disease activity indices aren't validated PROs, patient reported outcomes that is, and the composite symptom scores don't measure inflammation per se. True response lacks specificity and the physician's global assessment with the Mayo score is not thought to be reliable and hence is no longer going to be used in future trials. And the general well-being is also not very reliable in the Crohn's disease activity index. They're not objective, they're very subjective, and they're the least reliable of all the components when measured. So the proposed solution is patient-reported outcomes and objective evidence, and the interim solution for the patient-reported outcomes is subjective response items from the Crohn's Disease Activity Index and the Mayo Score, as we've highlighted. So the treat to target is an early investment for a long-term payoff. We have predefined goals of therapy, regular assessment of disease activity with objective clinical biologic outcome measures. We adjust treatments. We have protocols of predefined therapeutic consequences and targets and early intervention in high-risk patients. The question comes about, does it improve outcomes? And there are different ways to hit the target. Um, as a start, we recognize that symptoms alone is not enough. 
we have potential options of proactive versus not reactive, or we have reactive as another way to get there. And they're differing because proactive means making adjustments in a prospective fashion that are predefined. We set a goal, we stay on top of the patients until they reach that pre-specified goal, or you recognize that it's not an achievable outcome. You don't just start the medication and say, see you in a month or two, you optimize them. And this may be the hard part, but we can go through that directly. So this is an interesting study that looked at proactive therapeutic monitoring as a part of tight control. And this comparison of the two uh, therapeutic drug monitoring uh, potential ways are reactive, where if someone has a disease flare, you then change and modify the drug that's being used to treat it. You may increase the dose shorten intervals. Whereas proactive, you measure a drug level and you change the actual frequency or maintain it based upon the monitoring level that you've achieved. And this is highlighted in here. Those that had proactive monitoring had reduced treatment failure, reduced surgery and hospitalization, fewer antibodies developed to uh, the drug itself, infliximab, and fewer adverse events. So clearly it sounds like it's the way to go based on this. And this is an area of controversy because proactive is not as well defined. You would also manage patients differently if they had a high or not high risk. High risk, as is illustrated here, would be with frequent monitoring. In the red, you see colonoscopy. In the gray, you see imaging. These might be CT enterographies. Whereas a not high risk, you might start initially and then maybe a couple years later or a pre-specified time later, you check, uh, may alter a colonoscopy with an imaging study if they have a low propensity to go on and progress. So you modify this based on the patient's presentation and their potential future risk. MRI enterography I discussed, there's something called a MARIA score. And this is a score that you can develop uh, from reading the MRI enterography. And MRE and endoscopy scores have a good correlation, reasonable that is. The P is 0.51 and it's statistically significant when looking at the Crohn's disease endoscopic index of severity. For ulcer healing, it's pretty good. Um, when you have a positive predictive value over 90% and a negative predictive value over 90% for ulcer healing, with an accuracy of about 90%. Um, if you look at these levels, less than 11. Mucosal healing, it's not quite as good, but clearly for ulcer healing, it's very good. There's also point of care disease monitoring that's gonna be forthcoming. Um, we get longitudinal assessments of patients over time. There's no radiation, no prep needed, low cost, and you can perform it by a gastroenterologist. So point of care might be a fecal cal protected in the office or at home, measuring a CRP in a study, and that's important. Telemedicine has really hit us hard with the era of COVID, um, and many patients embrace this, and this has actually been tested uh, a while back before the era of COVID in patients that had inflammatory bowel disease, multi-center randomized control, four centers in the Netherlands. At 12 months, they looked at the different groups, those that had telemedicine compared to standard of care, and there were fewer outpatient visits, fewer hospital admissions, and both patients reported quality of life scores that were both high. So this is something that we believe is here to stay. It makes it easier for patients and physicians alike. If patients live far away, then it's easier to visit, and it certainly is easier to communicate the thing that's lacking is a physical exam. And if that's needed, you can have a patient come into the office and examine them if it's clinically relevant to the decision in clinical care. Self-monitoring of the CalPO, I, re I referred to this, and this is done in other countries, not yet in the United States, but it's something we believe will be embraced. And you can then have it downloaded and into the uh, patient's medical records and follow their course the rapidity of which they respond or don't respond to a certain 
therapeutic intervention. And in a treat to target algorithm, uh, a cluster randomized trial was done uh, and published uh, a while back, and it looked at individuals and they were reevaluated after a period of time. And it's of interest that the proportion of patients in symptomatic remission over 24 months was rather similar. Baseline 6, 12, 18, and 24 months, but there was a defined benefit, and it's highlighted in this slide less surgery less serious complications, less hospitalizations, and less hospital surgery or serious disease complications overall. When we look at those that had treatment in an early combined immune suppression versus conventional management. So appropriately aggressive therapy has better outcomes in the long-term for patients uh, directly and leads to better uh, overall patient fairly. Drug optimization. So this is an important tool to achieve targets and it's really come in to become standard of practice to do so. This is something that our group published data, Dr. Osterman, Dr. Lewis, and looked at in clinically quiescent ulcerative colitis, increasing the salamine dose from 2.4 to 4.8 grams, lower fecal calprotectin to levels associated with lower relapse rates. So this is something that says, if someone has inflammation, consider treatment with a higher dose of the drug they're on. This was a mesalamine trial in an effort to lessen the chance of future flare. Now, this has not been proven prospective large trials. This is a small investigator-initiated trial and still has to be validated in a large way. But the safety of mesalamine says, why not? Let's try it. Histologic healing can be achieved with medication adjustment. And this is an article uh, that was published, Retrospective Undergoing Colonoscopy for Ulcerative Colitis, Treat to Target versus Not Treated to Target, sort of standard of care. And the treat to target is yes in this group here and in this group over here, uh, whereas the standard care was given to those others. And you can see mucosal healing and histologic healing was more likely to be achieved in individuals that had a treat-to-target approach. This is really the first article in the IBD world that came out suggesting this approach by Dr. Sanborn and his group at UCSD. Another study looked at by the group at Beth Israel in Boston, Adam Chaifetz and uh, uh, his group looked at this. One person in the group was doing therapeutic monitoring on a proactive level, whereas the other was doing uh, no testing directly. And they looked at individuals and Fliximab at a trough level greater than five had more persistence of staying on drug. Those that had less than five uh, were in this here in the red, uh, they would have less chance of staying on drug as compared to those that were not tested at all. They were rather similar. So. The suggestion that therapeutic drug monitoring leads to better persistent on drug and even a higher rate of doing well uh, is suggested based on this study directly. And there's suggestions to look at various trough levels. A recent meta-analysis led by Joe Feuerstein suggested uh, that the levels of greater or equal to five for infliximab, that's trough levels. And again, that's measured just before the drug is administered. Uh, Adalimumab is seven and a half. Sertilizumab pegol is greater than 20. And Golimumab, there wasn't enough data at the time to really suggest a target level directly. Since these agents have been introduced, others have come about. Vetalizumab, and this is based on the study data, those people that had uh, higher levels, um, low trough levels of vetalism at week six, less than 19 was associated with the need for additional doses. And these were given at week 10 and then every four weeks in small prospective study, 47 patients. So again, the higher the level, the better the chance that someone will do uh, in the future. That is persistence on drug. And then the ustekinumab data for the unity trials and Crohn's, again, a similar finding. Um, those people that had different quartiles, the quartile one is the lowest level, quartile four is greater than 7.1. You can see in the unity one and the unity two, 
The chance of having a patient in remission is higher. You can see 50% or more at high levels. And here you can see about a third or a quarter at high levels in the unity one. And again, this is the placebo rate. So clearly superior to placebo. A treat to target approach is superior to endoscopic and deep remission outcomes compared with symptom driven care. And this is a prospective trial called the, the COM trial. Um, this was led by Dr. jean frederick Colombel, published in the Lancet. Um, and it's a study that looked at conventional treatment uh, that is looking at the CDAI, prednisone use, and that's outlined at the top here, or those in the orange, treat the target. They escalated the dose based on the Crohn's disease activity index, the fecal calc protectin, the CRP, and prednisone use. And there's a standard management strategy that's outlined here, but the bottom line is the endpoint. Endoscopic remission, the CDEIS less or equal to four, and no deep ulcerations was achieved higher in the treat to target. 45.9 versus clinical management is 30.3. So clearly a benefit that is important, the endoscopic mucosal healing. In addition, we look at other endpoints directly. Crohn's disease activity index, where you have a deep remission, a biologic remission, mucosal healing, all were achieved. Mucosal healing in all segments was not. It was clearly a trend towards that with the treat to target doing better. It wasn't really powered adequately. And then complete endoscopic remission, again, suggested based on the active treatment arm with endoscopic response trending as well. So again, very important message, treat to target does better. Tight control with treat to target control and monitoring um, and this is data from Bujan again, you have active disease, you treat with a particular drug, you try to optimize that, um, and you have symptoms or surrogate markers you assess, and then three to six months later in that range, you want to check for mucosal helium, ileo ileocolonoscopy. It's not something that occurs rapidly. Your target is no symptoms, no positive surrogate markers, and no mucosal ulceration. If you achieve that, you continue the therapy and every year to two, you reassess. If you don't, then you go back and you make adjustments on the drug and you go through the cycle again. Or if you've achieved the highest drug level you can give, you say this is a failure. And what you do then is you switch to another class. And this is treat to target concept with tight control. It's a process. You have the diagnosis with the sign here, and you try type control all along the roadway, and you try to achieve the target as the destination. And that is the mucosal healing is the primary endpoint with subsequent benefits seen down line from all of these directly. So early disease, you want a complete absence of symptoms with no disease progression, no complications or disability, a normal quality of life, Whereas if you come later in the disease, disease I've referred to earlier on, but if you come later in the disease, you try to stabilize the non-inflammatory symptoms, no progression of the damage or disability, and you try to improve quality of life. You may not get as much benefit overall. There may be fibrosis and scarring and damage already. Now I've referred to disease activity, but what is disease severity? So activity is a cross-sectional assessment of biologic inflammatory impacts on symptoms, sign endoscopy, histology, and biomarkers. In other words, now, what's happening at this point in time? The severity is more, what's the prognosis? What does the future, what is the burden of the disease that will come about? So how's your patient today? How, you ask them, how are you doing today? Do you have any active symptoms? And the severity is, What's your prognosis? Do you have deep ulcers? Are you using steroids? Do you have CMV, C. diff? All these factors portend a worse prognosis. Now we're looking for predictors of biologics. Will they respond? And there's several here I'll highlight. Oncostatin M, published in Nature Medicine, showed this can predict infliximab response. Uh, Anti-IL-23 
you can look at serum IL-22 levels and that predicts response. Ashwin and Anthony Christian published that the microbiome can predict vetalizumab, uh, the benefit if it's going to respond or not. And there's a host of others. Mucosal gene signatures with golimumab was effective and a host of other things have been looked at directly. Etrolizumab. So this is a dual mechanistic agent in clinical trials, alpha epsilon and anti beta seven directly. And it's interesting that Severine Vermeer and her group showed that individuals that had uh, alpha epsilon levels checked in the mucosa, this predicted the response. So you have a predictor of the response of the individual patients, which is something we strive for to get a better understanding as to who will and won't respond to a particular medical therapy. We created this predicting colectomy tool directly. It's a retrospective study. Over a year, we looked at patients that had proctocolectomy for refractory ulcerative colitis uh, after 2008. Our controls had no surgery. And the clinical data we got from one to 12 months prior to the surgery for the cases and the controls, respectively. Two thirds of patients went on uh, and gave us a prediction model using multivariate logistic regression analysis. And one third was the validators of this model. And what we did was to find we could predict with a very good level the chance of going on for colectomy. The ROC was 0.937, and on the uh, model where we validated it, it was 0.92. So again, a rather good model. And if you look up that reference and you want, uh, there is an equation that you can plug the factors in, steroid use, serum albumin, um, and uh, Mayo scores uh, directly. And you can get a ballpark understanding if this is the case. Now, mind you, this is not yet validated in a prospective cohort, so use it with reservation until it's validated. So to summarize, our goals of treatment have evolved. We not only control symptoms, but we block the disease progression and the bowel damage and the disability. And that's an important component of what we do. So we're banking on our ability to change the course of disease from going straight into a wall to veer it away and get better. We have three pillars to optimize care, early therapy, treat to target, and tight control, not unique to IBD, seen in other disease states. The targets may evolve. We're personalizing care for patients based on the disease trajectory and their future course. We still need prospective evaluations to validate these concepts. So if we look at a proposed cycle of IBD management focusing on mucosal healing, what we do is as follows. We assess the baseline of the disease activity by endoscopy paired with a surrogate marker, first of all. So there might be a CRP, fecal calprotectin, or both. We choose the initial therapy based on the severity and the prognosis of the patient. Uh, and then three to six months later, we reassess that. What's the activity of the disease? And what's going on with the surrogate marker? Uh, so it might be either or. Um, if the bowel is suggested to be healed, <clears throat> then we go one way. If it's not, we go another. If it's healed, we then follow that patient up six to 12 months and just reassess to ensure that they remain in that state of well being. If they're not, we then discuss the treatment options with the patient. So it's again, very important to talk and communicate with the patient as to what's appropriate. If they're willing to proceed with the recommendation, then we adjust the therapy. And then we might go back three to six months later if they achieve that target after we look at such. If they don't, then clinical follow-up is appropriate. Again, it's a patient's discretion to say yes or no to a proposed therapy the pluses, the minuses. In other words, the risks and the benefits should be discussed. And these are things that they should not make decisions in a vacuum. If there's no other treatment options left, then it's clinical follow-up and follow the patient. We try to give them the best therapy for the best outcome. So to conclude, we establish targets and establishing these for both subjective and objective remission 
is a key to optimize care. In other words, we have predefined goals of therapy. We try to phenotype patient before we initiate therapy and early intervention in high risk patients is appropriate. Once we initiate the therapy, we assess the patient's disease activity, the level of inflammation, either with a scope with biomarkers or both, and then objective clinical and biologic outcome measures should be looked at. We subsequently adjust the treatments. We have predefined therapeutic consequences and targets that we look at, and we reevaluate with consequent adaptation of the treatment when goals are not yet achieved. We can both escalate and de-escalate therapy when appropriate, and therapeutic drug monitoring looking at drug levels can be used as a guidance to reach these targets. Thank you for participating. much, Gary. I'm sure there's a lot there to, to munch on. If you have some questions, please fill out the question cards and we'll deal with them uh, at the uh, panel discussion at the end. Uh, for those of you online, please uh, address your questions to the uh, question section. Okay, well, we move from uh, one end of Pennsylvania, about 300 miles west to Pittsburgh, and we'll next hear from Dr. David Binion. Uh, his topic is managing postoperative Crohn's disease, yet another uh, difficult issue for most of us. Good afternoon. I am Dr. David Binion from the University of Pittsburgh and UPMC Presbyterian Hospital, and I'd like to thank the organizers of the Gala Symposium for the opportunity to give this presentation on, I think, a really important area in the management of our patients with Crohn's disease, which is really the interplay of surgery and medical management. We're gonna focus on managing post-operative Crohn's disease in this uh, section of our symposium. I do have some disclosures which are listed here. So the overview of this presentation is gonna focus on a series of issues with Crohn's disease. We're gonna to touch on the natural history of Crohn's disease and how important surgical intervention is. And this really speaks to the um, severity of our patients with Crohn's. I think we all are pretty comfortable with the idea that Crohn's is not a one size fit all disease. We have individuals with mild, medium strength or moderate disease, and unfortunately some individuals with more severe disease who do face multiple surgical procedures. And that's gonna be the cohort we think about during this presentation. Um, we're gonna talk about how Crohn's disease recurs after surgery and how we can best assess this. And we're gonna talk about who are the individuals who are perhaps most at risk of having significant recurrence and facing repeat operations in their lifetime. We're gonna talk about new advances and new insights that have come forward in how we might be able to prevent Crohn's disease recurrence after surgery and how in some regards, this may be our best opportunity to effectively use our medical therapies. We're going to talk about, uh, we're specifically going to focus on some of our traditional approaches with antibiotics, azathioprine, and newer insights when it comes to biologic postoperative prevention. And then we're going to wrap up this uh, uh, section of the conference by talking about postoperative symptoms that may not be related to inflammation. And we're going to share some new insights regarding the types of surgeries and how, is, how this might impact the functional status of our patients. We're going to put a, a little bit of emphasis on something that I think doesn't get enough attention, which is treating bile acid diarrhea, bile malabsorption in our patients in the postoperative time period. So we're going to start at the beginning of the Crohn's disease saga back nine decades ago in 1932. The original paper describing Crohn's disease was a cohort of 14 individuals who had just had surgery and the surgical tissue had granulomas, but no mycobacterium. And what we see here on these two Frank Netter um, uh, uh, illustrations are really the natural history of how Crohn's disease will progress in fibrose. And what we're looking at here is the end stage fibrotic complication of Crohn's. What was seen in that original description back in 1932, where the lumen of the small bowel has been obliterated. And now unfortunately fistulizing complications have occurred into adjacent loops of bowel and the bladder. And in the past era, um, the goal of surgery was to relieve obstruction. Um, patients who are suffering this level of complication 
are basically at, in, a, in a very desperate situation. They have essentially a, an intermittent partial small bowel obstruction occurring regularly, and the body's trying to solve this by fistulizing. Back in past era, we didn't have the medical options that we have today, and steroids were our most um, important medical tool, but they come with a high price tag. So surgery was to, the goals were to relieve obstruction, to discontinue our best agent back at that time, steroids, and fibrotic disease is really too late. It's not gonna be responsive to medical therapy. We do have new insights when we think about Crohn's disease at the present era. And this illustration really highlights the idea that Crohn's begins as an inflammatory process. And over the course of time, that time might be faster in some individuals, slower in others. There's a progression to fibrosis and the luminal damage that we're seeing above. So if we think about <clears throat> new concepts in the management of Crohn's, we're gonna use immunomodulators and biologics to control Crohn's disease inflammation. And early inflammatory disease is definitely the most responsive to medical therapy. However, we don't have the luxury of reversing time in our patients. So in some regards, surgery gives us an opportunity to have a second chance. It gives us a second chance to treat early disease because we know exactly when Crohn's is gonna recur on the day of that operation and when people start to eat again in the post-operative time period. And we've come to realize that post-operative Crohn's disease is extremely responsive to medical therapy. So again, if we think about the natural history of Crohn's disease, the vast majority of patients face an operation in their lifetime. And here's some older data from North America and Europe suggesting up to 80% of Crohn's patients um, would face a surgical intervention. And we know which patients are going to have the highest risk for surgery. It's people with small bowel disease and particularly ileocolonic disease. And on this barium study on the right, we see the classic um, strength sign where there has been obliteration of the lumen. And this is a person who has few options less left if they're experiencing obstructive symptoms. Again, when we think about the natural history of Crohn's disease, there's some excellent data that comes, from us, comes to us from our colleagues in Copenhagen County, Denmark, from Pia Mulcombs group. And this uh, represents a population-based cohort of Crohn's patients who've been followed from the time of diagnosis we're going to focus on the 15 year time period. And what we see here is about a third of the patients have not needed an operation at 15 years following their diagnosis. Approximately a third of the patients have had one surgery and approximately a third of the patients have gone on to have multiple operations. So I would argue this is essentially mild, medium strength and more severe disease. And I think that we would all agree that the goal is to identify the third of patients who face um, multiple surgeries in their lifetime. And these are the, the patients who will have the biggest benefit from post-operative uh, chemo prevention strategies. So if we can identify the half of patients after surgery who are going to need more aggressive medical str strategies, implement those strategies quickly and effectively, we're going to hopefully have an impact on this natural history. And the unfortunate reality is about a fifth of the Crohn's patients have three or more surgeries, the sickest of the sick. When we think about some of these incredibly sick patients, we did a study a number of years ago looking at what we called rapid abdominal reoperation for Crohn's disease. Um, surgery is the fastest way to induce remission in a Crohn's disease patient, and we fully expect that patient to stay in remission for some time. But in our tertiary referral cohort, we found that 7% of our Crohn's patients required a repeat operation within two years of a prior surgery. And when we started to dive into what were the clinical factors associated with rapid abdominal reoperation, we found that two-thirds of these patients were not on medical therapy. This might have been the result of limited options when we did this study a few years ago. And I think the other driving factor was the fact that some of the uh, gastroenterologists were waiting for those patients to complain. They were waiting for them to give uh, a clinical um, evidence of getting worse with their Crohn's activity. And two thirds of these individuals were not on immunosuppressive or biologic therapy after surgery. And I would say that maintenance medical therapy is mandatory for this type of a severe Crohn's disease cohort. Anyone who tells you they've had surgery within two years of an operation is someone who has earned the right to be on our, some of our best medical options. And we, what we'd like to do is prevent what we're seeing in this barium study, which is short bowel, and a person who's developing a stricture at that ileocolonic anastomosis. So how quickly does Crohn's disease recur after resection and reanastomosis? 
So this is really the key question. How do you define Crohn's recurrence? So it turns out that we have a number of ways to do this. Histology, um, looking at biopsies from endoscopic data is gonna be our most sensitive strategy. Endoscopy is very good. It's a very excellent strategy to do things. But if we wait for our patients to complain about Crohn's disease recurrence, that's actually our least sensitive uh, strategy. And that might have been what got some of our rapid abdominal reoperation patients into deep trouble. This is a uh, study that was done uh, by Gertans uh, over two decades ago, which is one of the most insightful studies that we've ever had regarding the idiopathogenesis of Crohn's and how it comes back after surgery. And what Dr. Dons did in this study was basically explore how luminal contents, basically when we're eating, we actually will support the growth of bacteria in our GI tract, there is breakdown of food, there's um, bile coming through the GI tract. And in a cohort of patients who had a diverting ostomy above an anastomosis, he basically took some of the luminal content from the ostomy, infused it into the downstream limb of the um, uh, double-barreled loop biliostomy and was able to do endoscopy on that segment. And he found that the remission after surgery would show evidence of recurrence histologically within one week of reinfusion of luminal contents. So this was an incredibly insightful um, observation that the luminal contents, the bacteria, the microbiome, the gestate is going to be driving inflammation in our Crohn's patients. So when we think about the natural history of Crohn's disease, histologic evidence of recurrence can be as fast as a week. Endoscopic evidence of recurrence can be seen in over 70% of our patients, typically by a year. But when we wait for more advanced uh, evidence with either radiologic clinical studies, it may be too late. And that's gonna lead to surgical recurrence in many of our individuals. So can we predict the postoperative course of Crohn's disease? I would argue yes. And I would say that histology, simply reading the um, pathologic information from the surgical specimen gives us an incredible opportunity to stratify our patients in terms of who will be at higher risk to have more aggressive recurrence in the postoperative time period. We did this study where we looked at um, over 1,400 patients with Crohn's uh, to see who had granulomas the hallmark feature we talked about in the very beginning that was identified in the Crohn's patients uh, back at Mount Sinai Hospital in 1932. And we found that endoscopic evidence of granulomas occurred in about 13% of our patients. When, when we looked at surgery, it was about 21% of our Crohn's patients who had surgery had granulomas on their surgical resection material. And those individuals with granulomas had a more aggressive disease course in the years that followed surgery. What we have here is the Lamont index, which is a new way to stratify damage in our patients. And we're seeing that individuals with granulomas had worsening of disease over a five-year time period. But when we look specifically at the post-operative time period in a cohort of 600 Crohn's disease patients, 20%, 21% of whom had granulomas, we found that at a six-year post-operative time period, half of those individuals, 50% of people with granulomas, had to have repeat surgery, which was double the rate that was seen in patients with Crohn's who had surgery with no granuloma seen on the histology. So simply reading the pathology report after surgery gives us an important insight in terms of who will be higher risk to develop this um, more aggressive recurrence. One of our more standard approaches um, to looking at postoperative recurrence uses endoscopy. And this is the Rutgert score that you've oftentimes heard about in the past several years. So Paul Rutgert, who unfortunately passed away uh, this, the, just this last month, was one of the giants in inflammatory bowel disease investigation. And he published this study three decades ago from his group in Leuven, Belgium where they basically followed patients postoperatively. And this was an era where there was no standard uh, strategies for medical prevention. And they came up with an endoscopic scoring system, the Rutgert score, that would then allow us to stratify our patients going forward. And basically when patients either had a normal neoterminal ileum or small aptus ulcers that were just rare, an isolated ulcer, maybe two ulcers in the endoscopic assessment of the neoti one year after surgery, those individuals had an incredibly benign clinical course moving forward. If an individual had more uh, aptus ulcers, this is five or more ulcers identified in the neoti. This is a Rutgers I2 score. 
um, this individual had approximately a 40% chance of clinical recurrence by six years. If there were bigger ulcers one year after the surgery, stellate ulcers, there was going to be a much more rapid progression. So at the six-year time period, 80% of those individuals would have had clinical recurrence. And then the most impressive uh, score, the Rutgers I-4 score, um, many of those individuals didn't even make it to the full year. And this was a very rapid ulceration identified at the NEO-TI. So if we assess our patients at that one-year time period, it gives us important prognostic information about where they're headed into the years going forward. So the Rutgers score um, demonstrates recurrence at the NEO-TI. It's not only an endoscopic score, but it's a predictor for future complications, and it predicts the severity of that patient moving forward. So how does Crohn's disease medication therapy influence endoscopic recurrence following surgery? So when we, uh, my colleague, Dr. Miguel Reguero from the Cleveland Clinic now, but when we worked together at the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center, actually explored this with this Poise meta analysis that we're looking at here. So when we think about post-operative prevention, endoscopic uh, recurrence is more sensitive than clinical recurrence. Um, and when we think about the impact of drug therapy, we can compare it against placebo. So endoscopic recurrence, the majority of patients are going to have endoscopic recurrence at the one-year time period if they're not on medical therapy. Clinical recurrence lags behind. If we think about the impact of drug therapy, the 5-ASA and uh, budesonide strategies are not particularly different from placebo, but we do start to see a difference when we think about the use of immunomodulators with purine analogs. So there is a uh, separation. And this was explored in a clinical trial um, that was published in Gastroenterology over a decade ago, where we do see a separation in postoperative patients who've been treated with initially antibiotic therapy and then azathioprine at the one-year time period. And there's a delta of about 25% in the azathioprine-treated group, where a majority of patients are in remission postoperatively, while placebo, placebo patients, the vast majority have had recurrence endoscopically. <clears throat> So if we think about biologic agents, specifically the anti-TNF agents and their impact on endoscopic recurrence rates in our Crohn's disease patients, we do have some pretty interesting and intriguing data that has emerged again over this past decade. Again, my colleague, Dr. Aguero, um, did this study a number of years ago, a pilot study that looked at infliximab randomization postoperatively in a cohort of patients with Crohn's disease following ileocecal resection. And at the one year time point, he found that endoscopic evidence of remission was clearly more prevalent in the patients who were on infliximab, who were randomized to infliximab infusions compared to those who were on placebo. If we look at the raw data here, we see that having either a normal or minimal inflammation recurrence at the one-year time period was clearly associated with infliximab, while patients who were randomized to placebo had significantly more aggressive um, endoscopic assessment. Um, <clears throat> when we think about the patterns of recurrence, clinical uh, recurrence, again, is not as reliable. So clinical remission was seen in both the placebo and the infliximab group. So again, we're seeing the separation of objective data from endoscopy and subjective data when we wait for our patients to complain. So when we think about the observational experience with the use of anti-TNFs in the post-operative time period, we have a pretty clear signal that up to 10% of the patients on an anti-TNF may experience recurrence, and it's significantly higher in patients who have either been on placebo agents, 5-ASA agents. Again, it might be 40% of our patients receiving a purine analog prophylaxis. And these, uh, the weight of evidence that was amassing from these observational studies ultimately led to a registry trial for infliximab in the post-operative time period. Now, the PREVENT trial um, was in some regards disappointing because clinical separation at the 18-month and two-year time period did not occur. And what we're seeing here on the left side of the slide is not a clear separation between the two groups. And the trial was stopped prematurely because it didn't meet its um, efficacy mark in the, in the preliminary analysis. But when we think about the endoscopic assessment of our patients, again, there was a clear separation between those individuals receiving the anti-TNF and those who were receiving placebo. So objective data clearly shows a difference uh, between patients on biologic therapy postoperatively and those patients who are on placebo. 
And this really begs the question, what are the additional factors that are driving symptoms in our post-operative patients? Um, if we don't see symptoms directly related to inflammation, are there factors perhaps related to the surgery itself or some of the altered physiology? So we're gonna explore that in this section, the post-operative Crohn's patient symptoms related to surgically altered in physiology and not just inflammation. So the majority of our Crohn's patients require surgery. Ileocecal resection is definitely the most common procedure, and there are a variety of strategies that surgeons can use to reconstruct the bowel. But when I go to the endoscopy lab, I have one choice when I'm gonna be writing up my uh, procedure notes in my post-operative patients, um, and this is the one diagram that's available from the Privation software. So I'd ask the question, is this the operation that your patient's actually receiving? What we see in this diagram is an end-to-end, -end, probably hand-sewn anastomosis, but there are a variety of strategies that can be used by surgeons to rebuild the bowel. So it's important to be able to identify these endoscopically and understand how this could be playing an impact on our patient's management going forward after surgery. So we have three of the more common anastomoses shown here. Left is the end-to-end -end, uh, hand-sewn anastomosis. Technically, it's a little bit more challenging to do this, because the surgeon has to make a smaller tube, the ileum, fit onto a larger tube, the colon, and oftentimes involves spatulation, kind of angling the anastomosis a little bit so the two lumens are about the same size. It takes about 20 to 30 minutes for a surgeon to typically build this type of an anastomosis. In the middle of the diagram, we have an end to side anastomosis. Again, it's a surgically stapled anastomosis. Um, again, the, this is a more common anastomosis in the United States. And then on the right side of the slide is the stapled side-to-side -side antiperistaltic anastomosis, which is perhaps the most common anastomosis done in the U.S. at the present time. Um, again, we'll talk a little bit more about the implications of these in a second, but being able to identify endoscopically when we're working with our patients is an important uh, consideration. So the side-to-side -side anastomosis, which was <clears throat> done in over half of the patients in the PREVENT trial, reconstructs the longitudinal segments of ileum and ascending colon. And it's a fairly rapid solution for two different lumens of bowel. What we have here in this nice diagram really illustrates this. But endoscopically, what we're going to see is the ascending colon on the top, and that's the blind end that we're seeing here on the diagram. We're seeing this blind end of uh, terminal ileum here on the bottom. And the proximal intestine is actually here behind you. So the endoscope has to make an umbrella hook to actually get into the more proximal bowel. If we were to do the uh, colonoscopy under fluoroscopic guidance, you would actually see this umbrella hook in the colonoscope in order to intubate the proximal intestine. And we can contrast this an anatomic reconstruction with the end-to-end -end anastomosis, which is again, putting the bowel back together as a simple tube and endoscopically will come across the colon into the neoterminal ileum. This is definitely the easiest uh, anastomosis in terms of gastroenterology, uh, being able to survey the uh, postoperative anatomy as opposed to the uh, anastomosis where we have to make that umbrella hook to get into the neo-TI. So the compression stapled anastomosis, the side-to-side -side stapled anastomosis, was actually developed by trauma surgeons in the Soviet Union back in the 1950s. Here's a GIA green load linear stapling device. Basically, it has two cutting blades and uh, two uh, titanium rows of staples will be rapidly deployed, takes seconds to essentially put things together. And the advantage is in the context of trauma surgery, speed. You know, we have an hour to save the life of someone who perhaps was going through blunt abdominal trauma, penetrating trauma. And when we think about mass units and trauma surgery, this type of an anastomosis is an incredible advantage. We can put a big tube and a small tube next to each other, side to side, deploy the stapler. And then we can uh, close that anastomosis with a perpendicular staple line. These devices were brought to the United States back in 1957 by Dr. Mark Ravitch when he had permission to travel to the Soviet Union. He actually smuggled out one of these devices and then was able to um, uh, take this technology and develop uh, surgical stapling devices here in the United States. Um, and this became the, uh, really the genesis of stapled anastomoses in America. So we had some concerns about the long-term appearance of the side-to-side -side anastomosis because it does transect circular muscle layers and it has an anti-peristaltic orientation. 
And we were wondering if this might have impacts on postoperative physiology. We were concerned that bowel dilatation at the surgical anastomosis highlighted here on this coronal reformat, we can see the metal on the CT scan that highlights this area of fecalization in the intestine. And then there can be distension at the anastomosis and nociceptors in the bowel can feel distension as pain. And this wide open connection that is happening, that's actually acting as a reservoir can contribute to small bowel bacterial overgrowth. And we, had, we were concerned that this might be disrupting intestinal function over time. So we explored this with a clinical study at our institution that was published two years ago in the American Journal of Gastroenterology, where we basically looked at our Crohn's patients undergoing their first or second surgery for uh, Crohn's disease at the ileocecal area. And we wanted to look at the two-year Crohn's disease-related health care utilization, which would include emergency department visits, hospitalization, surgery. We wanted to look at the quality of life of our patients over time. And the secondary outcomes were going to be endoscopic recurrence, the objective markers of inflammation with CRP, and the disease activity index. And what we found at that two-year time period was that there was a significant difference between the patients who had the end-to-end -end anastomosis, 68 of our individuals in this uh, again, pragmatic study, prospective pragmatic study versus the 60 patients who had side-to-side -side anastomosis. So there was essentially a doubling of ER visits, 15% versus 33% at the two-year time period. 12% of our patients with an end-to-end -end were hospitalized in that post-operative time period compared with 30% of our side-to-side -side patients. And when we think about some of our diagnostic strategies, um, CT scans were required in just over 13% of our patients with the end-to-end -end anastomosis versus 50% of our patients with the side-to-side. -side. And I would argue that CT scans of the abdomen and pelvis in a Crohn's patient are usually done to assess abdominal pain and abdominal symptoms. When we look at quality of life scores at that two-year time period, we use the SIBDQ, a published version that goes from a lowest score of 10 to a perfect score of 70. And when the mean score is above 50, that patient is typically doing well. When the mean score is below 50, that actually is a fairly good marker of a person who's having challenges on a regular basis. So the SABDQ, the quality of life score was significantly higher and better in our patients with end-to-end -end surgery compared to those with the side-to-side. -side. The objective markers of inflammation, um, either endoscopic assessment or the disease activity or C-reactive protein scores were not significantly different. When we did a multivariate logistic regression, we actually found that there was a tripling of a risk for being hospitalized in the patients with the side-to-side -side anastomosis compared to those with the end-to-end. -end. And interestingly, when patients were assessed for post-operative prophylaxis, those individuals who were going on to biologic therapy, it did not make a significant difference in this observational study. Um, I would suspect that this may have been a contributing reason in the uh, difficulties experienced in the PREVENT trial, where we did not control for the surgical anastomosis. And what we suspect might have happened is that the clinical status of patients with the side-to-side -side anastomosis was perhaps outweighing the uh, clinical readout from inflammation recurrence. When we looked at healthcare economic issues in our patients with end-to-end -end versus side-to-side -side anastomosis, we found that the side-to-side -side, uh, antiperistaltic anastomosis was over twice as expensive regarding healthcare charges per patient in the two years following the surgery. So I would, uh, again, want to highlight the concept of bile acid diarrhea, bile acid malabsorption, which is something that definitely will occur in patients who experience a terminal ileal resection. It's a very common complication of surgery. And we have a number of agents that can be employed at this time to help with bile acid malabsorption. We have the uh, older compound cholestyramine powder and then the pill formulations of cholestopol and cholecevalan. When we looked at our UPMC IBD registry, which tracks over 4,000 IBD patients over the past decade, we found that patients who had had a TI resection who were not receiving a bile acid sequestrant were significantly higher to have higher risk for having abdominal pain and requiring narcotics in a four-year time period. And when we looked at the use of bile acid sequestrants in our cohort of patients 
who had had ileocecal resection, we found that the side-to-side -side anastomosis patients had a harder time tolerating and benefiting from bile acid sequestrant therapy, where it was a little over 50% were able to uh, use these agents with benefit over time compared to over 75% uh, of our patients with the end-to-end -end anastomosis. So I would argue that when we think about surgical anastomosis, we can perhaps better treat the complication of bile acid malabsorption in patients who would have the end-to-end -end surgery reconstruction versus the side-to-side -side surgery. So the AGA has issued guideline statements on strategies for managing our patients in the post-operative time period. And the AGA's guideline document that was again published three years ago suggests that there is good rationale to use um, pharmacologic prophylaxis in our patients with Crohn's disease. And this was a conditional recommendation. Um, it suggested the choice of agents should emphasize either immunomodulators with purine analogs or anti-TNF therapy based on the existing data. Um, for patients who are not going to have uh, post-operative therapy, it encouraged the use of endoscopic surveillance, the use of an objective assessment of our patients um, to again guide therapy and not waiting for clinical symptom recurrence, which is perhaps less uh, reflective of the inflammation at the neoterminal ileum. So to summarize, um, in the management of postoperative Crohn's disease, surgery is needed in the majority of our Crohn's patients at some point in their lifetime. Postoperative Crohn's disease may represent the ideal time to initiate medical treatment to prevent recurrence of severe disease. We're treating the earliest disease that we have been able to identify, which recurs which recurs within weeks of the patient resuming a diet and the microbiome being reestablished in the gut. Some of the higher risk patients will have granulomas on surgical histology and evidence of early endoscopic recurrence at the anastomosis using the Rutgert scoring system, which we highlighted previously. Starting treatment two to four weeks postoperatively in high risk individuals who have had prior, multiple prior surgeries, perhaps downstream evidence of inflammation that will definitely be active in the postoperative time period in individuals with granulomas um, is definitely a high consideration. And for those individuals where we would prefer to use a watchful waiting approach, we can definitely use endoscopic assessment um, in the postoperative time period to guide management. I would say that postoperative symptoms can be related to the surgically altered anatomy in our patients who have had surgery and uh, reconstruction. And the side-to-side -side anastomosis patients are predisposed to develop functional symptoms due to perhaps the antiperistaltic reconstruction, the transection of the circular muscle layers, um, sort of the reservoir forming uh, anastomosis, which can stretch and in some individuals lead to pain issues compared to individuals who have the end-to-end -end surgical anastomosis where the intestine is more or less reconstructed as a tube. And then lastly, bile acid di diarrhea and bile acid malabsorption is an easily treated complication using bile acid sequestrants. And the three agents that I've outlined here, cholestyramine powder, cholestopol, and colocevalam, um, can function in our, in our patients very effectively. And perhaps ideal dosing is going to be in the morning prior to breakfast. Thank you so much for your attention. Well, thanks, David. And uh, we'll now uh, go to another battleground state, uh, Florida, and uh, hear from Dr. Frank Ferre about healthcare maintenance and IBD. Frank is at the Mayo Clinic uh, Jacksonville. Frank? Good afternoon. My name is Dr. Francis A. Ferre, and I'm a professor of medicine in the Department of Gastroenterology and Hepatology and director of the Mayo Clinic Inflammatory Bowel Disease Center in Jacksonville, Florida. This afternoon, we'll be discussing health maintenance issues for the patient with IBD. These are my disclosures. <clears throat> the objectives of this lecture are to appreciate the increased risk of infections in patients with inflammatory bowel disease. We'll review the necessary vaccination for our patients and also review non-vaccine ACG preventive care clinical recommendations for patients with IBD. Now, health maintenance in the patient with IBD is important. Patients with IBD do not receive preventive services at the same rate as general medical patients. The gastroenterologist, nurse practitioner, physician assistant in the practice are often the only clinician that the patient with IBD will see for their health issues. So clarify the limits of your responsibility with the patient 
and delegate routine healthcare issues to the primary care physician or clinician. However, we should offer guidance on the unique health maintenance needs in patients with IBD, especially those on immunomodulators and biologic agents. I would argue that certain health maintenance tasks such as vaccinations be the responsibility of us as the treating gastroenterology team. Now, why are the initial visits with a patient with IBD so important? Well, as many as 70% of our patients with IBD will require immunosuppressive therapy at some time in their course. When they're immunosuppressed, they're at increased risk for certain preventable vaccine-related diseases. So when we're seeing our patients, whether it's the first visit or the 10th visit, we should realize that it's important to keep up their vaccination status. Let's look at certain specific infections. For example, in this study of 108,000 patients with ulcerative colitis, patients with inflammatory bowel disease had an increased risk of developing pneumonia. And you can see this on the graph below, or if we specifically look at odds ratios, patients on biologics have a 1.32 increased risk, those on thiopurines 1.13. And as we know from multiple studies, corticosteroids in particular increase the risk of pneumonia. Now let's look at herpes zoster, the same administrative database. A much larger number of patients are at risk for developing herpes zoster in comparison to pneumonia. And again, biologics, thiopurines, and corticosteroids all increase the risk of developing zoster. And the combination of anti-TNFs and thiopurines, the odds ratio for developing zoster are significantly elevated at 3.29. So the ideal time to obtain a vaccine history is during the initial office visit or visits. And then if you're seeing a patient once a year, that would be another opportunity to make sure they're up to date on their vaccinations and health maintenance issues. Now in the best of all worlds, our patients should be vaccinated prior to starting immunosuppressive therapy. If vaccinations are not offered in your practice, write a prescription for your patient just to take to their local pharmacy where they can receive for the most part, all the vaccines we're interested in. And if you do have a sick patient, however, that's not up to date with their vaccinations, necessary IV therapy should never be delayed in order to administer vaccines. So now let's review vaccinating the IBD patient. <clears throat> this comes from the ACG guideline that was published in February of 2017. Myself, Gil Melmud, Gary Lichtenstein, and Susie Kane did it a literature review and came up with a series of recommendations. Another useful resource for you comes from the Annals of Internal Medicine. It's published in February of each year, and it's the updated ACIP immunization schedule. And we'll be looking at recommendations from the ACG as well as recommendations from the ACIP in this lecture. Now, IBD is rare for the most part before the age of five. So most of the patients we're seeing as young adults have had all their childhood vaccinations. So we need, as adult gastroenterologists, to consider hepatitis A, hepatitis B, HPV vaccine, influenza, the pneumococcal vaccine series, herpes zoster, and varicella vaccinations in our practice. <clears throat> now, one of the questions that comes up is, will the vaccine work? And a big concern on behalf of patients Will the vaccine, which stimulates an immune response, obviously, worsen the IBD? So we do know there's a diminished immune response in patients on anti-TNFs alone, and in particular with those patients on anti-TNFs and immunomodulators. This does not appear to be the case with betalizumab for vaccines that are administered by injection. And the overwhelming evidence, again, I want to stress this, the overwhelming evidence is that vaccination does not exacerbate IBD, and we need to reinforce that with our patients. So this is a typical graph or table that comes from the ACIP Annals of Internal Medicine uh, article every February. And this looks at vaccines in yellow that are recommended for everyone. Then in purple, the ones that are recommended for people with specific risk factors. And I'm going to argue that inflammatory bowel disease is a risk factor for acquisition, for example, of pneumococcal pneumonia. And then there are a number of other ones that depend on age. For example, the shingles vaccine, Shingrix, is indicated for individuals above the age of 50. 
We'll be spending a little bit more time looking at this table when we talk about the immunosuppressed patients. Again, if your patient is not immunosuppressed, they can receive both live vaccines and inactive vaccines. Now, I wanna bring you up to date on a new hepatitis B vaccine. Uh, this is called Heplisave B. This was approved in November, 2017. And unlike the standard hepatitis B vaccine, which as you know, is given at zero time, one month and six months, this vaccine is given at zero and one month. And so you could obtain in, uh, immunity to hepatitis B in high-risk individuals at a much shorter period of time. It's a yeast-derived vaccine that has a novel adjuvant, and it's indicated for all patients over the age of 18. And if you looked at a comparative study of patients receiving the standard hepatitis B vaccine, Endurex B, compared to the new vaccine, Heplisave B, you can see that those individuals receiving Heplisave B after two doses 95.4% were protected versus only 81.3% of those individuals receiving the three-dose standard Endurex vaccine. If we look at potential immune-mediated adverse events, you can see these are the rates. Uh, no studies, however, have studied this new vaccine in immunosuppressed populations, including patients with IBD, and these studies need to be done. I think most of you know about the new inactive shingles vaccine called Shingrix. This is uh, indicated for the prevention of herpes zoster or shingles in adults age 50 and older. It's given as two doses uh, at zero time and then two to six months. Uh, look at the data. This is in non-IBD patients. These are average risk individuals. This study was looked at over 30,000 individuals who received the vaccine compared to those that received placebo. They were followed for up to 3.2 years, and the vaccine efficacy was remarkable at 97.2% in preventing shingles. Now, I'm going to let you know that this vaccine, because of the adjuvant, is associated with a fairly high rate of local adverse reactions, as pointed out here, as well as if you solicit patients 45% develop myalgia, 45% develop fatigue, another one in five develop fever. So these symptoms are short-lived over one to two days. Again, with a, with a vaccine that offers extraordinarily high protection, I just tell my patients to expect these. If they don't get it, that's fantastic. They can take Tylenol before they receive their vaccine. Now let's look at what the ACIP recommended now that this vaccine is available. They met in October, 2017, and these were the following recommendations. Recombinant zoster vaccine or Shingrix is recommended for the prevention of herpes zoster and related complications for immunocompetent adults aged greater than 50. It is recommended for the prevention of herpes zoster in those patients who previously received the live vaccine. So if your patient received Zostravax in the past, they should nonetheless receive the new vaccine because the protection from the live vaccine does wane after several years. At the time of this meeting in October, 2017, the ACIP recommended to use the new vaccine over the old live vaccine for the prevention of herpes zoster. This is no longer an issue because the live vaccine, Zostravax, is no longer available in the United States. So the only shingles vaccine that you have to offer is the new inactive shingles vaccine, Shingrix. So we've been talking about patients who are immunocompetent. Now let's look at the immunocompromised patient with inflammatory bowel disease. When discussing immunosuppression, you need to realize that there's two different levels of immunosuppression. Those individuals on low-dose methotrexate, low-dose azathioprine, the doses we use in our clinical practice, and also individuals on a short course of corticosteroids under 20 milligrams per day, that's considered low-level immunosuppression. High-level immunosuppression are those patients, for example, on anti-TNFs. Also remember that those individuals who are malnourished, who've lost a lot of weight, a lot of weight, have a low albumin, they are also considered immunosuppressed because of their uh, concomitant uh, protein calorie malnutrition. So I showed you an earlier uh, schematic of vaccination in all individuals. Let's now look at patients with IBD who are immunosuppressed. And if we do a drill down here, you can see 
this, this group here, immunocompromised excluding HIV infection, and there's a different color code here. And what basically you need to know is that the live intranasal flu vaccine is not recommended to those patients who are highly immunocompromised. Measles, mumps, and rubella is not recommended. This varicella, this is the varicella vaccine or the chickenpox vaccine, it's not recommended. The live zoster vaccine is no longer available, okay? So the bottom line is if you have someone who has a high level of immunosuppression, you should avoid the intranasal influenza vaccine, measles, mumps, and rubella, and the chickenpox vaccine. Now let's talk a little bit about the ACG non-vaccine uh, recommendations. So patients or women with inflammatory bowel disease who are on immunosuppressive therapy, in particular the thiopurines, should undergo annual cervical cancer screening. And that's because there's an increased risk of developing abnormal pap tests. And if you have an HPV infection and then add immunosuppression, that HPV infection can progress, lead to dysplasia. Patients with IBD, both ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease, should undergo screening for melanoma, and that's independent of the use of biologic therapy. We have learned a lot over the last 10 years, and we now know that the thiopurines significantly increase the risk of developing non-melanoma squamous cell type cancers, and therefore these individuals, particularly those over the age of 50, should see a dermatologist. For the most part, any of my patients, I send them to a dermatologist for a single visit. The dermatologist then can assess their risk for skin cancer based on previous sunburns, things of that nature, and they determine the frequency at which they should follow up for skin cancer screening. I think it's very important to identify depression and anxiety in your practice. Patients with depression and anxiety can be more difficult to manage. It's sometimes hard to discern the differences between functional bowel complaints, which may be overlaid with their IBD. And if you identify depression and anxiety, this is one area that I do not treat the patients. If I identify it, I can refer them to a psychologist or back to their primary care doctor or a psychiatrist for treatment of the depression and anxiety. And in your practice, there are a number of easy to use screening tools to identify depression and anxiety. Those individuals that have risk factors for abnormal bone mineral density, for example, postmenopausal women, any person who's been on steroids for more than three to six months, they should be screened for osteoporosis with bone mineral density testing. If you identify osteoporosis, I then refer to endocrinology. And patients with Crohn's disease, as well as those with ulcerative colitis, should be counseled to quit. Now, there are a number of different checklists that could help you manage your patients. This comes from the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation. The website is below on this slide, and it very nicely reviews the various vaccines, the, which patients should receive them, whether you should check a titer, for example, beforehand. You should check a titer for hepatitis B and only immunize those individuals who are hepatitis B not immune. And as I told you, the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation now have included the new hepatitis B vaccine as one of the two options for you in vaccinating your patients. It also reviews the things we went over, cervical pap smear, skin exam, and then obviously colonoscopy in at-risk individuals, DEXA, uh, screening for tuberculosis, assessing smoking status, and looking for depression. This is a similar type of um, a chart for you for individuals who take care of uh, pediatric patients from the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation. Also from the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation, you can keep this handout in your office and just leave it in the waiting area or give it to your patients. It reviews for patients the various vaccinations that they need to discuss with you. Another option for you is to download this from Cornerstones. This is another checklist that includes vaccine preventable illnesses, bone health, therapy related testing, cancer prevention, and then miscellaneous. So again, something very easy to have in your practice and quickly go over when seeing patients. No talk on inflammatory bowel disease and health maintenance can go without discussing the effect of COVID pandemic on vaccine rates in the United States. This comes from the Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report from May of this year, and it's very, very worrisome. 
This is when the national emergency was declared in the United States. And these are looking at vaccinations in pediatric patients under 24 months and between 24 and 18 years. And you can see this dramatic reduction in the number of children and pediatric individuals who receive vaccination. The World Health Organization said that immunization is an essential health service which may be affected by the current COVID pandemic, certainly was affected by the current COVID pandemic, and that if we disrupt immunization services, even for brief periods, you're going to have an increased number of susceptible individual and raise the likelihood of outbreak prone vaccine preventable diseases such as measles. And the CDC, American Academy of Pediatrics, American Academy of Family Physicians, have all each urged doctors to maintain vaccination schedules as rigorously as reasonably possible, particularly for the youngest children. So for example, Tuesdays and Thursdays could be vaccine days in the pediatric office where you don't see any sick kids, you just do vaccines. And then Monday, Wednesday, and Friday could be office hours where children with symptoms can come and be evaluated. Many of you have heard the term twindemic, Twindemic is a combination of a fall and winter influenza epidemic along with COVID infection. So we absolutely positively must encourage our patients with IBD and, and also ourselves as providers of healthcare in front of these patients to get our influenza vaccine. This is interesting. I thought you might like to see. This is a, something coming from the Florida Health Department. It was put out on October 2nd. And basically, these new regulations of dealing with COVID, uh, the State Department of Public Health said that pharmacists and registered pharmacy interns can administer childhood and COVID-19 vaccines now. Many of you know about Operation Warp Speed. It's a collaboration of several U.S. federal government departments, including Health and Human Services and the private sector. The goal is to produce and deliver 300 million doses of a safe and effective vaccine with the initial doses available by January 2021, hopefully perhaps even sooner. And this is a broader strategy to basically accelerate a process that takes years into something that hopefully could be accomplished in a month or 12 months. And as of now, there are four different COVID vaccine candidates in phase three clinical trials in the United States. If you're interested in looking at other information, other resources, these are two papers that I was fortunate enough to be involved with that were published in the American Journal of Gastroenterology, also in um, CGH, and their references on vaccinating the patient with inflammatory bowel disease and how you can manage this during the COVID pandemic. I'm going to leave you with a few take home points. Patients with IBD have poor immunization rates, so ask about their vaccination status. Certainly when you see them in the office early on before you start immunosuppressive therapy, but also when doing an every six or 12 month office visit. Take a quick look at the EMR, be sure they receive their pneumococcal vaccine, their flu vaccine if it's the appropriate time of the year. In the best of all worlds, we'll vaccinate prior to the initiation of immunosuppressive agents. Patients with IBD can mount a response to vaccines, although immunogenicity is diminished in those individuals on a combination of immunomodulators and anti-TNFs. Again, reassure your patient that IBD disease activity will not be affected by vaccination. I would argue again that we as clinicians who are prescribing these potent immunosuppressive agents, uh, steroids and the like, should take responsibility to vaccinate your patients with IBD or make explicit recommendations to the patient's PCP. Another thing you can do, by the way, is to write a simple prescription and send them to their local pharmacy. The pharmacies that, uh, stock, for the most part, all the vaccines we want to offer, and the patient can go off hours on weekends. They can, they can show up, they can bring the prescription, the pharmacist can run a claim and the patient will know that the insurance company has approved their claim for, um, to receive the vaccine. Refer women for pap testing, especially those on thiopurines. It's quite important that we screen for depression in our patients with IBD. You don't have to treat depression and anxiety, but if you identify it, you can refer them to a mental health provider or back to their primary care provider. Again, as I told you, I refer all my patients for a single 
skin exam with the dermatologist and the dermatologist and the patient determine the frequency of follow-up. This is more important for individuals above the age of 50 and certainly for those individuals on thiopurines. If a patient has a risk factor for osteoporosis, I do order a bone mineral density study. If it's abnormal, I then refer them to endocrinology or back to their primary care provider. Uh, counsel all your IBD patients to stop smoking and especially those with Crohn's disease and use checklist and EMR record enhancers in your practice to increase vaccination rates and to monitor completion of health maintenance tasks. I hope this talk was useful for you and I think you'll be able to take home several actionable items to your practice next week when you return to see patients. Thanks again for listening. Good afternoon, and I'd like to first thank you to the entire program coordinators, as well as the course directors for the invitation to participate in this program. I'm sorry I can't be there in person, but over the next 20 or 25 minutes, we will discuss managing fertility and pregnancy in inflammatory bowel disease. So here are my conflicts of interest and disclosures. Again, over the next 25 minutes, we have three primary objectives. First, we're going to discuss fertility and disease activity in inflammatory bowel disease. Then I'd like for us to review the safety of biologics during pregnancy and with breastfeeding. And then last, I'd like for us to understand how to monitor and manage a flare in inflammatory bowel disease during pregnancy. So first, let's take a step back and review the prevalence of women of childbearing age, which is typically between the ages of 20 to the 30s. As you can see here, this is also the peak age range of the epidemiology of inflammatory bowel disease, whether Crohn's or ulcerative colitis. So when we discuss fertility or what our patients, which is basically what our patients want to know, it is important to take into account several factors, primarily age. We also need to be able to differentiate fertility, which is defined as the ability to conceive, from fecundity, which refers to the likelihood of pregnancy, which also takes into account age, as well as ovarian reserve, which of course decreases with age. Also, it's important to remember that with or without inflammatory bowel disease, nearly 50% of our patients get pregnant and that pregnancy is actually unplanned. So a careful discussion and coordination with your patients is essential. Preconception counseling has proven to improve birth outcomes, such as associated with it, we found lower rates of fetal growth restriction if we in advance discuss and have that preconception counseling with our patients. We've also found better maternal outcomes related to mostly an improvement in the patient's underlying inflammatory bowel disease. What we know is that women tend to overestimate the harmful effects of their medications and are often unaware of the risk of having a flare related to their bowel disease and how it relates directly with their pregnancy. So it's essential to have these conversations and it's very important to have these conversations very early because again, as I highlighted, nearly 50% of pregnancies in the United States are unplanned. Also, this is a time to optimize the overall health of your patients by identifying risky behaviors, for example, such as tobacco smoking or substance abuse. It's important to start folic acid supplementation. Also important to optimize the care of other comorbid conditions, such as their underlying diabetes. Perhaps the conversation with your patient is that she is not considering or maybe she's not ready for pregnancy. And maybe that conversation is still important because this is the time to be able to explain the unplanned pregnancy risk and also to be able to discuss other concerns that she may have. For example, if she does, does not want family planning and she has active inflammation and you talk about that unplanned risk of pregnancy, you also need to understand what form of birth control she is on or using. Estrogen uh, birth control tablets, for example, may be at a higher risk for the patient with, because they're now susceptible for a higher risk of venothromboembolism, particularly, again, not only associated with their estrogen oral birth control tablets, but also associated with active inflammation. So again, all of this is 
really emphasizing the importance of preconception counseling with our patients. So when we discuss fertility with our patients, it's our duty to also address the fears and misconceptions. First, I remind my female patients that women with quiescent disease and with no prior surgery have a normal fertility rate as women without inflammatory bowel disease. In fact, the infertility rate is similar, about 7%. Next, we have to recall that there's this phenomenon called voluntary childlessness, and this is real. And this is described, for example, the fear of not wanting to pass on the disease to their child or potentially worsening their own disease with pregnancy, and thus they, the, the mother, the potential mother has decided to not become pregnant at any time, this voluntary childlessness or voluntarily opting out to not having a child. Again, these concerns should be addressed with our patients. Lastly, pelvic surgery may in increase the rate of infertility, and this is particularly relevant to our female patients with a J pouch. Again, the most important factor related to fertility is age. As you can see here on the graph, there's a significant drop in fertility, whether with IBD or not, above any patient who's above the age of 35. This also looks at before or after surgery for inflammatory bowel disease and specifically describes the open j pouch or IPAA operations that's performed. As you, can still, as you can see here, still, regardless of whether with or without a J pouch, the highest and the most important factor which influences fertility is age. So let's examine the impact of a J pouch by an open operation. We, we don't have enough data yet on laparoscopic, but by an open operation for an IPAA. As you can see, there is nearly a three-fold higher risk associated with infertility among women that have underwent an open j pouch operation. I will say there are increased efforts in performing these, these procedures laparoscopically, but again, we don't have enough data or literature on it, but the suggestion is that perhaps the impact on infertility is potentially, or I should say the impact on fertility is potentially lower, as the thought is that maybe there's a reduced risk of developing adhesions or pelvic scarring or scar tissue, which could potentially obstruct or scar the fallopian tubes and in turn impact fertility. But again, we don't have enough data on the true risk of infertility of open versus laparoscopic performed J pouches. But again, we, we think that perhaps this number will decrease, this number of risk for infertility will decrease as we develop a better understanding of the impact of laparoscopic J pouch formation. So when we discuss fertility, we also need to understand the impact of the underlying bowel disease. What we know is that active inflammation, active disease at the time of conception is perhaps the highest risk factor associated with the disease relapse and also associated with having a significant disease flare during pregnancy. Disease activity is also the strongest predictor of an adverse pregnancy outcome with higher risk, anywhere two to three fold increased risk of preterm birth and a lower birth weight. So the rule of thumb or the primary recommendation I give to all of my mothers is to maintain good disease control, maintain the disease in, in remission for at least three months prior to conception if possible. Here you can see the consequences of uncontrolled bowel disease. Specifically, there's a higher risk for miscarriage or stillbirth if the patient has active disease. And the risk for preterm birth and low birth weight increases if there's a flare of disease during pregnancy, as compared to if the mother was in disease remission during pregnancy. Now, our patients also want to understand what's the risk of congenital malformations. And in fact, that's probably also contributing to that voluntary childlessness I discussed earlier. We have more than enough studies which have concluded 
that inflammatory bowel disease alone does not increase the risk for congenital malformations. But certainly we've seen and identified particular medications that are associated with an increased risk for congenital malformations. Specifically, methotrexate, we know that that is a teratogenic or abortifactant. Thalidomide as well, but we don't really use this medication as often. With tofacitinib, I'll say that we have limited data available for the safety of tofacitinib. And thus, at this point, we say potentially there may be a risk for congenital malformations. But again, we don't have enough data and literature to understand this completely. All of our other medications, we know from more than enough data that there is no associated increased risk for congenital malformations associated with our other therapies. And this includes our corticosteroids, our thiopurines, as well as our biologics. Unfortunately, despite the studies and the data regarding the safety profile of our different medical therapies, as well as the impact and the importance of controlling disease activity and the influence it has on both birth and maternal incomes, we still found that healthcare professionals actually practice quite differently. So we conducted a large survey of about 250 physicians. This included 50 primary care physicians, 50 OB-GYN docs, 50 dermatologists, rheumatologists, and gastroenterologists. And what we found was that over half of the OB-GYN physicians, as well as the primary care physicians, are still advising their patients to discontinue TNF therapy before pregnancy. Our dermatologists and our rheumatologists are split in regarding this recommendation. And the lowest group making these recommendations for treatment cessation prior to pregnancy were the gastroenterologists. It's good, but it's still about 35% of these physicians recommended treatment cessation. And I still think this is unacceptable. We're, we're basically doing our, our patients a disservice if we are underestimating the impact of systemic inflammation to their pregnancy and both for, for, both, for both birth and maternal outcomes. So I would like to explain the potential risk for placental transfer of immunoglobulins or specifically our biologics to the baby. Now, as you know, there are four subclasses of immunoglobulins and IgG antibodies plays an important role in the protective immunity and are actively transferred from mother to child to confer both the short-term passive immunity as well as the long-term. Now, the active transport of IgG antibodies is mediated by the fragment FC domain, which is on the placenta. It's the FC receptor that helps transfer the antibody, the biologic, from mother to the fetus across this placenta, except for sertolizumab or Simsia, which does not have the FC receptor. Now, there, there's a highly efficient transfer of IgG1 antibodies during mostly the third trimester by this placental transfer. And as you can see here demonstrated on the graph, the IgG is transferred via the placenta and it persists longer in the baby or the newborn than the mother with elevated levels of the drug seen in baby compared to the mother. This is why previously the recommendation or the practice was to stop biologics before or during pregnancy, given this concern for placental transfer. Now, before we re review the placental transfer, let's take a look back at basic embryology. So as you can see here, and as you know, there's the three different trimesters of pregnancy. There's that concern that, that I discussed earlier where the risk or, or concern or fear of congenital malformations associated with our therapies that our mothers and, and parents may have. And therefore, either by patient preference or even the physician prefer, preference or recommendation, they're advised to stop their therapy once they're pregnant. But as you can see here, the risk for placental transfer of the immunoglobulin antibodies or the biologics is incredibly low during the first trimester. Also, this is when organogenesis happens or embryogenesis. So the influence of the biologics to the embryogenesis or the organ de development in the first trimester 
is really not possible. So certainly now during the second trimester, as you can see, there's very low levels transferred. Now, this is the period when treatments, procedures that may be indicated during the, the second trimester, if the mother is experiencing a disease flare or anything else, this is that, that period, that second trimester when endoscopic procedures, imaging, or even surgery can be done is perhaps the safest window during pregnancy. Now, when we look at the third trimester, again, this is when the majority of the immunoglobulins is acquired by the fetus, and mostly during the last four weeks of pregnancy. So recognizing that the third trimester is the period with the highest levels of immunoglobulin and the highest period of placental transfer, the recommendation is to not stop the biologics or the medications, but rather delay or, or time the next dose due until after delivery when it comes to infliximab. So from here, you can see from the graph that the core blood levels of infliximab as well as adalimumab are described. And what this suggests is that, again, knowing that the placental transfer is at the highest level during the third trimester, why don't we just kind of delay that next infusion when after the mother delivers and then give them that dose? Now for adalimumab, we don't necessarily need to do that because as you can see, the core blood levels of adalimumab only increases towards the very, very end of pregnancy. Again, suggesting that we just need to be careful with the timing or the dose of that next subcutaneous injection. So here's a summary of core blood levels with our TNFs, as well as uh, with betalizumab and ustekinumab. Based from the piano, based off of the piano registry of 143 patients, regardless uh, of the detectable core blood levels, there were no higher risk for infections associated with the biologic exposures. And in fact, the infants exposed to biologics seem to achieve higher developmental milestones. Now, this basically suggests and really emphasizes the importance of controlling systemic inflammation, as we discussed, and really emphasizing this is very important throughout all three trimesters. From this study, you can see that betalizumab actually had higher levels in the mother than the baby, and again, the opposite is associated with infliximab, where there were higher levels in the baby than the mother. So how do we put this all together? Again, we do not recommend stopping any of the biologics listed, but rather timing the doses between the time of delivery and the administration of the subcutaneous or the infusion 48 to 72 hours after delivery if there's no other complications. Also, I recommend using a prepartum weight for the infliximab dosing throughout their pregnancy, as opposed to trying to adjust the dose of the mother's infliximab infusions during her pregnancy. Again, we still have more limited data on betalizumab or ustekinumab, but again, we have enough data to tell us that it's safe to continue throughout pregnancy, and again, with the timing as recommended here. Again, with we still need more data and more studies on the safety of tofacinib, but at this time, it should be stopped at least two to four weeks prior to pregnancy, if able. So we discussed the importance of preconception counseling. We discussed the safety and risks associated with our medical therapies and management during pregnancy. So what about postpartum? Well, to start, the risk for a postpartum flare is about 20%. And it usually occurs within that six months period post delivery. So we certainly do not advise the mother to stop their medications after delivery because again, this risk of a disease flare. Now mothers are also concerned about the safety of breastfeeding. Are their medications safe and compatible with, with the lactation data and history that we have and the literature that we have? Overall, yes, our biological therapies are safe both with pregnancy and with breastfeeding. Some key facts to remember is that, again, our biologic therapies are likely to be transferred during that, that trimester, the third trimester, but their immunoglobulins, IgG, and what's found in breast milk is actually IgA. 
also the likelihood of these biologic therapies to be transferred into breast milk is really in very, very small amounts, owing to the fact that these biologics have a high molecular weight. My last couple of slides is going to discuss managing and monitoring a disease flare during pregnancy. Now, as far as biochemical and lab testing, recall that there are certain lab values, such as alkaline phosphatase and albumin, that may increase or decrease, respectively. And we also know that CRP increases during pregnancy. Therefore, ESR is more appropriate and more informative. But in fact, fecal calprotectin is actually a good bio marker to monitor for disease activity in your patient. Certainly, if a scope or an image study is needed, it should be performed. Again, really that second trimester is the most appropriate timing for these procedures and diagnostic tests. My rule of thumb is don't do the test if it's not going to change your management for your patient. But if you need to do some form of testing or imaging, an ultrasound or an MRI is preferred make sure to do, perform the MRI without gadolinium, gadolinium if you can. Now, of course, a single CT uh, if needed. I mean, certainly you can uh, proceed with the CT if, if really needed. And again, if it's going to change your management. For the procedures as far as endoscopic evaluation, again, try to time that during the second trimester if you can. Now, what about therapies? Again, during a flare or during a flare while pregnant, anti-TNF monotherapy is preferred over the combination therapy with the thiopurine. And if the patient needs steroids, give them steroids, control the bowel disease flare. We don't start a thiopurine during pregnancy, mostly because the risk for side effects, including the risk for pancreatitis, as well as the very slow onset of efficacy related to our thiopurine. If your patient is hospitalized, they should receive BTE prophylaxis, given their higher risk for thromboembolic events. And again, indications for surgery do not change just because the patient is pregnant. So if your patient has toxic, fulminant disease and surgery is indicated, perform the surgery. Lastly, it's very important to work very closely with our maternal fetal medicine colleagues and being able to have early and regular conversations with both your patient as well as your MFM or high-risk um, obstetricians regularly is also important. Discuss early in regards to what the mode of delivery should be. Now, I will say that there is some controversy in regards to whether vaginal de delivery should be performed or, wh or whether it may impact perianal disease or worsen it. I will say on a retrospective database study, it showed that women with Crohn's disease and active perianal disease had a tenfold increased risk of fourth degree lacerations. Uh, and of course, the epithemiotomy rates were also very high in that study. Also, although some studies show vaginal delivery is safe in terms to pouch function, there is some concern or the physiologic data that has uh, been previously described, which suggests that there's a higher rate for sphincter injury with vaginal versus cesarean de delivery. And therefore, for the mother who has a J pouch or the mother with active perianal fistulizing disease, a C-section is still recommended. So in summary, we were able to discuss fertility and the impact of disease activity in inflammatory bowel disease, with the primary recommendation, again, to control the bowel disease inflammation. This results in a healthy mother, which equals a healthy baby. We review the safety of our biologic therapies during pregnancy and breastfeeding. Again, we don't stop our treatment. We just need to be able to time it carefully so they receive their next dose a few days after their delivery. Again, uh, here to highlight that the newborn should not receive any live vaccines for the first six months of birth. And this primarily in the United States is the rotavirus vaccine. Next, to monitor and manage a disease flare, fecal calprotectin is very helpful and will, uh, will help if you feel that your patient is having a flare. Now, of course, if your patient needs a course of steroids or even if they need to be initiated on biological therapy, go ahead and give them the appropriate treatment to control their disease. Lastly, disease management takes an entire multidisciplinary care team 
which of course places the patient at the center and includes the primary care provider, the obstetrician, your surgeons, your dietitian, and yourself. So again, I thank the course directors and to you for your attention. And uh, th that is, uh, does having a target that can only be achieved in a minority of patients with our current therapies make sense? So if you're gonna go for mucosal healing, we know that happens in only some of the patients, even with our best therapies now. That's a great question. And I think it has to be looked at in the context of the patient. Um, some patient, for example, may have Crohn's and severe ulceration throughout the colon um, and near complete mucosal healing and complete mucosal healing, as I talked, will have the same overall benefit. The question is, what's that threshold that we need to achieve in an effort to say we've been completely successful? In ulcerative colitis, we recognize in the trials, a Mayo zero or a Mayo one is really the endpoint we strive for. So the old saying is, perfection is the enemy of excellence. Um, and is it now the mucosal healing that we have to get plus the histologic healing? I think if you can achieve it within class with the medication, for example, if you use mesalamine and you dose escalate with mesalamine, or if you use a biologic and you optimize the biologic and you achieve that, more power to you. But if you don't achieve histologic healing and you have someone on, let's say, infliximab and you want to switch to adalimumab, that's not something we would advocate. If there's endoscopic healing and not histologic, at present, we don't have enough evidence to say this should be universally adapted. So as we always say, the punishment has to fit the crime, the individual patient we have to look at uniquely in a precision way, focusing on their outcome of desire. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, David, uh, I enjoyed your, your discussion. I thought it was... Uh right on target as far as uh, not everything that causes diarrhea in these post-op patients is inflammation. Uh, the question that came from the audience is, what do you recommend as far as the treatment for people that are in that higher risk group that you wanna start back on some therapy after, after surgery? And I'll add to that, if someone has failed, uh, say in fliximab or an anti-TNF, do you automatically go to another category now, or do you go back to what they may have tolerated? Thank you, Larry. That's a fantastic question. Now, I have to actually step back and ask a question myself, which is, if a person is, is supposedly failing a drug, what happened? Because when a person is having obstructive symptoms after perhaps doing quite well with the drug, Initially, they felt much better, there was improvement, but then they have a crescendo pattern of obstructions happening with some increasing frequency. That actually might be a clue that that person has responded to that drug and healed. And in the course of healing, scar tissue will sometimes replace the inflammation. So if that's the story that I'm getting, if I can tease that out, um, if there was definitely some of those objective markers like normalization of inflammation markers, while that person was perhaps on that biologic agent, I'm gonna go back to that biologic agent postoperatively. There were several patients in Dr. Ruggiero's pilot study who had quote unquote failed their Remicade and infliximab infusions preoperatively, but when they went back on the drug postoperatively, they did great. So the, the definition of how that person failed a drug is really important. If it's a scar tissue, plumbing issue, sometimes fixing the plumbing restores the efficacy of the drug. If the person had really no clear signal that they were responding with a class of agents, and it's typically an anti-TNF as the first choice, then I'm gonna start thinking about going to a different biologic mechanism potentially. Uh, it, it may be an interesting model to explore with some of those biomarkers that Gary was talking about in terms of just getting a panel of them and seeing if they predict how people respond to the therapy. Okay, very good. Frank, a, a question for you. Uh, this is uh, uh, one that is a little uh, 
odd to me, but you, know, you can answer it in a couple of different ways. The way it was written, it says, should a 22-year-old on Humira and methotrexate get vaccinated for herpes zoster, even though he had chickenpox vaccine as a child? And then what if he wasn't vaccinated as a child? Should he get the shingles vaccine? And then my question would be, well, what if they're older and more appropriate to get the shingles vaccine? So, Well, the easy question would be to look at people above the age of 50, because um, those people should all receive the Shingrix vaccine. Well over 95% of patients over the age of 50 had chickenpox when they were a little child and therefore at risk for reactivation of uh, shingles. Now, the issue for people who receive the chickenpox vaccine. The chickenpox vaccine theoretically does not prevent you from developing shingles, but the likelihood of developing shingles after the chickenpox vaccine is vanishingly small. So I think for the cohort of individuals who, and again, immunosuppression may change this, but for the cohort of individuals who receive the chickenpox vaccine, I don't think we need to worry as of now about giving them Shingrix. If the person is 35, I offer the Shingrix vaccine to those individuals. However, what they should do is go to their pharmacy. Uh, I write a prescription. The pharmacist can run a claim. And I'll usually write patient is immunosuppressed. More often than not, they're not covered. And the patient then has to make the decision whether they want to pay for the vaccine out of pocket. Vaccine's probably about $320 for both shots. So again, that may be prohibitive for many. On the other hand, getting shingles and being out of work and having to deal with post herpetic neuralgia can be quite troublesome. Okay. How good are the vaccines in people who are immunosuppressed? Uh, like well, for, the for, for flu, for problems. instance, should, should they get the high test vaccine for flu? Yeah, so, so there's one study that looked at immune response to the high dose influenza vaccine in patients receiving anti-TNFs and they did much better. They mounted a much higher immune response. And actually in, in one of the papers that I wrote with Dr. Freddie Caldera, our recommendation is to give the high dose uh, flu vaccine to anyone who's on an anti-TNF. Um, we don't do that for ustekinumab. We don't do that for vetalizumab as of now. Again, it is off-label use, and it may, the pharmacist may look twice and not offer that vaccine. I thought you were going to ask about the shingles vaccine efficacy. Uh, it's an amazing vaccine, and the clinical trials that were published in the New England Journal of Medicine in patients above the age of 50, there's about a 97% effectiveness in preventing shingles, and we now have data extending almost to eight years. Uh, we need more data to see how well the vaccine lasts and the duration in individuals who are immunosuppressed. But there is some data now in bone marrow transplant patients like 18-year-olds, and the vaccine is about 60% effective in that highly immunosuppressed group of individuals. Okay. Uh, Nita, here's a question for you. Uh, do you check any labs on women with IBD to check their ovarian reserve and things like that? if they're considering getting pregnant? Yeah, so uh, I don't personally check them. I refer them to our maternal fetal medicine and OB colleagues. Uh, but in regards to assessments, certainly the uh, AMH hormone labs and levels are necessary. And that's what our MFM colleagues would potentially check. Again, this happens with a multidisciplinary effort and we really need to get our colleagues from maternal fetal medicine and ob gyn colleagues involved early on. So as soon as your patient, a woman of childbearing age is expressing interest in family planning and pregnancy, I think it's important to have an early referral to them. Okay, well, there's another question for you, which is sort of equal time for the guys, I guess. So is any reproductive concerns with biologics in young men? So certainly as far as reproductive concerns in young men, we do know certain therapies, for example, our sulfasalazine therapy can, uh, can impact sperm production. Methotrexate, there's been some suggestion in regards to that also impacting fertility. Um, so so there, we're learning a little bit more in regards to the, the safety profile of specifically methotrexate when it comes to the impact on sperm production as well as fertility. But overall, 
overall, we have not seen an impact the way we have seen with, with women of childbearing age. Okay, uh, Gary, here's another question for you. It says, is there a, well, it, I think, in, in a patient who achieves complete mucosal healing, how often do you assess? It depends on, and I'm assuming that means, Larry, assess for mucosal healing subsequently. I'm guessing that. It so. does, doesn't, so you can answer any way you want. <laughs> okay. Dealer's choice is nice to have. Um, so I think it depends on the individual and what's at risk. Um, if an individual happens to have very mild, uh, let's say, ulcerative colitis, distal disease, um, and we do a colonoscopy and they're in complete remission, um, it might be every year to two, depending upon the scenario they're in. If it's someone who has more severe disease and they have deep ulcers initially, we'll go in four months, six months out and check to see if it's healed. So the treat to target approach is that, but it's again, continuous monitoring. And someone who has a high risk, it might be depending on the scenario, six months to a year. So I think the biomarkers come into play in between that. So the biomarkers such as CRP and calprotectin will measure perhaps every three months in someone uh, as routine on a biologic. If they start to change and go up, that's the signal. That's the green light to go ahead and do a colonoscopy and say, it's time to look and see. Because if we look at individuals that have absolute normalization of CRP, where they had them elevated initially, 20% to 25% in some studies will have persistent inflammation in the bowel. And it's really the resolution of the inflammation that portends a better prognosis. We recognize surgeries are more likely in individuals that have persistent inflammation and also severity of inflammation, severe inflammation in ulcerative colitis and Crohn's has been linked to cancers. So if we can lessen it, we believe that there's less of a risk for those, though it's not been proved, quote, in unequivocally, but I think it's intuitively obvious to most people to say that's a good outcome we strive for. Okay. Uh, all right, Frank, this is one for you to put on your speculation hat. Uh, what are your thoughts on COVID-19 vaccine administration to IBD patients? So I think the, I, I pointed this out in my talk that uh, public health experts are terrified about the possibility of a twindemic this fall with people inside, with influenza circulating, and then people at increased risk for acquiring COVID. So clearly, uh, we need to encourage our patients to get their influenza vaccine. There's basically no evidence to suggest that the vaccine will cause an exacerbation of their underlying IBD. We as healthcare providers, you know, being in front of patients need to get our vaccines as well. I suspect that the, at the institutions that we represent, it's pretty much mandatory for us to practice to receive the vaccine. Now- yeah, that, That's the flu vaccine. I think the question was when the COVID-19 vaccine- No, no, I'm, yeah, I understand. So I'm, I'm setting the stage to at least let's take care of something that uh, we know is protective. Now, I will have absolutely no concern about administering the COVID vaccine to my IBD patients. Now, obviously we need to see how effective it is. We need to see what adverse events there are, but if the vaccine is like any of the other vaccines, I think we're going to have to encourage our patients to get them. And healthcare providers will be uh, first on the list. First responders will be first on the list. Uh, people with high risk uh, conditions, the elderly, but I would suspect that patients who are immunosuppressed will be high on the list. And again, the COVID vaccine is an inactive vaccine. Okay, great. Thank you. Well, this is a, a last question that anyone can take or all of you can. And it says, thoughts on marijuana use in IBD? Is there an anti-inflammatory benefit? So I... I could start with saying coming from a state from Washington state where uh, it's legalized and, and certainly the use is, um, is quite common and then now moving to Ohio State University. But uh, from our experience and, and we actually did uh, uh, some research on this, we have found that it, it is 
works for symptom control, for symptom management. We have not, it's been proposed that it may have an anti-inflammatory impact on the cannabinoid receptors. However, that has not yet been proven and, and, and uh, demonstrated on actual research, but for symptom control, we have found a benefit. Uh, it has been associated potentially with higher risk for hospitalizations and a higher risk or need for surgery. The question behind that, I would propose to my colleagues as well is potentially mask some of the symptoms. And then now the patients are presenting with the obstruction later on. Um, I think there's more we need to know and understand with it. But for symptom control, I think it works for our patients. And I would not be personally opposed to them using it for symptom control. Okay, great. Well, thank you. Unfortunately, Larry, there is a trial that was done, a prospective randomized double-blind placebo-controlled trial looking at CBD oil, um, which is a surrogate, if you would, for uh, marijuana cigarettes per se, um, and it didn't show benefit over placebo. And I always say we should buy stock in that drug called placebo, because it seems to work in the ugliest scenarios. So I think we need better controlled trials, larger trials, and anecdotally, I think most patients will tell us it's advantageous. Great. Well, I want to thank our IBD All-Stars for a fabulous session. Uh, thanks so much. Thank you to those of you who've stayed it for this final final stretch. Uh, this is going to be a short session. We just have um, two talks, um, myself and Dr. El Shrag. So I'm going to start off and uh, talk to you today about primary biliary cholangitis diagnosis and treatment. Um, and at the time I was asked to give this talk, I was unaware that they were gonna be doing a lunchtime breakout session, um, but there actually will be only a small amount of overlap. I'm gonna give you a much broader overview um, and also bring you up to date with a lot of the new treatments that are in development for this condition. These are my disclosures. I'm an investigator for quite a number of uh, clinical trials uh, investigating new treatments for PBC. So PBC, um, as you know, is this chronic cholestatic liver disease characterized by inflammatory destruction of the small and the medium-sized bile ducts. And the key clinical features is this is predominantly a female disease with the ratio female to male of 12 to one. And 95% of patients plus uh, have positive antimitochondrial antibodies in the serum. And the main clinical symptoms are itching and fatigue. These patients have an increased risk of osteoporosis, fat-soluble vitamin malabsorption, and the typical laboratory values are going to be high alkaline phosphatase, anywhere from normal in the very early stages of the disease up to about 2,000. The GGT is also elevated, uh, usually higher than the alkaline phosphatase, but parallels it in disease activity. The bilirubin can be anywhere from normal uh, to up to in the 30s, and this is a feature of late stage disease. The transaminases can be anywhere from normal to up around 500. Uh, once you get above 250-ish and certainly above 500, the question of overlap with autoimmune hepatitis comes into play. And these patients also have elevated cholesterol and elevated IgM cholesterol because this is a precursor for bile acid synthesis, so it accumulates in the liver. And IgM, we've still not figured out why patients have elevated IgM, but it is a characteristic feature and it parallels the disease activity. So PVC progresses through four stages. We describe them based on their histological features and really just based on how much geography uh, the disease uh, is involving in the liver. So stage one, is characterized by just inflammation that's uh, limited to the portal tract area inside the limiting plate. Stage two is when the inflammation begins to spread beyond that limiting plate, extend beyond the portal tract, and you may start to get some fibrosis, although it's, the fibrosis is limited to the portal tracts. Stage two is when you have bridging fibrosis between portal tracts, and stage uh, four is synonymous with cirrhosis. Now the characteristic pathologic uh, lesion is called a florid duct lesion, which is where you have this granulomatous inflammation that's destroying the bile duct. You may or may not see this on biopsy. You're most likely to see it in a stage two patient. Um, in stage one disease, the histological findings are very patchy. And by the time you get to stage four disease, it's usually somewhat burned out without any active florid duct lesions. 
So the typical clinical progression of PVC um, occurs over decades. And usually the very first thing to appear is the positive antimitochondrial antibody, even before there's abnormal histology or elevated alkaline phosphatase. This poses a dilemma often in clinical practice because patients will present with a positive AMA and no elevated alkaline phosphatase. And the question is, do they have very, very early PVC or do they have another liver disease with a false positive of AMA? Um, but eventually, if they do have PVC, they will declare themselves by developing first histological cholangitis and then uh, biochemical cholestasis with elevated alkaline phosphatase. And then the clinical symptoms ensue, including fatigue and itch. And then eventually, untreated, these patients will progress to cirrhosis with the typical complications of cirrhosis. And patients can be diagnosed at any time point along that uh, continuum. So liver biopsy is not absolutely required for the diagnosis of PBC if your patient is a middle-aged female who is AMA positive, has had an elevated alkaline phosphatase for at least six months, the transaminases are not over 500, and there's no suspicion of another liver disease. And these criteria come from a, a publication which looked at these clinical features and determined that your positive predictive value of having PVC was 95% and you didn't need a liver biopsy. This is what has translated into the AASLD diagnostic criteria. Um, although the, the diagnostic criteria don't specifically tell you the nuances that you have to have no suspicion of another liver disease um, and the alkaline phosphatase elevation should be chronic. Nowadays, especially in Texas, most patients who end up getting a biopsy for diagnosis are ones who have features um, or risk factors for fatty liver disease. And there's a need to distinguish between the two and only biopsy can do that. So PBC is uh, increasingly being diagnosed uh, at a later age. And here you see a graph showing you over the past few decades that the mean age of diagnosis has risen from the 40s to the 50s. And it's not just that we're getting lazy and not picking these people up until later in their disease course, because actually we are picking up earlier stage disease now as compared to in the past. So really what we're doing is we're picking up older people who have a mild or less progressive form of the disease. And this is what led to, as you heard earlier, the change in the name from primary biliary cirrhosis to primary biliary cholangitis, because the majority of patients do not actually have cirrhosis anymore. So the next few slides are gonna show you a few um, examples of what you might find on clinical exam. These are all patients of mine. Um, so with the paritis, you'll find that they can have some pretty severe excoriations. This itching does not cause a primary rash, but you do get a secondary rash, which is essentially scarring uh, red crusted papules and parigo nodules that you can get from the scratching. And so on the left here, you see a picture of somebody who's been scratching on their back. I don't know if you can appreciate it or not, but there's an area of clearing across the mid back that extends up to the shoulders. And that's called butterfly sparing, where you get um, a shape of a butterfly in the middle of the back that is spared. It really just represents the areas that your patient is not able to reach to scratch. And if they go to the kitchen and, and get you know a spaghetti scooper out or something and, and scratch, you're not gonna see the butterfly, but it is a characteristic feature. Uh, and also characteristic of this uh, itching is that it tends to involve the palms of the hands and the soles of the feet. Um, and that's illustrated by the bottom of this the lady's foot. She actually had no excoriations on exam whatsoever. And then I asked her to take her socks off and she was reluctant to do that because she was embarrassed. Uh, but when she finally did, you could see uh, the evidence that that's where she had been scratching. So I mentioned that these patients have high uh, buildup of cholesterol because that's the precursor of bile acid synthesis. And sometimes the serum cholesterol levels can get very, very high and they can get uh, xanthomas. Um, and they can occur anywhere. They can be the flexor surfaces, the extensor surfaces. Most commonly, they are um, around the eyes, xanthalasma, um, but they can occur anyway. And these do often get better with some of our therapies. 
So another physical exam feature you might see typically later in the disease is little patches of hyperpigmentation. I don't know if you can appreciate it or not, but uh, one of these ladies' hands is darker than the other. And this is due to increased melanin deposition. Um, and then I think um, as a clinician in the office, uh, it's important to be aware of the numerous extra hepatic associations that PBC has because Patients will often have several of these. It can point you towards the diagnosis. Uh, you may also find them in the family history that will point you towards the diagnosis. The most common extrapatic association is Sika syndrome, dry eyes, dry mouth, which is present in 70 to 80% of patients. The next most common is probably thyroid disease, which you can find up into a third of patients. And other features that are associated are what we used to call Crest syndrome, which is now called limited scleroderma. Uh, including esophageal dysmotility. So they may have present with dysphagia um, or quite commonly just GERD. Um, a couple of skin disorders that are associated with PBC include lichen planus and psoriasis. And uh, another important one to remember is gallstones. So in several series, up to 50% of these patients have gallstones. And so I think it was mentioned earlier that if one of these patients acutely becomes jaundice, you ought to look for extra hepatic obstruction. Inflammatory bowel disease is also increased in patients with PBC. We think of it more as an association with PSC because there it's a very, very strong association. With PBC, it's a weaker association, um, but ulcerative colitis is more common than Crohn's disease. And almost half patients will have some type of joint pain, uh, usually a seronegative arthropathy, um, but about 20% may have bona fide rheumatoid arthritis. Um, and then another common feature is asymptomatic bacteria. If you look for this um, with serial urinary uh, microscopic exams, you'll find asymptomatic bacteria, which doesn't necessarily need to be treated. The patient is asymptomatic. And sometimes we see autoimmune uh, anemias or hemolytic anemias. So what causes PBC? And the short answer is we still don't know. Uh, I think the question is somewhat similar to the old chicken and the egg. Uh, we know that this disease is characterized by cholestasis and immune mediated destruction of the bile ducts, but we don't really know which comes first. We used to think that it was definitely the immune mediated destruction, that this was an autoimmune disease and the bile ducts would get destroyed through the autoimmune process. And then once you lost significant amount of ducts, then you would become cholestatic. But there is a lot of recent data to challenge uh, that paradigm to suggest that perhaps the cholestasis occurs first. Uh, I don't have time to go into great detail, but for example, there are um, bicarbonate transporters that are more likely to have mutations so that you can have um, a decreased bicarbonate concentration in your bile, which makes your bile duct epithelial cells more susceptible to bile acid injury. And maybe there's something like that that causes the bile duct injury to begin with. And then uh, the immune reaction is a secondary reaction. So how do we treat this? Um, this audience probably knows that the standard therapy is ursa deoxycholic acid. Um, which is a naturally occurring hydrophobic bile acid. This is the primary bile acid in bears. So any of you who took Latin or, or astrology will recognize the, the Ursa uh, uh, Latin word for bear. And it's given at a dose of 13 to 15 milligrams per kilogram. And at that dose, it enriches the bile pool to about 40% or so. Um, nowadays, when patients are very enthusiastic about taking something natural, they're very excited to hear that this is a naturally occurring bile acid. Um, however, we don't obtain it naturally. It's synthesized in the laboratory. Um, you can see a picture of a, a bear in a cage there. And it used to be many, many years ago um, in China, they did realize the therapeutic value of bear bile and used to cage these bears and drain their gallbladders to obtain the bile and then sell it uh, in the market for therapeutic purposes. But nowadays it's all made in the laboratory. Um, and what does Ursa do? It increases the fluidity of the bile so that it can escape better. Uh, it increases AE2 expression. That is the um, transporter of bicarbonate that I refer to that helps restore this bicarbonate umbrella that protects the bile epithelial cells from bile acid damage. And this is the FDA approved therapy for PBC. 
Just to summarize the benefit that you can get from ursodiol and PBC, we know it improves biochemical tests, it delays the histological progression as shown in prospective trials, and it prolongs expected survival without transplant by just about any measure that you can make. If you compare to historical controls or any um, mathematical model that predicts survival, we don't have 20 year prospective placebo controlled trials that show a difference in mortality uh, because that's not feasible in this disease. Despite the improvement um, in survival, we still see that transplant for free survival of ursodiol treated patients is still less than age and sex matched controls. So even though it's helping, it's not solving the problem completely. And why is that? Well, we know from looking retrospectively at data, um, here's a study from Spain uh, that shows you that really it's whether you respond biochemically to the ursodiol or not that predicts if you are going to do well. So in the top graph, you can see patients that uh, dropped their alpha and phosphatase at least 40% of where they started and their survival curve is the same as someone who doesn't even have the disease and much better than predicted. And in the bottom, you can see those patients who didn't drop their alpha and phosphatase that much had a much more reduced survival, although not quite as bad as would be predicted if they didn't take the ursodiol at all. Uh, similar data from France using different biochemical criteria showing that if you have a biochemical response to ursodiol, your survival is the same as somebody who doesn't even have the disease, but if not, you're gonna be in trouble. And unfortunately, this is not a small proportion of patients. 20 to 40% of patients of PBC patients fall into this suboptimal responder category. I wanna point out to you, if you're not aware of the PBC Globe Store score, because it's only been out for a few years, um, this is an excellent way to predict survival for your patient treated with ursodiol, much better than just looking at the alpha and phosphatase alone, because it takes into account the age of your patient um, and um, other biochemical markers of what stage they're starting at uh, from the beginning. And uh, this just shows an example. If you have a 53-year-old with an alpha and phosphatase of 323 after a year, but your other numbers look pretty good, uh, the three-year survival is slightly reduced, but 15-year survival is significantly reduced. And I find this tool very helpful in the clinic to convince patients that they probably should be on some kind of additional therapy besides Urso if they're not having a good response. All right, so what do we use? We heard a lot in the noon hour about a beta cholic acid or OCA. Um, so I'm only gonna talk about it briefly. Um, this is a designer bile acid. Um, Kino deoxycholic acid is the primary bile acid in geese. And so that's why I have a picture of a little, a goose with a designer bag there, Gucci bag. Um, but what they did was they took the Kena deoxycholic acid and added an extra ethyl group in the sixth position. And that made this a very strong agonist for Farnesoid X receptor. Um, and of note, ursodiol, I think there was a question about this earlier, about the difference in the mechanism. Ursodiol has virtually no FXR activity. So even though these are uh, both bile acid therapies, they work in vastly different manners. So just briefly, how, why is FXR agonism a good thing in cholestatic liver disease? Um, if you think back to medical school and uh, your bile acid enterohepatic circulation, remember that bile acids, these little green globs in the figure, uh, are synthesized in the liver and they are excreted through the bile export protein into the bile canaliculus and they travel down the bile ducts into the intestine where they're used to digest food. And then when they reach the ileum, they are, re or they are uptaken again by the apical sodium dependent bile salt transporter. It's also called ileal bile acid transporter. But they are retaken up again into the ileum and from the inner site, they are pumped into the blood with the organic solute transporter. They travel through the blood back to the liver uh, where they are taken up again by these organic ion transporter proteins. And that's how they are recycled in the body. Now there is all of these transporters that I have circled in red under are under transcriptional control by FXR. And that's why these drugs are helpful because if you stimulate FXR, you effectively increase excretion of bile acids from the liver and you also decrease the reuptake in the ileum. In addition, when the bile acids are being reuptaken uh, re in, the, in the ileum, 
uh, that uh, is a stimulus to secrete a hormone called FGF19 that travels back to the liver and inhibits the enzyme responsible for bile acid uh, synthesis. So you're also decreasing de novo bile acid synthesis. So that is our mechanism of action. So um, results uh, we've seen in the clinical trials that um, OCA is very good at reducing alkaline phosphatase. Uh, this is data from the five to 10 milligram group um, in their trial which I've shown because that was the, the dose that was approved by the FDA. And you can see that you get about a 29% reduction in alkaline phosphatase and the long-term outcomes have still yet to be seen in the ongoing trials. We know that, the, that these drugs can cause pruritus as a side effect. This is a list of side effects from the clinical trials and pruritus was the most common. Uh, nausea was the second most common side effect from these drugs. Uh, there are now um, reports of increased uh, risk for having gallstones or cholecystitis with these compounds. And as we heard earlier, there's also risk of potential for liver decompensation in patients who have advanced liver disease because the drug can be retained in the liver, in a cholestatic liver, and so the dose has to be drastically reduced. There are other FXR agonists that are in development, and what we're seeing is that they are also causing a, a significant drop in alkaline phosphatase with pruritus as a side effect. So this is, appears to be um, a class effect. So I wanna spend some time talking about fibrates. Um, fibrates are uh, PPAR agonists because there's data that these are gonna be um, potentially very helpful in, uh, in this disease. They have multiple mechanisms of, by which they may be helpful in PVC. Um, there by PPAR, this is a graph of PPAR alpha stimulation. It has uh, metabolic effects, anti-inflammatory effects, decreases uh, COX-2 and various uh, cytokines, and probably very important, uh, increases um, translation of MDR3, which is a protein that pumps the biliary, uh, the phospholipids into the bile. And the phospholipids, uh, remember, are the thing that surround the bile acids and make a, a micelle. So it protects, again, the bile epithelium from damage from the, from the uh, bile acid. So we have the most data on the fibrate called Visa fibrate, um, but this is not available in the United States. This is a French phase three study but you can see that after two years of treatment, the visa fibrate group in blue had a significant reduction in bilirubin compared to the placebo group got worse in, in red. Um, and excellent reduction in alkaline phosphatase about 60%, so a, a quantitatively larger uh, drop in alkaline phosphatase compared to what we see with the, with the uh, FXR agonists, although we have no head-to-head -head comparison. Um, interestingly, they also saw significant improvements in itch and even after two years improvement in liver stiffness. Now we don't have visa fibrate in the United States, what we have is phenofibrate uh, and there are not many studies on phenofibrate. There's this uh, one small study from uh, Miami that showed that phenofibrate um, over time did reduce alkaline phosphatase uh, significantly as well, but this was only 20 subjects. And the FDA has actually issued a, a, a note, I wouldn't say it's a warning, but it's a note that this should not be pursued in PBC patients without uh, caution. But you can see it's about a 50% drop, so a significant drop. One of the other concerns of the FDA is that there's a known hepatotoxicity of fibrates that about 20% of patients will actually have elevation in transaminases um, and a smaller percentage will actually have a significant liver injury. So uh, there's another PPAR agonist that is PPAR delta specific that is fairly along in, in development. Um, this is called Celadelpar. And what you can see here is that they have um, also very significant reduction in alkaline phosphatase after 12 weeks, the mean alkaline phosphatase is in the uh, normal range. So these fibrates are powerful. They bring the alkaline phosphatase down a lot, um, often into the normal range. This particular compound was um, stopped abruptly from its clinical development in November because of concerns of some interface hepatitis that they saw on biopsy in one of their NASH studies. 
But then when they looked further, they determined that the interface hepatitis had been there even pre-treatment. And so then the FDA followed up with lifting the clinical hold and they've resumed their studies. So this is data kind of hot off the press, I guess, from the easel meeting uh, that just happened virtually not too long ago, showing uh, the three month data for that particular compound, again, showing uh, very impressive reductions in alkaline phosphatase and a third of patients normalizing their alkaline phosphatase by three months. And there's another uh, PPAR agonist that's a combination alpha delta that's in development. Um, it's called elafibrinor. And likewise, you can see very dramatic drops in alkaline phosphatase um, on the left and uh, compared to baseline reductions of you know, 40, 50%. So to summarize the adjuvant therapy, what we have available now is a beta colic acid, but there are other FXR agonists that are uh, under development that may be uh, available soon. And then there are several fibrates which are um, up and coming, including possibly using phenofibrate, bezofibrate, selindelpar, and elafibrinor. Now, if all this fails, liver transplantation is our definitive treatment. It's not a cure because it will recur in 20 to 40% of patients, but even when it recurs, it rarely progresses to cirrhosis. PVC accounts for about 3% of all liver transplants, which is not very many. Ever since we introduced ursodiol to the, to the market, the percentage of uh, transplants done for PVC has dramatically uh, gone down. Um, it's been fairly stable for the last five to seven years though. Um, I have about five minutes left, so I'd like to kind of touch on managing some of the other side effects of chronic cholestasis because managing a patient with PBC um, involves not just treating the underlying disease, but managing their other complications, including osteoporosis, fat soluble vitamin deficiencies, pruritus, and fatigue. So, unfortunately, we have no good therapy for the fatigue. Um, at one point, there was enthusiasm about using modafinil, which is a stimulant that we use for narcolepsy. Um, but when the uh, appropriate randomized trial was done, you can see the results here with objective outcomes, there was no significant difference between modafinil and placebo, and it actually wasn't very well tolerated. What we tend to do is recommend to our patients that they just drink coffee because there is uh, significant data. There's a meta-analysis showing you that in various kinds of liver disease and um, that coffee actually decreases fibrosis progression. And there was a significant number of patients with PBC in, in several of these studies, but each of the studies was a mixed bag of different kinds of liver disease. For the itching, we use bile acid binding resins, for example, cholestyramine, if that doesn't work, we can use rifampin. Um, and then if that doesn't work, we consider using naltrexone or sertraline. Uh, nasobiliary dredging is uncomfortable, but it works very well. Um, and as I've shown you, the data for the fibrates actually show some promise that they're going to reduce pruritus in addition to reducing alkaline phosphatase. And we don't quite know why that is, although it seems to correlate with reduction in serum phospholipids. There are also some drugs that are under development specifically for treating the pruritus um, that inhibit the reabsorption of bile acids from the ileum. Here's an example of one of those. Um, and you can see that the um, pruritus improved uh, compared to baseline in the study drug as compared to placebo. So just to summarize the key points, uh, PBC is now called primary biliary cholangitis because the minority of modern era patients actually have cirrhosis. Primary therapy is still with ursodoxicolic acid at a dose of 13 to 15 milligrams per kilogram, but you should consider adjuvant therapy if their biochemical response is suboptimal. Um, and the GLOBE score is, is probably the most efficient uh, and accurate way to assess response. A beta colic acid at a dose to five to 10 milligrams is FDA approved for adjuvant therapy, but there are many other possibilities that are in development. There are other FXR agonists and there are many PPAR agonists. Liver transplant is very effective salvage therapy, but fortunately we rarely have to use that these days. And that concludes what I was going to present to you today. And um, I'll be happy to answer any questions in the Q&A session, but um, we're gonna have um, another speaker after me. And I don't know if Hashem is online yet.
Yes. <laughs> Okay, so our next speaker is going to be Dr. Hashem El Sarag, um, who many of you probably know. He's published extensively um, on hepatocellular carcinoma, and he's going to be reviewing for us um, HCC, the diagnosis and treatment. Hello, uh, my name is Hashem El Sarag. I'm a professor and department chair at Baylor College of Medicine in Houston, Texas. Uh, it is my pleasure to talk to you today about hepatocellular carcinoma diagnosis and treatment. I don't have anything to disclose. Uh, we'll follow a fairly simple outline. Uh, I will have a few minutes on the diagnosis of hepatocellular carcinoma. Uh, then the bulk of the talk is going to be about updates related to the management vis-a-vis -vis staging and treatments. And then I'm gonna end it with a really important concept uh, of how to manage this tumor, which is uh, multidisciplinary care. I'd like to start by saying that it is now the fastest rising cause of cancer-related deaths in the US. Uh, multiple maps shown between 2003 to 2012. Uh, the redder color indicates higher incidence and mortality rate. And as you can see, almost all the states have gone up in the color intensity. And the states that are contem contemporarily have the highest incidence rates for hepatocellular carcinoma are located on the West Coast and South. And uh, my home state of Texas uh, happens to lead the nation in the incidence of hepatocellular carcinoma. Uh, so this talk assumes that this audience knows what the risk factors for hepatocellular carcinoma. Um, and just to give you a quick update here, uh, cirrhosis is the precursor lesion. Most of the practice guidelines indicate or advocate uh, surveillance among those who have cirrhosis for any reason. So assuming you're doing that, uh, you are likely to stumble upon findings that are abnormal in your surveillance test, be it your imaging, which is typically ultrasound, or your biomarker, which is typically an alpha fetoprotein. So if that ultrasound showed a small lesion, and by a small meaning less than one centimeter, most modalities, be it cross-sectional imaging or biopsy, are not really sensitive or specific for verifying such a diagnosis. And therefore, most people would advocate repeating the ultrasound in three months and watching for changes in the size of the lesion. If the lesion enlarges or it's already uh, uh, larger than one centimeter, or you have a biomarker that is elevated greater than 20 nanograms per ml, then the follow-up test is a diagnostic test, which is a dynamic contrast enhanced uh, CT or MRI. If you do that, then there are classical features on cross-sectional imaging, CT or MRI, that should nail the diagnosis of hepatocellular carcinoma. These features are two. One is the arterial phase during the, uh, uh, there's an artificial hyper enhancement, mm -hmm. meaning the contrast rushes into the tumor, which is hypervascular due to its dual vascularity from portal and hepatic vessels. While the rest of the liver hasn't taken up contrast, you notice the left panel, the arrowhead points to accumulation of contrast in a tumor that happens to be hepatocellular carcinoma. On your right panel, a five-minute delayed venous washout uh, finding, meaning in a tumor that is hepatocellular carcinoma, because of the hypervascularity, again, there is a uh, rush out of the uh, uh, contrast out of the tumor while the rest of the liver still has contrast in it. So the combination of arterial phase hyper enhancement and a delayed venous washout in a tumor that is greater than one centimeter is classic and diagnostic for uh, hepatocellular carcinoma. But as you may know, life doesn't work in a classic way. And there are many ambiguities and differences in what I just mentioned which is the size, the arterial enhancement, the delayed washout, the growth over time, and another classic but not so common sign is the enhancing capsule. And depending on the confluence of these criteria, 
you can end up with something that is really definitive for HCC or something that is less definitive. In order to reduce the ambiguity of reading and reporting cross-sectional imaging for nodules that are suspected for hepatocellular carcinoma, there is this schema, which is uh, the, the liver diagnostic radiology group, uh, LIRADS or LIRADS is, is the scheme. Uh, and I would advise most of you who deal with this entity is to have your radiology group or department uh, try to subscribe to this nomenclature or something close to it that allows communication in definitive terms. To demystify it, uh, you notice this table. This is the arterial phase hyperenhancement, and the size is less listed here, and the other major features are here. So if you have someone who has everything, arterial hyperenhancement, large size, and the other features, they end up with a LIRAD four or five, and M meaning most likely a tumor in it, probable or definitive. If you have someone who have none of that, a small tumor with no arterial uh, phase hyper enhancement and none of those features, then they end up with the LIRAD one, which is definitively benign. Uh, LIRAD three is the most confusing entity because it's mostly not hepatocellular carcinoma, but depending on the studies, anywhere between 20 to 30% may actually have hepatocellular carcinoma, either at the time of the cross-sectional imaging or a few months to a few, months la uh, to a few layers, uh, years later. So it doesn't help you that much in nailing the diagnosis in L3. And as I will mention, this is a time for exercising your right to do a nodule biopsy. So uh, this will be for your reference and it's not to be memorized, and, but it is something to be communicated. And again, L4, L5 is HCC, L1, 2 is not HCC, L3, you're really not sure, but you can't let them go. So the role of biopsy results in the results from the fact that you have a LIRAD3 where not all the features are present. So on your left side panel here, the most left panel is an arterial phase that shows nothing. There is no enhancement. While on the portal venous phase, there is an actual uh, venous washout. So that's atypical. On your right two panels, here is there's an arterial phase hyper enhancement, but not much of a delayed not much of a delayed venous washout. So that's one indication for a nodule biopsy. Everything I mentioned goes out of the window if we're dealing with someone with liver nodules in the absence of cirrhosis. There, you, you don't do following up or you don't do alpha fetoproteins either. You just go straight for biopsy because. Uh, the likelihood of metastatic cancer or non-HCCs is high, and you want a definitive di diagnosis for that. Um, the, the practice has shifted where there is a resurgence of more biopsies of nodules done, particularly in the setting where patients would be requiring systemic therapy. Newsflash here, this is going to be really the new part of my talk, is there is now a plethora of new promising and even upcoming systemic therapies that are mostly now in the domain of the oncologist, but will require more of these nodule biopsies to happen. So now we're done with the diagnosis. We found a nodule, we suspected it, we moved it across the algorithm, and we got to a diagnosis either by Lyrides 4 or 5 or a nodule biopsy. Now we go to staging. No one should memorize all of those stagings, but if you're a simple person like me, all these stagings depend on three broad factors. The tumor characteristics. Is it large? Is it multiple? The liver function. Is it compensated? Is it decompensated? And the person's performance status. Are they holding it together or they have comorbidities? Most of these classification and staging systems utilize one element or more of these three broad things. If you want to be practical, there are probably two uh, 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 staging systems. One is the Barcelona Clinic Liver Cancer, BCLC. 
and the other is the Hong Kong. And these probably are the most validated uh, uh, systems that are linked to treatments. I'm going to use the BCLC uh, to make a point here of the different treatments that are available. So again, everything starts with a cirrhotic liver, not non-cirrhotic liver. And you have a very early stage. If you have a solitary tumor, less than two centimeters, preserved function with great functional status. And in that case, curative therapy could be provided by either ablation or resection. You move to a next stage, which is early stage or A, and that's the Milan criteria you know, that hopefully uh, most of you are familiar with. It's either a single tumor, less than five centimeters, two to three nodules, less than three centimeters, preserved function, good functional status. Um, if it's uh, solitary, which is the one tumor then, and they're optimal surgical candidates, then uh, surgical resection is a possibility. If not, then it's a transplant. If there are people are not liver transplant candidates, and unfortunately there are many who would not get into the transplant candidacy, then they move to ablation and many other things that we're gonna talk about. Intermediate stage, uh, admittedly, this is somewhat of a hodgepodge group. Uh, it has many people who probably don't have the same disease pathology or prognosis, but they're lumped in this group. And traditionally, chemoembolization has been the group employed here. Then you get to advanced stage, and by advanced stage, it's portal invasion, extrahepatic spread, but still preserved liver function and still decent functional status. And that's where systemic therapy uh, was traditionally being employed, carrying on the theme of a news flash. This is an area of expansion, the advanced stage. We're taking more patients possibly from the intermediate stage to the systemic therapy group. So I'm gonna to touch on the main uh, modalities of treatment, uh, surgical resection, it, it achieves best results in patients with BCLC stage zero, it offers a long-term survival of five years, 50 to 60%, but because you do leave the rest of the liver behind with practically the same disease left behind, the five-year uh, uh, recurrence-free survival is low, 10 to 20%. This may change as we're getting to cure more hepatitis C patients, uh, but these are the data as of now. It has a small but definite treatment-related mortality, and you can also employ it in some patients beyond the liver transplant criteria. And if you remember from my previous slide, there was an arrow that uh, a singular tumor with a hepatic reserve that is reasonable and a good overall functional status, then resection is, could be indicated. Uh, the thing that is easy and practical for you to remember, that if people start showing clinical signs of portal hypertension, probably uh, surgery is contraindicated at that point in time. The poor man's test for portal hypertension or poor woman's test for portal hypertension. It's probably serum bilirubin. And believe it or not, it's a cutoff of one, which doesn't take that much to get you a bilirubin more than that to indicate significant portal hypertension. But if you can measure, obviously, the hepatic venous pressure gradient, then it's anything greater than 10 millimeters per uh, mercury. And again, the presence of portal hypertension is likely to constitute a contraindication for surgical resection because the operative and immediate postoperative mortality increases in the presence of portal hypertension. Liver transplant, you need to remember the Milan criteria. They're shown here on the slide. If you transplant people with these criteria, the five-year survival should be greater than 70%. The, the recurrence rate should be less than 15%. Alpha fetoprotein, on top of the Milan criteria, gives you an additional prognostic factor, a bad one, uh, I should add, greater than 1,000, predicts 50% recurrence. And a big problem in liver transplant, well, there are multiple problems. Uh, one of them is there aren't enough livers to go around, and HCC competes with many other illnesses. The second one is, and it's a product of the first one, is people who are eligible for liver transplant and get listed to receive a liver transplant, drop out of the list if they have HCC due to HCC progression. So nowadays there is the downstaging for HCC 
and the bridging for HCC. Basically, taking someone who does not qualify for uh, liver transplant based on size and nodule number criteria, giving them ablative therapy or trans arterial chemoembolization and bringing them down to liver transplant criteria and allowing them to be listed. Another utility of such treatment is while people are on the list, if they grow, you try to downstage them and bring them back to the list. The beauty about this, if you will, maybe beauty is not a word I should use here, but the, the usefulness of this technique is, A, if you bring them down to a stage that is still Milan, they do get exception points. And I intentionally didn't show the number of points given for which condition, because these things tend to change. But the concept is, for people with documented HCC on a transplant list, they get few exception points that pushes them up the list. So if you do downstation, you still get those points. The second one, it's a time buying maneuver. In other words, if you downstage a patient and they remain downstaged for a long time, you're probably selecting those who are gonna do better with transplant and transplanting them with, in a way, double secure favorable outcomes. So uh, this is to summarize and to put a plug in for my last point of the talk, which is gonna come later, the multidisciplinary thing. So uh, despite my boxes and despite the arrows and despite showing it somewhat relatively clean in terms of decision-making, it's not that clean. So if you have people with, and here I'm shifting classifications on you, a TNM, T1 is, uh, two centimeters or less or greater than two centimeters with no vascular involvement. T2 is slightly larger, but basically it's a, it's a, it's a Barcelona stage uh, early or very early. Um, and you stack up the three possible treatments here, liver transplant, surgical resection, local ablation. It's a very tough comparison. Look at the five-year survival. Yes, liver transplant is slightly higher. The other two are not very far behind. Um, the recurrence-free survival is a problem for the other two. The procedure mortality is a real problem for the liver transplant and availability is an issue for liver transplant. So once you eliminate the possibility of a liver transplant, you do end up weighing, which one do I do? Surgical resection or local ablation? And it seems like the, the preponderance of evidence, which is not fantastic, by the way, uh, favors uh, resection over radiofrequency ablation but it is something that people debate every day. And the debate is the issue I wanna leave you with. You need to have a multidisciplinary tumor board or a group that discusses those things because these decision points are not clear. There isn't that fantastic randomized control evidence that you can hang your hat on every time. And it's a matter of debate and almost negotiations on who does which procedure better in your particular setting. So now I'm gonna go move to local regional therapies. I'm not gonna discuss these in details, but cryoablation, which is obviously cold, radiofrequency ablation, which is the classic way of uh, local ablation, microwave, which is overtaking radiofrequency ablations in some places because it can ablate more in one setting. Then you have stereotactic body radiotherapy, uh, yttrium 90, which is radio uh, uh, embolization, and transarterial chemoembolization. I will just put one slide on radiofrequency ablation. As you can see, a probe is inserted, gets closer to the tumor, then the spikes of the probe uh, are spread, and then you put the current and you basically heat it. It's highly efficient uh, for ablating tumors less than three, possibly less than four uh, centimeters in diameter, complete response in 55% particularly if they're less than three centimeters and the predictors of poor response, well, you already guessed it, size, uh, infiltration, poor differentiation. It is contraindicated in some uh, anatomic related reasons uh, located at the dome, next to the gallbladder, next to blood vessels in the caudate uh, uh, lobe. Uh, so uh, there are some instances where the operators say, I just can't do it in this location. Uh, severe complications are, are relatively infrequent, one to 10%. Mortality is quite low. Tumor dissemination, while has described in the earlier studies, it's probably really, really low. 
uh, you just keep bear in mind that you probably want to avoid it if transplant is an option and microwave ablation that's MWA is the one that is now being used. The arterial directed therapies, transarterial embolization is basically bland embolization, not very frequently used. Conventional taste it has the strongest evidence of benefit from randomized controlled trials. The problem is systemic release of chemotherapy plus the usual post embolization syndrome. Therefore, drug eluding bead taste, which comes at a greater expense, but slower release and directed relief, and therefore um, uh, less uh, systemic therapy, uh, less systemic toxicity uh, is an option. And finally, radio uh, embolization uh, using yttrium 90 uh, is more expensive, but it has its niche use uh, in instances particularly where there is portal vein thrombosis, where it's not safe or even possible to do transarterial chemoembolization. Um, it may improve uh, to, uh, time to progression. You need fewer sessions. Not every place offers it. It's a more specialized uh, procedure. And uh, there is a dearth of randomized control trials comparing these modalities to each other. Uh, and therefore, you still need your tumor board. So now I'm gonna to shift to systemic therapy. And this is a slide that sort of updates my earlier slide about the Barcelona uh, classification and the choice of treatments. Basically shows in that intermediate stage, in the old days, you consider taste, you keep tasting them, and if they don't respond, there's really not much you can do. Uh, in this case, I think there is more, um, uh, more push or more uh, recommendations for taking some of the cases here that fail their initial taste or perhaps a repetitive taste and moving them into the more advanced stage and considering systemic therapy. So what's happening in systemic therapy? This was the slide that we would present in 2007. There was one treatment only, which is serafinib. Things have changed and I'll show you how this table gets populated. So First change happened when linvatinib, another uh, tyrosine kinase inhibitor, works similar to serafinib, working on different PKs, showed non inferiority to serafinib. Showing this slide, which shows the median progression free survival, linvatinib actually had slightly better uh, median progression survival, although in the same study, overall survival was not different. But this study and non inferiority led to the approval of lenvatinib. So we ended up with two targeted therapies for first line treatment. Then came a slew of second line treatments, rigorafenib, uh, cabozentinib, and uh, ramucirumab. And I will describe them briefly. Rigorafenib, remember all of these studies are second line. So they enroll patients who already failed serafinib. They randomize those patients to the active, which is in this case rigorafenib, or placebo. The results are shown comparing those two. The red is rigorafenib. The higher, the better. The top graph is overall survival. The lower panel is progression-free survival. Different endpoints. Don't need to be a statistician to figure out that the red is higher than the blue in both. You probably need to be a statistician to read the small font of the hazard ratio 0.63 significant and 0.46 significant, meaning rigorafenib offers two to three months survival advantage over placebo among those who failed serafinib treatment, and that gave it the indication of being a second line therapy. Cabozentinib, again, after serafinib failure, same study design, same results, red is cabo, blue is placebo, two month advantage compared to uh, placebo in those who failed serafinib. Before I present uh, the last of the second therapies, which is an immunotherapy, the rationale for immunotherapy is quite attractive. HCC is an inflammation induced tumor, at least the viral hepatitis ones. Spontaneous immune responses have been observed. Activity is not dependent, activity of the medication that, or the met metabolism of immune therapy is not dependent on liver function. So that's an advantage in people who have cirrhosis. 
And you can combine it with other therapies, both locally and systemic. So a second line therapy is uh, ramucirumab. And again, the same design, HCC documented uh, progression of disease or intolerance uh, on serafinib gets randomized uh, to ramucirumab or uh, placebo. And the results are advantage to ramo versus placebo. And the difference is one to two months. So I've reviewed three second line therapies. The table is filling more, and this is the most exciting thing of my talk, and, and hopefully it's new for some of you at least. Um, Biva Atizo, Biva Sizumab and Atizolizumab. And I'm gonna call them Biva Atizo for obvious reasons. So a big study, Embrave, uh, or I am brave 150. Um, those are patients who are locally advanced or unresectable HCC, didn't receive systemic therapy before that. An international study stratified them by regions, uh, stratified them by uh, their functional status, microvascular invasion, and baseline alpha fetoprotein. Randomized them to the combination of Atizo, Biva, versus serafinib. This is a head-to-head -head against serafinib. Followed them for overall survival and recurrence-free or progression-free survival. Those were co-primary endpoints. And these are the results. I maintained the red for the serafinib, but now the blue is the combination. And look at the six months overall survival, 85% compared to 72% serafinib, clearly longer, clearly better statistically significant. You benefit extends throughout the follow-up up to one year and even longer. If you look at progression-free survival, look at again the six months, a benefit of approximately 20%, 55% versus 37%, and again, statistically significant. If you look at the safety, um, the notorious uh, safety issues related to uh, uh, serafinib, where the rashes, uh, uh, which are not present in uh, the Atizo Biva, um, most of the uh, adverse events that happen greater than 10% and there's uh, difference are on the side of serafinib. So diarrhea is more common, uh, the rash is more common, decreased appetite is slightly more common, hypertension is slightly more common in the combinations, abdominal pain more common in, in serafinib, alopecia, asthenia, fatigue. I mean, that's, that's a major issue with serafinib. So if you're wondering about quality of life, it, it seems that quality of life, which is important for people with this disease, is better with atezolizumab. So the landscape has changed. In 2020, uh, Biva Atizo have displaced serafinib or linvatinib as first-line therapy. And so that's your first-line therapy for virgin, naive patients. Those who are already on serafinib or linvatinib, uh, if they fail it, uh, then immunotherapy becomes a second-line therapy or targeted therapy. For the first-line Biva Atizo, if they fail it, possibly your tyrosine kinase, which is serafinib, linvatinib, uh, or uh, some of the other things that I mentioned for second line therapy. Admittedly, apart from this box, which is this is your first line therapy, there's very little to guide us in terms of clinical trials on what to do next, but it's an exciting area for investigation and certainly uh, a reasonably good time for those unfortunate patients with hepatocellular carcinoma. So I want to summarize the front line and mention two things about the uh, multidisciplinary approach and then wrap it up. So Bev Atizo is superior to serafinib in all these measures, uh, and it's consistent across the HCC groups, should be widely adopted as a standard frontline, and there are multiple additional frontline combinations that are coming in phase three studies, and they're listed uh, in, on this slide. So I mentioned several points where just the status of the knowledge and the experience is not sufficient for any one person to make a judgment on what is best. And the result of this confusion 
is curative treatment is underused among patients with early stage HCC. Therapeutic delays are significant and frequent. Even today, multidisciplinary care, and that has been shown, not just me saying, improves stage at diagnosis and treatment receipt, and is even associated with longer survival. How do you do it? Multiple ways. One of them is what everyone aspires to do, a single day multidisciplinary clinic and conference. Um, it's wonderful, very difficult to put together all the subspecialties seeing some patients on the same day, but if you do it, great for you. Single day uh, uh, multidisciplinary uh, clinic and conference. So what I just mentioned is the clinic, but sometimes it doesn't have to be a clinic all in the same day. Uh, you can have them and then schedule a conference, or you can have a fluid referral, have them see the different specialists and have a quarterback puts it together. In our institution, that's what happens most of the time. All of these things listed the studies, improved early detection, utilization of curative treatment, time to treatment, and survival. Importantly, there's a real change of staging. People come to you with stage X and end up with stage Z, which means the treatment would have been the wrong treatment if you didn't subject them to this uh, multidisciplinary approach. This is my last slide. Uh, a lot was there, but the treatment landscape is changing rapidly. There are curative treatments. If you're a hepatologist, gastroenterologist, your job is to do surveillance, early diagnosis, nail those who will need liver transplant and resection, and figure out who will need palliative treatment by hooking them up to a multidisciplinary clinic or multidisciplinary platform. The systemic therapy through BEV Atizo has changed. It's a new standard of care. And while things are still being treated with a one size fits all approach, this is a plea for you being slightly more generous with doing biopsies from nodules because uh, biomarkers are uh, or is the future to determine which patients responds to which therapy. Thank you and good luck. Um, I'm gonna start, there's a couple of questions, PBC questions here. Um, the first one is a case, it says over the past three years, somebody with an alkaline phosphatase elevated 190 to 280 normal billy and transaminases. The question is, if the AMA is negative, should it be repeated and should a liver biopsy be considered? So um, with regards to repeating the AMA, I would say uh, that depends it, because not all AMAs are the same. So there are different ways that the laboratory can assess an AMA. One way is to do an immunofluorescence, which is where they take a slide with little pieces of, of rat tissue and they put the patient's serum on it and they see where it binds. And if they see little cytoplasmic stippling, then that's a mitochondrial antibody. That's the traditional way to do it. And, and if your lab is doing it that way, the report comes back as a titer, like one to 80 or one to 360 or something like that. Um, and that way is probably the least sensitive of the ways of doing it. There's also some, um, reader uh, differences, like it depends on how much experience the, the lab reader has at looking at mitochondrial antibodies under the microscope. Um, so I would say if your negative result was a, a negative titer and it was an immunofluorescence, then yes, it should be repeated. In fact, there are data that you should repeat that kind of test three times before you consider it really negative. Um, the other way to do an AMA test um, is by an ELISA or, or immunofixation. Um, and that's where you don't take rat tissue, you take uh, laboratory synthesized little mitochondrial antigens in a well and add the patient serum and see, uh, measure uh, what kind of light signal reaction you get. And that is more sensitive, um, is also less subject to reader error. Um, but there are different ways to do that test as well, depending on what your antigen is that you have in the well. So some tests will use a single antigen, the major target antigen, autoantigen of PBC, the PDCE2, pyruvate dehydrogenase. Um, labs that do that, I think uh, Quest does it that way. Um, and I think CPL does it that way. Um, 
There's another version of the test where they actually put three different antigens in the little well, because it's called a mite three. Uh, I believe LabCorp uses the test uh, that way, but you, you have to get down to the nitty gritty and read how do they do the test. <laughs> so if they're using the mite three antigen, which would be for example, LabCorp, uh, that is highly, highly sensitive. You're not gonna get any more sensitive than that. Um, and there's probably little utility to repeating that one. Uh, maybe once just to make, you know, make yourself feel good. Um, if it's, if it's the other um, ELISA test, that's intermediate uh, in sensitivity. Um, there's no data to guide you, but um, I think you could or could not repeat that one. Um, and liver biopsy, and so unless you come up with a clear positive with that, then yes, liver biopsy. Um, the, another consideration for a cholestatic patient like that might be sclerosis and cholangitis and should they have a non-invasive MRCP first. So that's my answer to that one. Um, hush, let me look bored. Let's see if I can, <laughs> I actually don't have any written uh, questions for you. I think people uh, are, are I'm getting tired. Bored, but, <laughs> but I could comment on, on what you just said. I think okay. uh, I agree with you on repeating. I think the most common consult I get is someone where people have dragged on while they're repeating and re-repeating. So sometimes from practical standpoint, getting the biopsy and even calling it AMA negative uh, may not have great implications on what you do next. So I, I'm an advocate of, if I suspect it, perhaps getting the biopsy uh, while repeating. Right, I agree. Um, so I have a question for you. So, um, are, so have you all switched to using uh, Bevatizo? And if so, kind of what is your experience? I know obviously the data show that it's superior to serafinib, um, but it's an IV infusion, whereas serafinib was a nice easy pill that you could you know, send them home with. Um, and I'm just curious to know what your, your practical experience is in terms of um, bringing some of these sick patients in to get IV infusions as opposed to doing a PO drug. And also one of the, this is the second part to the question, um, one of the things that we face is a lot of patients aren't candidates for serafinib because their liver disease is too advanced, their bilirubin is too high. Um, is there any larger margin of error with the Bevatizo combo or stricter or what, what kind of, how sick can your patient be to get that combo? Yeah, so uh, I'll start by, by the disclaimer here that I personally do not manage them and I'm, we're uh, in, a, in a true good multidisciplinary setting and the oncologist is the one who takes care of it when it gets to that and that uh, um, COVID has really curtailed issues that require um, in person to perhaps right. uh, cutting corners and doing things that require less in person. Uh, that all translates into uh, perhaps not ideal in person experience that I can convey. However, having said that, uh, I think the expansion, the, the, the indication seems to be expanding. The willingness to sort of uh, shave off few of those who would have gotten their third taste or something uh, and putting them on the combination uh, has expanded in both in our practice and other practices. Uh, I agree with you, the issue of advanced liver disease, at least in, in serafinib, uh, seems to, we seem to be pushing the envelope a little bit more uh, with the combination, but the experience has been uh, slow and evolving and I hope we'll, we'll get used to it slightly more in the few coming months. Uh, I think another thing is, despite the beautiful uh, proliferation of these uh, uh, therapies, uh, very little to guide us what happens next. Like if you use something and you fail, uh, in the days of serafinib, I think the, the second order uh, was clear. Now there are so many exciting things and no one really knows what to do. Uh, and it's even more reason to treat patients in a multidisciplinary setting, at least to form some sort of a, a cumulative experience in the absence of studies. Yeah, I agree. I didn't even think about the COVID element to it, but you're right, that's gonna make it even more difficult to bring these patients in for infusions. But I know I'm very dependent on our multidisciplinary group um, and it, it really helps tremendously. So if you're practicing the place where you don't have that, 
um, consider referring your patients to places who do have that. There have been many times when um, I've seen an HCC patient, and by the time it's reviewed in that multidisciplinary setting, the read on the MRI changes, the you know, every, everything changes. So, all right. I, I agree. I mean, uh, one practical thing is sometimes we feel like the frontline provider has to sort of really prove the HCC before you refer to multidisciplinary group. Uh, ours is, is much more forgiving. And so right now, uh, a LIRAD 4, before I scratch my head and wonder what other tests to do and do I look with my right eye or left eye, I just refer them to the multidisciplinary group. And yeah. they do a much faster job of proving or not proving and sort of plugging it in a diagnostic therapeutic approach. I think that really shaves off a lot of time from traditional process of diagnosis. I agree. Okay, there's another question here. It says, what is the probability of AMA negative PBC in a patient with fatty liver? Here we go. Uh, that's the popular number. question. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I, I don't think I can give you a number. It's very rare, but I can tell you what happens because I have several in my practice. I think what we're seeing more now is the combination of AMA positive PBC and fatty liver. Um, because just, you know, the population that we serve, there's a lot of fatty liver, it's common, um, and it's not impossible to have both overlap. Um, but I would say that the only way to know um, is to do a biopsy. And if you see the very characteristic cholangitis or fluorid duct lesions, as well as steatohepatitis, and the patient's AMA negative, then you have both. And, and I have, I think, two or three of those in my practice. So it's rare, but it can happen. I can't give you a statistic, though. I agree. And, and I think the statistic would be whatever the general statistic divided by four since fatty liver disease is a fourth of the population. Uh, and I think, um, I mean, again, I'm, I'm aggressive with biopsies, particularly when you suspect rare treatable disorders, which is PBC is one of them. I mean, if you get it and you get it early and you put them on treatment, you have a real win here. Uh, so I try to settle it early. Okay. Well, if there are no remaining questions from, from the live audience here, I think we can go ahead and, and wrap up. I want to thank everyone, both uh, who came in person. This was a fun experience. It's been my first in-person conference since the beginning of COVID, <laughs> uh, as well as those uh, of you who are joining uh, online from, from the safety of your homes. Um, I want to wish everybody a happy Halloween. Uh, and uh, you should be able to see a slide, yes, uh, that shows you how to get the credit and ABIM MOC points. In order to do so, you have to complete the program and certificate activity form. Um, and to do that, you need to go to the website, www.livegala.org. Um, and if you um, have your email and your registration, they will also link, uh, send you an email link to complete the, the questionnaires. So thank you, everybody. Thank you.